Julius Evola, Revolt Against the Modern World Chapter 14, The Doctrine of the Caste The caste system is one of the main expressions of the traditional socio-political order, a form victorious over chaos and the embodiment of the metaphysical ideas of stability and justice. The division of individuals into castes or into equivalent groups according to their nature and to the different rank of activities they exercise with regard to pure spirituality is found with the same traits in all higher forms of traditional civilizations. And it constitutes the essence of the primordial legislation and of the social order according to justice. Conformity to one's caste was considered by traditional humanity as the first and main duty of the individual. The most complete type of caste hierarchy, the ancient Indo-Aryan system, was visibly inspired by the hierarchy of various functions found in a physical organism animated by the spirit. At the lower level of such an organism, there are undifferentiated and impersonal energies of matter and of mere vitality. The regulating action of the functions of the metabolism and of the organism is exercised upon these forces. These functions, in turn, are regulated by the will, which moves and directs the body as an organic whole in space and time. Finally, we assume the soul to be the center, the sovereign power and the light of the entire organism. The same is true for the caste. The activities of the slaves or workers, sudras, was subordinated to the activities of the bourgeoisie, vesya. Higher up in the hierarchy, we find the warrior nobility, kasatriya, and finally the representatives of the spiritual authority and power, the Brahmana. In the original sense of the word, and the leaders as pontifices, these groups were arranged in a hierarchy that corresponded to the hierarchy of the functions within a living organism. Such was the Indo-Aryan social-political system which closely resembled the Persian system. The latter was articulated into the four pishtra of the lords of fire, Atrave, and the warriors, Rata Esta, of the heads of the families, Vatriya Fushuyant, and of the serfs assigned to manual labor, Huti. An analogous pattern was found in other civilizations up to the European Middle Ages, which followed the division of people into servants, bogas, nobility, and clergy. In the Platonic worldview, the caste corresponded to different powers of the soul and to particular virtues, the rulers, the warriors, and the workers corresponded directly to the spirit and to the head, to the animus and to the chest, and to the faculty of desire, and to the lower organs of the body regulating sex and the function of excretion. In this way, as stated by Plato, the external order and hierarchy correspond to an inner order, in hierarchy according to justice. The idea of organic correspondence is also found in the well-known Vedic simile of the generation of the various castes from the di distinct parts of the primordial, primordial man or Purusa. Justice is produced in the soul, like health in the body, by establishing the elements concerned in natural relations of control and subordination, whereas injustice is like disease and means that this natural order is inverted. Plato's Republic. 
from the Rigveda. This fourfold division became a threefold division when nobility was thought to encompass both the warriors and the spiritual dimensions and practiced in those areas in which residues of this original situation existed. This division corresponds to the Nordic divisions into Jaros, Garos, and Treos, and the Hellenistic division into Eupatrids, Ron, Moors, and Demiurgs. The castes, more than defining social groups, defined functions and typical ways of being and acting. The correspondence of the fundamental natural possibilities of the single individual to any of these functions determine his or her belonging to the corresponding caste. Thus, in the duties toward one's caste, each caste was traditionally required to perform specific duties. The individual was able to recognize the normal explication as well as the development and the charism of his or her own nature. Within the overall order imposed from above, this is why the caste system developed and was applied in the traditional world as a natural, agreeable institution based on something that everybody regarded as obvious. Rather than on violence, oppression, and on what in modern terms is referred to as social injustice, by acknowledging his own nature, traditional man knew his own place, function, and what would be the correct relationship with both superiors and inferiors. Hence, if a Vesya did not acknowledge the authority of a Kasatriya, or if a Kasatriya did not uphold his superiority in regards to the Vesya or a Sudra. This was not so much considered a fault, but as a result of ignorance. A hierarchy was not a device of the human will, but a law of nature, and as impersonal a physical law as that according to which a lighter fluid floats on top of a denser fluid unless an upsetting factor intervenes. There was a firmly upheld principle according to which a hierarchy was not a device of the human will, but a law of nature. And as impersonal a physical law as that according to which a lighter fluid floats on top of a denser fluid, unless an upsetting factor intervenes. There was a firmly upheld principle according to which those who want to institute a process at variance with human nature cannot make it function as an ethical system. From the Bhagavad Gita, the works of Brahmins, Kasatriyas, Vesyas, and Sudras are different in harmony with the three powers of their horn nature or born nature. What upsets the modern sensitivity about the caste system is the notion of heredity and preclusion. It seems unfair that fate may seal at birth one's social status and predetermine the type of activity to which a man will consecrate the rest of his life and which he will not be able to abandon, not even in order to pursue an inferior one, lest he become an outcast, a pariah shunned by everybody. When seen against the background of the traditional view of life, however, these difficulties are overcome. The closed caste system was based on two fundamental principles. The first principle consisted of the fact that traditional man considered everything visible and worldly as the mere effects of causes of a higher order. 
Thus, for example, to be born according to this or that condition, as a man or a woman, in one caste rather than in another, in one race rather, in one race instead of another, and to be endowed with specific talents and dispositions, was not regarded as pure chance. All of these circumstances were explained by traditional man as corresponding to the nature of the principle embodied in the in an empirical self, whether willed or already present transcendentally in the act of undertaking human birth. In the act of undertaking human birth. Such is one of the aspects of the Hindu doctrine of karma. Although this doctrine does not correspond to what is commonly meant by reincarnation, the idea that the same personal principle or spiritual nucleus has already lived in previous human lives and that it will continue to do so ought to be rejected. Full stop. René Guénon launched a devastating critique of this idea in The Spiritist Fallacy, Paris 1923. I followed suit in my The Doctrine of Awakening. Historically, the belief in reincarnation is related to the Weltanschauung, or Weltanschauung, typical of the substratum of pre-Aryan races and of the influence exercised by them. From a doctrinal point of view, it is simple popular myth and not the expression of an esoteric knowledge. In the Vedas, the idea of reincarnation is not found at all. It still applies the generic idea of the pre-existence of causes and the principle that Human beings are heirs of karma. Similar doctrines were not typical of the East alone. According to a Hellenic teacher, a Hellenistic teacher, according to a Hellenistic teaching, not only the soul's quality exists before any bodily life, it has exactly what it chose to have, but the body has been organized and determined by the image of the soul which is in it. Plato wrote, No guardian spirit will cast lots for you, but you shall choose your own destiny. Let him to whom the first lot falls choose first a life to which he will be bound of necessity. Also, according to some Persian Aryan views that eventually found their way to Greece and then to ancient Rome, the doctrine of sacred regality was connected to the view that souls are attracted by certain affinities to a given planet corresponding to the predominant qualities and to the rank of human birth. The king was considered domus netus precisely because he was believed to have followed the path of solar influences. See Plato's Phaedrus in Emperor Julian's Hymn to King Helios. However, the nature of the elements that determine a given birth is as complex as the nature of the elements that constitutes a human being who is the sum of various legacies. Those who love philosophical explanation should remember that Kant's and Schopenhauer's theory concerning the intelligible character, the noumenal character that precedes the phenomenal world, relates to a similar order of ideas. And so, given these premises and excluding the idea that birth is a casual event, the doctrine of the caste appears under a very different light. It can be said, therefore, that birth does not determine nature, 
but that nature determines birth. More specifically, a person is endowed with a certain spirit by virtue of being born in a given caste. But at the same time, one is born in a specific caste because one possesses transcendentally a given spirit. Hence, the differences between the castes, far from being artificial, unfair, and arbitrary, were just the reflection and the confirmation of a pre-existing, deeper, and more intimate inequality. They represented a higher application of the principle sum quique. In the context of a living tradition, the caste represented the natural place of the earth's convergence of analogous wills and vocations. Also, the regular and closed hereditary transmission forged a homogeneous group sharing favorable organic, vitalistic, and even psychic proclivities in view of the regular development on the part of indiv single individuals of the aforesaid prenatal determinations or dispositions on the plane of human existence. The individual did not receive from the caste his own nature. Rather, the caste afforded him the opportunity to recognize or remember his own nature and prenatal will, while at the same time presenting him with a kind of occult heritage related to the blood so that he could be able to realize the latter in a harmonious way. The characteristics, the functions, and the duties of the caste constituted the traces for the regular development of one's possibilities in the context of an organic social system. In the higher caste, initiation completed this process by awakening and inducing in the single individual certain influences that were already oriented in a supernatural direction. Just as good seed sown in a good field culminates in a birth, so the son born from an Aryan father in an Aryan mother deserves every transformative ritual. Seed sown in the wrong field perishes right inside it, and a field by itself with no seed also remains barren. The eos of the single individual, namely those prerogatives and distinct rights inherent to each of these traditional articulations, not only allowed this transcendental will to be in harmony with a congenial human heredity, but also allowed everybody to find in the social organism a condition that really corresponded to their own nature and to their deepest attitudes. Such a condition was protect protected against such a condition was protected against any confusion and prevarication. When the sense of personality is not focused on the ephemeral principle of human individuality, which is destined to leave behind nothing but a shadow at death, all this seems very natural and evident. It is true that much can be achieved in a lifetime, but achievements mean absolutely nothing from a higher point of view. From a point of view that knows that the progressive decay of the organism will eventually push one into nothingness. When they do not actualize the pre-existing will that is the reason for a specific birth, such a prenatal will cannot easily, cannot be easily altered by a temporary or arbitrary decision taken at a given point of one's earthly journey. Once this is understood, the necessity of the caste will become clear. The only self modern man knows and is willing to acknowledge is the empirical self that begins at birth and is more or less extinguished at death. Everything is reduced by him to the mere human individual, since in him all prior recollections have disappeared. Thus we witness the disappearance of both the possibility of establishing contact with those forces of which a given birth is just the effect, 
and the possibility of rejoining that human element in man, which being situated before birth is also beyond death. This element constitutes the place for everything that may eventually be realized beyond death itself and is the principle of an incomparable sense of security. Once the rhythm has been broken, the contacts lost, and the great distances precluded to the human eye, all the paths seem open and every field is saturated with disorderly, inorganic activities that lack a deep foundation and meaning and are dominated by temporal and particularistic motivations and by passions, cheap interests, and vanity. In this context, culture is no longer the context in which it is possible to actualize one's being through serious commitment and faithfulness. It is rather the locus for self-actualization And since the shifting sands of that nothingness without a name and tradition that is the empirical human subject have become the foundation of that self-actualization, the claim to equality and the right to be as a matter of principle, anything one chooses to be, is therefore carried forward and strenuously advocated in modern society. No other difference is acknowledged to be more right and truer than that which is achieved through one's effort and merit according to the terms of various vain, intellectual, moral, or social beliefs typical of these recent times. In the same way, it is only natural that the only things left are the limits of the most coarse physical heredity which have become the signs of incomprehensible meanings and which are endured or enjoyed according to each case as a caprice of fate. It is also natural that personality and blood traits, social vocation and function are all elements that have become increasingly discordant to the point of generating states of real, tragic, inner and outer conflict from a legal and ethical perspective they have also led to a qualitative destruction to a relative leveling of to a relative leveling to equal rights and duties and to an equal social morality that pretends to be imposed on everyone and to be valid for all people in the same way with total disregard for single natures and for different inner dignities the overcoming of the castes and the traditional socio-political orders has no other meaning. The individual has achieved all his freedom. His chain is not short, and his intoxication and his illusions are a restless puppet, as a restless puppet, have no limits. The freedom enjoined by the man of tradition was something very different. It did not consist in discarding, but in being able to rejoin the deeper vein of his will, which was related to the mystery of his own existential form. In reality, that which corresponds to birth and to the physical elements of a being reflects what can be called, in a mathematical sense, the resultant the vectorial sum of the various forces of ten or tendencies at work in his birth. In other words, it reflects the direction of the stronger force. In this force, there may be inclinations of minor intensity that have been swept away and that correspond to talents and tendencies that on the plane of individual consciousness are distinct from both their own organic preformation and the duties and environment of one's caste. These instances of inner contradiction within a traditional political order regulated by the caste system must be considered an exception to the rule. They become predominant, though, in a society that no longer knows the caste and, in general, 
in distinct social organisms in which there is no law to gather, preserve and shape talents and qualifications in view of specific functions. Here we encounter a chaos of existential psychic possibilities that condemns most people to a state of disharmony and social tension. We can see plenty of that nowadays. Undoubtedly, there may have been a margin of indetermination even in the case of traditional man, that by, but this margin in him only served to emphasize the positive aspect of these two sayings. Know yourself, complemented by the saying, nothing superfluous, and be yourself, which implied an action of inner transformation and organization leading to the elimination of this margin of indetermination and to the integration of the self. To discover the dominating trait of one's form and caste and to will it by transforming it into an ethical imperative and moreover to actualize it ritually through faithfulness in order to destroy everything that ties one to the earth. Instincts, hedonistic motivations, material considerations, and so on. Such is the complement of the above-mentioned view that leads to the second foundation of the caste system in its closeness and stability. On the other hand, we must keep in mind that aspect of the traditional spirit according to which there was no object or function that in itself could be considered as superior or inferior to another. The true difference was rather given by the way in which the object or the function was lived out. The earthly way, inspired by utilitarianism or by greed, sakama karma, was contrasted with the heavenly way of the one who acts without concern for the consequences for and for the sake of the action itself, nishkama karma, and who transforms every action into a right and into an offering. Such was the path of bhakti, a term that in this context corresponds more to the virile sense of medieval fides than to the pious, pietistic sense that has prevailed in the theistic ideas of devotion. An action performed to this type of bhakti was compared to a fire that generates light and in which the matter of the act itself is consumed and purified. The degree to which the act was freed from matter, detached from greed and passion, and made self-sufficient, a pure act, to employ analogically an Aristotelian expression, defying the hierarchy of activities, and consequently the hierarchy of the castes or other bodies that corresponded to them as functional classes. Given these premises, which were not theoretical but exper experiential and thus at times not even openly expressed, the aspiration to go from one kind of activity to another and therefore from one caste to another, which from a superficial and utilitarian perspective may be considered by some as a worthier and more advantageous step, was hardly considered in the traditional world so much so that the heredity of functions was spontaneously established even where there were no castes but only social groups every type of function and activity appeared equally as a point of departure for an elevation in a different and vertical rather than horizontal sense and not in the temporal sense but in the spiritual order in this regard by being in their own caste in faithfulness to their own caste and to their own nature, in obedience not to the general morality but to their morality or to the morality of their own caste, everyone enjoyed the same dignity and the same purity as everybody else. This was true for a sudra as well as a king. 
Everybody performed their function within the overall social order and through their own particular bhakti even partook of the supernatural principle of the same order. Thus it was said, a man attains perfection when his work is worship of God, from whom all things come and who is in all. Bhagavad Gita 1846 the god Krishna declared, In any way that men love me, in the same way they find my love. For many are the paths of men, but they all in the end come to me. Bhagavad Gita 4.11 In 17.3 it is stated that the devotion of a man must be conformed to his nature. And also, in liberty from the bonds of attachment, do thou therefore the work to be done. For the man whose work is pure attains indeed the supreme. Bhagavad Gita 319, see also the laws of Manu 2.9. For the human being who fulfills the duty declared in the revealed canon and in tradition wins renown here on earth, an unsurpassable happiness after death. The notion of Dharma or one's particular nation, nature to which one is supposed to be faithful. Bhagavad Gita 18.47 Greater is thine own work, even if this be humble, than the work of another, even if this be great. When a man does the work, for God, when a man does the work God gives him, no sin can touch this man. The notion of Dharma, or one's particular nature, to which one is supposed to be faithful, comes from the root dra, to sustain, to uphold, and it expresses the element of order, form, or cosmos that tradition embodies and implements over and against chaos and becoming. Through Dharma, the traditional world, just like every living thing and every being, is upheld. The dams holding back the sea of pure contingency and temporality stand firm. Living beings partake of stability. It is therefore clear why leaving one's caste and mixing caste, or even the rights, the duties, the morality, and the cults of each. Caste was considered a sacrilege that destroys the efficacy of every right and leads those who are guilty of it to hell. Bhagavad Gita 1.42-44 In relation to the duty of remaining faithful to the specific function and to the customs of one's caste, we may recall the characteristic episode in which Rama kills a serf, Sudra, who practiced asceticism, thus usurping a privilege of the priestly caste. Also, we may recall the traditional teaching according to which the Iron Age, or Dark Age, will be inaugurated when the serfs will practice asceticism. This seems indeed a sign of our times, as some plebeian ideologies have come to see in labor a particular kind of asceticism. That is, again, was considered a sacrilege that destroys the efficacy of every right and leads those who are guilty of it to hell, that is, to the realm of demonic influences that belong to the inferior nature. The people guilty of crossing the caste lines were considered the only impure beings in the entire hierarchy. They were pariahs or untouchables because they represented centers of psychic infection in the sense of an inner dissolution. In India, only the people without a caste were considered outcasts 
and they were shunned even by the lower caste, even if they had previously belonged to the higher caste. On the contrary, nobody felt humiliated by his own caste, and even a sudra was as proud of and as committed to his own caste as a brahmana of the highest station was to his. Generally speaking, the idea of contamination did not concern only the individual of a higher caste who mixed with a member of a lower caste. Even the latter felt contaminated by such a mixture. When gold and lead are mixed together, they are both altered. They both lose their nature. Therefore, it was necessary for everybody to be themselves. Thus, mixing... subverted the traditional order and opened the door to infernal forces by removing the by removing what Goethe said or what Goethe called the creative limitation. The goal was the transfiguration of the form, which was obtained through bhakti in Nishkama Karma, namely through action as right and oblation. The alteration, the destruction of the form, no matter the way it was carried out, was considered as degrading, as a degrading form of escapism. The outcast was just the vanquished. In the Aryan East, he was called a fallen one, Patitas. This was the second principle on which the caste system was founded. It was a thoroughly spiritual foundation since India which implemented this system in one of its strictest versions, even to the point of becoming scholaric, or S-C-L-E-R-O-T-I-C, scleratic, never had a centralized organization that could impose it by means of a political or economic despotism. Moreover, it is possible to find expressions of this kind of this second foundation, even in the Western forms of tradition, it was a classical idea. For instance, that perfection cannot be measured with a material criterion, but that it rather consists in realizing one's nature in a thorough way. The ancients also believed that materiality only represents the inability to actualize one's form since matter was depicted in Plato and Aristotle's writings as the foundation of undifferentiation and of an evasive instability that causes a thing or being to be incomplete in itself and not to correspond to its idea and norm, that is, its dharma. In the Roman deification of the limit, termin or terminus, Implemented through the elevation of the god Terminus to the highest dignity, he was even associated with the Olympian god Jupiter as a principle of disorder and also as the patron saint of the limits in the tradition susceptible of being interpreted in terms of higher meanings according to which he who knocked down or removed a single one of the territorial boundary stones was as accused was an accursed being to be killed on sight by anybody and in the roman oracle that announced that the era of the destruction of the limits erected against human greed will also be the seculum, the seculum of the end of the world. In all these elements, we find the esoteric reverberation of the same spirit. The meaning of this oracle converges with the Hindu teaching, according to which the Dark Age, Kali Yuga, which is the end of a cycle, Maha Yuga, corresponds to a period of unrestrained intermingling of the caste and to the decline of rights. Within certain limits, the idea of contamination did not apply to women. Men of higher castes could marry women of lower castes without being contaminated. 
Traditionally, the woman did not relate to a caste in a direct way, but rather through her husband. The laws of Manu, when a woman is joined with a husband in, according, in accordance with the rules, she takes on the very same qualities that he has, just like a river flowing down into the ocean. This is, however, no longer the case when the existential traditional structures lose their vital force. Plotinus wrote, Every single thing must be a separate thing. There must be acts and thoughts that are our own. The good and evil done by each human being must be his own. The idea that to comply perfectly with one specific function leads to an identical participation in the spirituality of the whole conceived as a living organism, can be traced back to the best Greco-Roman traditions. Later on, it eventually became part of the organic vision of the Germanic Roman civilization of the Middle Ages. The presuppositions that the sense of joy and pride in one's own profession, such that any job, no matter how humble it was, could be performed as an art, which have been preserved in some European peoples until recent times as an echo of the traditional spirit are not any different after all. The ancient German peasants, for instance, experienced his own experience as cultivating the land as a title of nobility, even though he was not able to see in his work, unlike his Persian counterpart, a symbol for an episode of the struggle between the God of Light and the god of darkness, Ahura Mazda, wa Ariman. The members of the medieval corporations and guilds were as proud of their professional tradition as the nobility was proud of its bloodline. And when Luther, following St. Thomas, taught that to go from one profession to another in order to enhance one's position in the social hierarchy ran contrary to God's law because God assigns to each and every one his own state and therefore people must obey him by remaining where they are and that the only way to serve God consists in doing one's best at one's job. The tradition was faithfully preserved in these ideas. And the best spirit of the Middle Ages was reflected, although with the limitations inherent in a theistic and devotional schema. Prior to the advent of the civilization of the Third Estate, mercantilism, capitalism, the social ethics that the social ethics that was religiously sanctioned in the West consisted in realizing one's being and in achieving one's own perfection within the fixed parameters that one's individual nature and the group to which one belonged clearly defined. Economic activity, work and profit were justified only in the measure in which they were necessary for sustenance and to ensure the dignity of an existence conformed to one's own estate, without the lower instinct of self-interest or profit coming first. Hence, we encounter a character or active impersonality in this domain as well. It has been noted that in the chaste it has been noted that in the caste hierarchy, relationships like those occurring between potentialities and act were reenacted. In the superior caste, the same activity that in the inferior caste presented itself in a more conditioned form was manifested in a pure, complete, and freer manner as an idea. This allows us to take issue with the modern demagogical ideas concerning an alleged flock-like mindedness of individuals who lived in traditional societies and concerning the alleged lack of that sense of dignity and freedom of every individual 
of every individual that only modern, evolved mankind is supposed to have achieved. In fact, even when the hierarchical position of the individual did not proceed or proceed from the spontaneous acknowledgement of one's own nature and one's faithfulness to it, the subordination of the inferior to the superior, far from being an indolent acquiescence, was almost a symbolical and ritual expression of a faithfulness and a devotion to one's particular ideal and to a higher form of being that the inferior could not directly or organically live out as his own nature, Swadharma, but which he could still consider as the center of his own action precisely through his devotion and act of subordination to a higher caste. If we say that people of this sort ought to be subject to the highest type of man, we intend that the subject should be governed, not to his own detriment, but on the same principle as his superior, who is himself governed by the divine element within him. It is better for everyone to be subject to a power of godlike wisdom residing within himself or failing that imposed from without. Moreover, although in the East to live to leave one's ca moreover, although in the East to leave one's caste was only allowed in exceptional cases, and a fugitive was far from being considered a free man, it was still possible to create certain causes through the way one conducted oneself in thought, word, and deed. These causes, by virtue of the analogy with the principle or with the hierarchy to which one was subjected, could produce a new way of being that corresponded to that principle or to that hierarchy. In the law of Manu, while on the one hand it is written, even if he is set free by his master, a servant is not set free from slavery, for since that is innate in him, who can take it from him? 8.414 on the other hand, we read, the servant's duty and supreme good is nothing but obedience to famous priestly householders who know the Veda. If he is unpolluted, obedient to his superiors, gentle in his speech, without a sense of I, and always dependent on the priest and the other twice-born castes, he attains a superior birth in the next life. Nine point. 334 through 5, and also 10.42, by the powers of their seed and their asceticism, in age after age, these castes are pulled up, are pulled down in birth among men here on earth. Besides the bhakti or fides that is aimed directly at the superior principle, at the supreme principle, that is, at the unconditioned, the bhakti that was centered on some other high principle was thought to have the real and objective power to resolve the elements of the one who had nourished it. Following the fulfillment of his own dharma into this same principle. We may recall Plotinus's teaching when we cease to live, our death hands over to another principle, this energy of our own personal career, that principle of the new birth, strives to gain control, and if it succeeds, it also lives and itself, in turn, possesses a guiding spirit. In its 3.1.3, in this instance, this guiding spirit corresponds to the principle that has been made the object of one's active and loyal bhakti. And thus, to make that person ascend, not exteriorly and artificially, as in the case in the disorder and careerism of modern society, but from within, in a profound and organic way, 
from a lower to a higher degree of the spiritual hierarchy as a reflection of the passage of the transcendental principle of being from one possibility to another. Regarding that kind of social order that had its center in a sovereign and lasted up to the time of the Holy Roman Empire, there survives the principle upheld by Celsus against the dualism of early Christianity, according to which the subjects may demonstrate their faithfulness to God through faithfulness to their ruler. The view of the subject as a being connected to the person of his sovereign through a sacred and freely chosen vow is an ancient Indo-European view. In the traditional world, this fides, or personal devotion, went beyond political and individual boundaries and even acquired the value of a path leading to liberation. Cumont, in reference to Iran, observed that the subjects dedicated to their deified kings, not only their actions and words, but their very thoughts. Their duty was a complete abandonment of their personality in favor of those monarchs who were held the equal of gods. The sacred militia of the, mili the, sacred militia of the mysteries was nothing but this civic morality viewed from the religious standpoint. It confounded loyalty with piety. This loyalty in the brightest and most luminous forms of tradition was credited with the power of producing the same fruits faith is supposed to produce. Not too many years ago, the Japanese general Nogi had prevailed at Port Arthur against his Russian foes killed himself with his wife after the death of his emperor in order to follow him into the afterlife. All of this is self-evident since I have said that faithfulness is the second cornerstone of every traditional organization. In addition to the right and an elite that embodies transcendence, this is the force that as a magnet establishes contact. A psychic atmosphere stabilizes the social structure and determines a system of coordination and gravitation between the individual elements and the center. When this fluid, which is rooted in freedom and in the spiritual spontaneity of the personality fails, the traditional organism loses its elementary power of cohesion. Paths become precluded, subtler senses atrophied, the parts disassociated dissociated and atomized. The consequence of this degeneration is the immediate withdrawal of the forces from above, which thus abandon men to themselves, leaving them free to go where they wish, according to the destiny that their actions create, and that no superior influence will ever be able to modify again. This is the mystery inherent Julius in Evola. Revolt against the modern 14. world. Chapter 15 Professional Associations and the Art Semicolon Slavery When viewed as a relationship between potentiality and act, hierarchy allowed the same motif established at the top to be reproduced in the activities of the different castes or social organisms, though on the plane of different, more or less spiritual paths of fulfillment, each one retained in its own way the same upward orientation. This is why in the more complete traditional forms, the sacred was a light that shone not only on what today are the profane sciences, arts, and professions, but on trades and various material activities as well. By virtue of the analogical correspondences existing between the various planes, the sciences, activities, and skills of the lower plane could traditionally be considered as symbols of a higher nature and thus help to communicate the meaning hidden in the latter. 
since it was already present in the former, even though in a potential form. In the domain of knowledge, the presupposition was of a system of sciences fundamentally different in their premises and methodologies from modern ones. Every modern profane science corresponds in the world of tradition to a sacred science that had an organic, qualitative character and considered nature as a whole in a hierarchy of degrees of reality and forms of experience in which the form connected to the physical senses is just one among others. It is precisely in this way that the system of transpositions and symbolic and ritual participations was made possible. This was the case in cosmology and in related disciplines. For instance, ancient alchemy was not at all a primitive chemistry, and ancient astrology was not at all, as is mistakenly assumed today, a superstitious deification of the heavenly bodies and of their movements but a knowledge of the stars so organized as to be able to constitute a science of purely spiritual and metaphysical realities expressed in a symbolic form. The world of tradition knew in these same terms a physiology, parts of which are still preserved in the East. For example, the knowledge of anatomy and physiology presupposed by Chinese acupuncture, Japanese jiu-jitsu, and some aspects of Hindu haitha yoga. In this physiology, the consideration of the material aspect of the human organism represents in only a particular chapter becoming part of the general science of the correspondences between macrocosm and microcosm. Human world and elemental world. Ancient medicine proceeded from these same premises as a sacred science in which health appeared as a symbol of virtue. Virtue in turn was considered a superior form of health and due to the ambiguity of the term soter, he who saves, was on a higher plane of the same type as he who heals. The development of the physical and practical aspect of knowledge in these traditional sciences must naturally appear as limited when compared and contrasted with modern sciences. The cause of this, however, was a correct and healthy hierarchy in which the interests of traditional man were arranged. In other words, he did not give to the knowledge of eternal and physical reality more importance than it deserved or than was necessary. Very appropriately, O. Spann defines modern knowledge as the knowledge of what is not worthy of being known. What mattered the most in a traditional science was the anagogic element, namely, the power to lead to higher planes. That was virtually present in the knowledge relative to a given domain of reality. This element is totally lacking today in modern profane sciences. The latter, in reality, may act and have acted exactly in the opposite direction. The world view from which they originate and on which they are based is such as to affect human interiority in a dissolving and negative way. In other words, they are centrifugal. Coming back to our subject matter, analogous considerations to the previous ones may be extended to the domain of the arts, understood both as real arts and as the activities of professional artisans. Concerning the former, only in periods of decadence did the world of tradition 
come to know the emancipation of the purely aesthetic subjective. The human element that characterizes modern arts. In the figurative arts, even prehistoric findings, such as the civilization of the Cro-Magnon and of the reindeer, show the inseparability of the naturalistic element from a magical and symbolical intention. An analogous dimension was present also in latter, more developed civilizations. The theater corresponded to reenactments of the mysteries, theta being the symbol of emotion, theater, theta. The theater corresponded to reenactments of the mysteries, to the sacred dramas, and, in part, to the ludi of classical antiquity, more on which later. Ancient poetry had close ties with the art of telling the future and with sacred inspiration. Poetic verse, in fact, was associated with incantation. Which is the meaning of the word cardamom famous opera. As far as literature is concerned, the symbolic and initiatory element, which proceeded from a conscious intention and also from infra-conscious influences, grafted onto the creative spontaneity of single individuals and of various groups. Throughout the Middle Ages, often influence not only the myth, saga and traditional fairy tale, but the epic stories in chivalrous and erotic literature as well. The same applies to music, dance, and rhythm. Luthien reports that dancers who were assimilated to priests had a knowledge of the sacred mysteries of the Egyptians. Lucien of Samo Sata on dance 59, the dance of the seven veils, which are removed one at a time until the dancer is totally nude, repeats on its own plane a precise initiatory schema, still very much alive today. Lucien reports that dancers who were assimilated to priests had a knowledge of the sacred mysteries of the Egyptians, as the science of the mudras, the symbolic, magical gestures that play an important role in Hindu rituals and ascetical paths, affected the dance. The mime and pantomime of that civilization, again, these were various expressions of the same one intent. One temple sculpted in a forest of temples with specific regard to professional and artisanal activities a typical example is given in the art of construction and building their moral transpositions in the gospels are well known which occasioned even higher and in initiatory interpretations In the ancient Egyptian tradition, construction was regarded as a regal art, so much so that the king himself performed, in a symbolic sense, the first acts of the building of the temple in the spirit of an eternal work of art. While on the one hand, people today are nowadays puzzled when it comes to explaining how achievements that require a superior knowledge of mathematics and engineering were possible in antiquity. On the other hand, what emerges are unquestionable signs of a priestly art in the orientation, placement, and other aspects of ancient buildings, especially temples and, later on, cathedrals. The symbolism of masonry established analogical connections between the little art 
on the one hand and the great arts and the great work on the other within secret associations that in the beginning could claim links with the corresponding medieval professional corporations. This is also partially true in the case of the arts of the blacksmiths, weavers, navigators, and farmers. Concerning the latter, just as Egypt knew the ritual of regal construction, likewise the Far East knew the ritual of regal plowing. And, in a symbolic transposition of the farming art, generally speaking, man himself was considered to man himself was considered as a field to be cultivated, and the initiate as the cultivator of the field in an eminent sense. See Evola's The Hermetic Tradition, chapter twenty two. The echo of this has been preserved in the very origin of the modern term culture in its reductive, intellectualistic, and petite bourgeois meaning. The ancient arts, after all, were traditionally sacred to specific deities and heroes, always by virtue of analogical reasons and thus they presented themselves as potentially endowed with the possibility of ritually transforming physical activities into symbolic actions endowed with a transcendent meaning. In reality, in the caste system, not only did every profession or trade correspond to a vocation, Hence, the double meaning preserved in English, in the English term, calling. Again, in reality, in the caste system, not only did every profession or trade correspond to a vocation, hence the double meaning preserved in the English term, calling. In the language of the companionage, in which these traditions were preserved, the word vocation was always synonymous with occupation. Instead of asking a person what his occupation was, he was asked what was his vocation. Mine is master of the sacred arts, both light and dark. Not only was there something to be found in every product as a crystallized tradition that could be activated by a free and personal activity and by incomparable skill, not only were the dispositions developed in the exercise of a trade and acknowledged by the social organism transmitted through the blood as congenital, and deep attitudes, but something else was present as well, namely the transmission. If the real initiation, or at least an inner tradition of the art that was preserved as a sacred and secret thing, Arcanum Magisterium, even though it was partly visible in the several details and rules, rich and symbolic, and religious elements that were displayed in the traditional guilds, whether Eastern, Mexican, Roman, Medieval, and so on. The medieval manuals that have been preserved often mention mysterious practices that were associated with the process of construction itself. They also relate legends according to which masters of the art were killed because they portrayed, betrayed the oath of secrecy. Being introduced to the secrets of an art did not correspond to the mere empirical or rational teachings of modern man. In this domain, certain cognitions were credited with a non-human origin an idea expressed in a symbolic form 
by the traditions concerning the gods, the demons, or the heroes, Balder, Hermes, Vulcan, Prometheus, who originally initiated men into these arts. It is significant that Janus, who was also the god of initiation, was the god of the Collegia Febrorum in Rome. In relation to this, we find the idea that mysterious congregations of blacksmiths who came to Europe from the east also brought with them a new civilization. Moreover, it is significant that in the locations where the oldest temples of Hera, Cupra, Aphrodite, Venus, Hercules, Heraclius, and Aeneas were built, Quite often, it is possible to find archaeological evidence of the working of copper and bronze. And finally, it is significant that the Orphic and Dionysiac it is significant that the Orphic and Dionysiac mysteries were associated with the themes of the art of weaving and spinning. This order found its most complete fulfillment in examples found especially in the East where the achievement of an effective mastery in a given art was just a symbol, a reflection and a sign. In fact, it was the counterpart of a fulfillment and a parallel inner relation, realization. Even in those areas in which the caste system did not have the rigor and the determination exemplified by Aryan India, Something resembling it was developed in a spontaneous way in relation to inferior activities. I am referring to the ancient corporations of artists and guilds that were omnipresent in the traditional world, and that, in the case of ancient Rome, date back to prehistoric times, reproducing on their own plane the typical makeup of the patrician gents and family. It is the art and the common activity that provide a bond and an order replacing those that in higher castes were provided by the aristocratic tradition of blood and ritual. This does not imply that the collegium and the corporation lacked a religious character and a virile semi-military constitution. In Sparta, the cult of a hero represented the ideal bond between the members of a given profession, even in the case of an inferior one. Just like every city in gents, in Rome, every corporation, originally consisting of free men, had its own demon or lair. It had a temple consecrated to it and a correlative, common cult of the dead that determined a unity in life and in death. It had its own sacrificial rites performed by the magister on behalf of the community of the Sodales or Colige, who celebrated certain events or holy days in a solemn, mystical way through feasts, agapes, and games. The fact that the anniversary of the Collegium or corporation, Natalis Colihi, coincided with the anniversary of its patron deity, Natalis Dei, and of the inauguration or consecration of the temple, Natalis Templi, indicates that in the eyes of the Sodales, the sacred element constitute the sacred element constituted the center from which the inner life of the corporation originated. According to a tradition, Numa, by instituting the Collegia, intended for every profession to celebrate its own cult. In India, too, each profession pursued by the inferior caste often corresponded to a special cult of divine or legendary patrons. This practice is also found in Greece among Nordic people and the Aztecs, and Islam, and so on.
The Roman corporation is a good example of the virile and organic aspect that often accompanies the sacred dimension in traditional institutions. It was hierarchically constituted ad exemplum re publicae and animated by a military spirit. The body of Sodales was called populus or ordu. And just like the army and the people at solemn gatherings, it was divided into centurie and dicurie. Every centuria had its leader or centurion and a lieutenant, optio, just like in the legions. To differentiate them from the masters, the other members had the name of plebes and corporati, but also caligati or milites caligati, like simple soldiers. And the magister, besides being the master of the art and the priest of the corporation in charge of his fire, was the administrator of justice and the overseer of the behavior of the members of the group. Analogous characteristics were found in the medieval professional communicate. Analogous characteristics were found in the medieval professional communities, especially in Germanic countries. Together with the community of the art, a religious and ethical element bound the members of the Gilden and of the Zun and of the Zunften in these corporate organizations. The members were bonded together for life, more as in a common right than on the basis of the economic interests and mere productive goals. The effects of intimate solidarity which affected a man as a whole and not just his particular aspect as an artisan permeated everyday life in all its forms. As the Roman professional collegia had their own lair or demon, the German guilds, which were constituted as small scale images of cities, also had their own patron saint, altar, common funerary cult, symbolic insignia, ritual commemorations, ethical laws, and leaders, Wollen Nussen, who were supposed to regulate the art and guarantee compliance with the general norms and duties regulating the lives of the members of the corporation. The requirement for being admitted to the guilds was a spotless name and an honorable birth. People who were not free and those belonging to foreign races were not admitted. Typical of these professional associations were the sense of honor, purity, and impersonal character of their work. Almost according to the iron canons of bhakti and of nishkama karma, everybody performed their work silently, setting their own person aside while still remaining active and free human beings. This was an aspect of the great anonymity, typical of the Middle Ages and of every great traditional civilization. Something else was shunned, namely anything that could generate illicit competition or a monopoly, thus contaminating the purity of the art with mere economic concerns. The honor of one's guild and the pride in the activity characterizing it constituted the firm, immaterial bases of these organizations. While not formally hereditary, these organizations often became so, thereby demonstrating the strength and the naturalness of the principle responsible for generating the caste. In Rome, the professional guilds became hereditary during the 3rd century Anno Domini. From that time on, every member of a corporation passed on to his heirs not only a biological legacy, but his profession and his property as well, provided that they too followed in his footsteps. This secession was enforced by the state, however, and thus we can no longer speak of an authentic conformity 
of the caste to the traditional spirit. In this way, even in the order of inferior activities connected to matter and to material conditions of life, it was possible to find the reflection of the way of being, of a purified and free action, endowed with its own fetus and living soul, which freed it from the bonds of selfishness and ordinary interests. In the corporations, there was a natural and organic connection between the caste of the Vesya, in modern terms management, and the caste of the Sudras, namely the working class. Considering the spirit of an almost military solidarity that was both felt and willed, and whereby the Vesya was the equivalent of a manager and the Sudra an employee, both of whom worked in the same company, the Marxist antithesis between capital and labor, between employers and employees, at that time would have been inconceivable. Everybody attended their own function and stayed in their own place. Especially in the German guilds, the faithfulness of the inferior was the counterpart of the pride the superior took in the subordinate zeal and efficiency. In this context, too, the anarchy of rights and demands did not arise until the inner spiritual orientation died out and the action performed in purity was supplanted by one motivated by materialistic and individualistic concerns and by the multi-form and vain fervor brought about by the modern spirit and a civilization that has turned economics into a guiding principle, daemon, and a destiny. When the inner strength of a fetus is not longer present, then every activity is defined according to its purely material aspect. Also, equally worthy paths are replaced with an effect-driven differentiation dictated by the type of activity being performed. Hence, the sense of intermediary forms of social organization, such as ancient slavery, as paradoxical as it may first appear in the context of these civilizations that largely employed the institution of slavery, it was work that characterized the condition of a slave, and not vice versa. In other words, when the activity in the lower strata of the social hierarchy was no longer supported by a spiritual meaning, and when instead of an action there was only work, then the material criterion was destined to take over, and those activities related to matter and connected to the material needs of life were destined to appear as degrading and as unworthy of free human being. Therefore, work, bonus, came to be seen as something that only a slave would engage in, and it became almost a sentence. Likewise, the only dharma possible for a slave was work. The ancient world did not despise labor because it practiced slavery, and because those who worked were slaves. On the contrary, since it despised labor, it despised the slave. Note 12. The translator of this work has come across a passage that he regards worth quoting in this context. Around 1820, an astrologer says to the young hero, around 1820, an astrologer says to the young hero Steindal, character house of Padma, in a century perhaps nobody will want idlers anymore. He was right. It ill becomes anyone today to admit that he lives without working. Since Marx and Proudhon, labor has been universally accepted as a positive social value and a philosophical concept. As a result, the ancients' contempt for labor, their undisguised scorn for those who work with their hands, 
their exaltation of leisure as the sine non of a liberal life, the only life worthy of a man, shocks us deeply. Not only was the worker regarded as a social inferior, he was base ennoble. It has often been held, therefore, that a society like the Roman, so mistaken about what we regard as proper values, must have been a deformed society, which inevitably paid the price of its deformity. Ellipses, period. And yet, if we are honest, we must admit that the key to this enigma lies within ourselves. True, we believe that work is respectable and would not dare to admit to idleness. Nevertheless, we are sensitive to class distinction and admit or not regard workers and shopkeepers of, as people of relatively little importance. We would not want ourselves or our children to sink to their station even if we are a little ashamed of harboring such sentiments. Therein lies the first of six keys to ancient attitudes towards labor. Contempt for labor equals social contempt for laborers. From Paul Vene, editor, A History of Private Life, Volume 1. From Pagan Rome to Byzantium, translated by Arthur Goldhammer, Cambridge, Mass, 1987, the page numbers. Since those who worked could not be anything but slaves, the traditional world willed slavery into being, and it differentiated, instituted, and regulated into a separated social class, the mass of those people whose way of being could only be expressed through work. Aristotle, Politics 1.4, based slavery on the presupposition Aristotle, Politics 1.4, based slavery on the presupposition that there are men who are only fit for physical labor who therefore must be dominated and directed by others. According to this order of ideas, a distinction was made between barbarians and Hellenes. Likewise, the Hindu caste of the Sudras originally corresponded to the stratum of the black aboriginal race, the enemy race, or satanic, as enemy means, dominated by the Aryans, which had no other choice but to serve those who were twice born. Labor as bonos, an obscure effort strictly dictated by need, was the opposite of action, the former representing the material, heavy, dark pole, the latter the free pole of human possibilities detached from need. Free men and slaves, after all, represented the social crystallization of those two ways of performing an action, either according to matter or ritually, that I have already discussed. We do not need to look elsewhere to find the basis for the contempt for work and of the view of hierarchy typical of the constitution of an immediate type. In such a world, speculative action, asceticism, contemplation, sometimes even play and war, characterize the pole of action vis-a-vis -vis the servile pole of work. Esoterically speaking, the limitations that slavery put on the possibilities of an individual who happened to be born in this condition correspond to the nature of his given destiny, of which slavery should be considered sometimes the natural consequence. On the plane of mythological transpositions, the Jewish tradition is not too far from a similar view when it considers work as a consequence of Adam's fall 
and at the same time an expiation of this transcendental fault taking place in human existence. On this basis, when Catholicism tried to turn work into an instrument of purification, it partially echoed the general idea of the ritual offering of an action conformed to one's nature. In this context, the nature of fallen man, according to the Judeo-Christian view of life, as a path of liberation. In antiquity, the vanquished were often assigned the function of slaves. Was this barbarian style materialism? Yes and no. Once more, we should not forget the truth that permeated the traditional world. Nothing happens on this earth that is not the symbol and the parallel effect of spiritual events. Since between spirit and reality, hence power too, allegedly there was an intimate relationship. As a particular consequence of this truth, it has already been mentioned that winning or losing were never considered as mere coincidences. There still remains today among primitive populations the ancient belief that the person afflicted by misfortunes is always a guilty person. The outcomes of every struggle and every war are always mystical signs or the results of a divine judgment and therefore capable of revealing or unfolding a human destiny. Starting with this presupposition, it is possible to go further and establish a transcendental convergence of meanings between the traditional view of the vanquished and the Jewish view of the sinner, as they both inherit a fate befitting the dharma of the slave, namely work. This convergence is inspired by the fact that Adam's fault is associated with a defeat he suffered in a symbolical event, the attempt to come into possession of the fruit of the tree, which may yet have had a victorious outcome. We know of myths in which the winning of the fruits of the tree or of things symbolically equivalent, the woman, the golden fleece, etc., is achieved by other heroes, Heracles, Jason, Siegfried, and does not lead them to damnation, as in the Judeo-Christian myth, but rather to immortality or to a transcendent knowledge. If the modern world has disapproved of the injustice of the caste system, it has stigmatized much more vibrantly those ancient civilizations that practiced slavery. Recent times boast of having championed the principle of human dignity. This too is mere rhetoric. Let us set aside the fact that Europeans reintroduced and maintained slavery up to the 19th century in their overseas colonies in such heinous forms as to be rarely found in the ancient world. What should be emphasized is that if there ever was a civilization of slaves on a grand scale, the one in which we are living is it. No traditional civilization ever saw such great masses of people condemned to perform shallow, impersonal, automatic jobs. In the contemporary slave system, the counterparts of figures, such as lords or enlightened rulers, are nowhere to be found. This slavery is imposed subtly through the tyranny of the economic factor and through the absurd structures of a more or less collectivized society. And since the modern view of life in its materialism has taken away from the single individual any possibility of bestowing on his destiny a transfiguring element and seeing in it a sign and a symbol, contemporary slavery should therefore be reckoned as one of the gloomiest and most desperate kinds of all times. It is not a surprise that in the masses of modern slaves, 
the obscure forces of world subversion have found an easy, obtuse instrument to pursue their goals. While in the places where it has already triumphed, the vast Stalinist work camps testify to how the physical and moral subjugation of man to the goals of collectivization and of the uprooting of every value of the personality is employed in a method methodical and even satanic way. In addition to the previous considerations concerning work as art in the world of tradition, I will briefly mention the organic, functional, and consistent quality of objects produced by virtue of which the beautiful did not appear as something separated or distinct from a certain privileged category of artistic objects and the mere utilitarian and mercantile character of the objects was totally lacking. Every object had its own beauty and a qualitative value, as well as its own function as a useful object. With regard to art in the traditional world, while well, on the one hand, what occurred was a. the prodigy of the unification of opposites, b. the utter compliance with a set of established rules in which every personal Ellen appears to be sacrificed and suffocated and c the authentic arising of spirituality within an authentic personal creation page 110 on the other hand, it could be rightly said that every object did not have the imprint of an individual artistic personality, as happens today with the so-called artistic objects, yet while revealing a choral taste which makes of the object one of many infinite expressions, it had the seal of a spiritual genuineness that prevented it from being called a copy. Such products bore witness to one stylistic personality whose creative activity developed through centuries, even when a name, whether real, fictitious, or symbolic was known, this was considered irrelevant. Anonymity, not of a sub-personal, but of a super-personal character, was therefore upheld. On this soil was what on this soil what was born and proliferated in all the domains of life were artisans' creations that were far from being a shallow, plebeian sense of utility, and an extrinsic, a functional, artificial beauty. This scission reflects the overall inorganic character of modern civilization. Bipartisan of the traditional spirit, asceticism. Having explained the spirit that animated the caste system, it is now necessary to discuss the path that is above the caste and is directed at implementing the realization of transcendence, in analogous terms to those of high initiation, yet outside the specific and rigorous structures characterizing it. On the one hand, the pariah is a person without a caste, the one who has lapsed or who has eluded the form by being powerless before it thus returning to the infernal world. The ascetic, on the other hand, is a being above the caste, one who becomes free from the form by renouncing the illusory center of human individuality. He turns toward the principle from which every form proceeds, not by faithfulness to his nature and by participation in the hierarchy, but by a direct action. Therefore, as great as was the revulsion harbored by every caste toward the pariah, 
in Aryan India. So, by contrast, was the veneration felt by everybody for a person who was above the caste. These beings, according to a Buddhist image, should not be expected to follow a human dharma, just as one who is trying to kindle a fire ultimately does not care what kind of wood is being employed, as long as it is capable of producing fire and light. Asceticism occupies an ideal. For the last line, just as one who is trying to kindle a fire ultimately does not care what kind of wood is being employed, whereas a German or a Norse practitioner of a Sotru would care what type of wood was employed. Uh, Yaw is one of the favorites. Asceticism occupies an ideal intermediary state between the plane of direct, Olympian, and initiatory regality and the plane of right and of dharma. Asceticism also presents two features or qualifications that from a broader perspective may be considered as qualifications of the same traditional spirit. The first aspect of the ascetic path is action, understood as heroic action. The second aspect is asceticism in the technical sense of the word, especially with reference to the path of contemplation. Beyond complete traditional forms, and in more recent times, some civilizations have arisen that were inspired in different degrees by either one of the two poles, page 111. Later on, we shall see what role the two aspects have played in the dynamism of historical forces, even on the plane that is related to the ethnic and racial factor. In order to grasp the spirit of an ascetical tradition at a pure state, it is necessary to leave out of consideration the meanings that have been associated with the term asceticism in the world of Western religiosity. Action and knowledge are two fundamental human faculties. In both domains, it is possible to accomplish an integration capable of removing human limitations. The asceticism of contemplation consists of the integration of knowing, consists of the integration of the knowing faculty achieved through detachment from sensible reality with the neutralization of individual rationalizing faculties and with the progressive stripping of the nucleus of consciousness which thus becomes free from conditioning and subtracts itself from the limitation and from the necessity of any determination, whether real or virtual. Once all the dross and obstructions are removed, opus remotionis, opus remotionis, opus remotionis, participation in the overworld takes place in the form of a vision or an enlightenment. As the peak of the ascetical path, this point also represents at the same time the beginning of a truly continuous, progressive ascent that realizes states of being truly superior to the human condition. The essential ideals of the ascetical path are the universal as knowledge and knowledge as liberation. The ascetical detachment typical of the contemplative path implies renunciation. 
In this regard, it is necessary to prevent the misunderstanding occasioned by some inferior forms of asceticism. It is important to emphasize the different meanings that renunciation assumed in higher forms of ancient and Eastern asceticism on the one hand, and in most of Western and especially Christian asceticism on the other hand. In the latter, renunciation often assumed the character of a repression and of a mortification. The Christian ascetic becomes detached from the objects of desire, not because he no longer has any desire, but in order to mortify himself and to escape temptation. In the former, renunciation proceeds from a natural distaste for objects that are usually attractive and yearned for. This distaste is motivated by the fact that one directly desires, or better, wills, something the world of conditioned experience cannot grant. In this case, what leads to renunciation is the natural nobility of one's desire rather than an external intervention aimed at slowing down mortifying and inhibiting the faculty of desire in a vulgar nature. After all, the emotional phase, even in its purest and noblest forms, is only found at the introductory levels in higher forms of asceticism. In later stages, it is consumed by the intellectual fire and by the arid splendor of pure contemplation. A typical example of contemplative asceticism is given by early Buddhism in its lack of religious features, its organization in a pure system of techniques, and in the spirit that animates it which is so different from what anyone may think about asceticism. First of all, Buddhism does not know any gods in the religious sense of the word. The gods are believed to be powers who also need liberation, and thus the awakened one is acknowledged to be superior to both men and gods. In the Buddhist canon, it is written that an ascetic not only becomes free from human bonds, but from divine bonds as well. Secondly, moral norms in the original forms of Buddhism are purported to be mere instruments to be employed in the quest for objective realization of super individual states. Anything that belongs to the world of believing, of faith, or that is remotely associated with emotional experiences is shunned. The fundamental principle of the method is knowledge, to turn the knowledge of the ultimate non-identity of the self with anything else, whether it be the mon monastic all or the world of Brahma, theistically conceived, into a fire that progressively devours any irrational self-identification with anything that is conditioned. In conformity to the path, the final outcome, besides the negative designation, nirvana equal secession of restlessness, is expressed in terms of knowledge, buddhi, which is knowledge in the imminent sense of super-rational enlightenment or liberation or liberating knowledge, as in waking up from sleep, slumber, or a hallucination, the process of waking up, like the process of making a baby. It goes without saying that this is not the equivalent of the cessation of power or of anything resembling a dissolution. To dissolve ties is not to become dissolved, but to become free. The image of the one who, once freed from all yokes, 
whether human or divine, is supremely autonomous and thus may go wherever he pleases, is found very frequently in the Buddhist canon, together with all kinds of symbols of a virile and warrior type, and also with constant and explicit reference, not so much to non-being, but rather to something superior to both being and non-being. Buddha, as it is well known, belonged to an ancient stock of Aryan warrior nobility, and his doctrine purported to be the Dharma of the Pure Ones, inaccessible to an un instructed average person, is a very far cry from any mystical escapism. Buddha's doctrine is permeated by a sense of superiority, clarity, and an indomitable spirit, and Buddha himself is called the fully self-awakened one, the Lord. This is from Evola's The Doctrine of Awakening. The Buddhist renunciation is of a virile and aristocratic type and is animated by an inner strength. It is not dictated by need, but is consciously willed, so that the person practicing it may overcome need and become reintegrated into a perfect life. It is understandable that when our contemporaries, who only know a life that is mixed with non-life, that in its restlessness presents the irrational traits of a mania, hear mention of nirvana in reference to the condition experienced by the awakened one, namely of an extinction of mania corresponding to what the Germans called more than living. Mer as Leben. and to a super life they cannot help but equate nirvana with nothingness for non-mania nirvana means non-life or nothingness nothingness after all it is only natural that the modern spirit has relegated the values cherished by higher asceticism to the things of the past A Western example of pure contemplative asceticism is given by Neoplatonism with the words, the gods ought to come to me, not I to them. Porphyry, the life of Plotinus, whom Iamblichus wrote several letters back to answering questions of his and correcting him in the Chaldean Oracles, first part. Plotinus indicated a fundamental aspect of aristocratic asceticism. Also, with the sayings, it is to the gods, not to good men, that we are to be made like. And our concern, though it is not to be out of sin, but to be God. Plotinus has definitely overcome the limitations posed by morality and has employed the method of inner simplification as a way to become free from all conditionings in the state of metaphysical simplicity from which the vision will eventually arise. By means of this vision, having joined, as it were, center to center, what occurs is the participation in that intelligible reality that compared to which any other reality may be characterized as more non-life than life, with the sensible impressions appearing as dreams, and the world of bodies as the place of radical powerlessness and of the inability to be. For here too, when the centers have come together, they are one, but there is duality when they are separate. The perfect life, the true, real life, is in that transcendent, intelligible reality, and other lives are incomplete traces of life, not perfect or pure, 
and no more than its opposite. Another example is given by the so-called Rhineland mysticism that was capable of reaching metaphysical peaks, towering above and beyond Christian theism. Dauler's Entwerdung corresponds to Plotinus's and to the destruction of the element of becoming, or samsaric element, that Buddhism regarded as the condition necessary to achieve awakening. If you find Greek in the printed text, know that these are secret titles for initiates into the Elysian rites, or at least those who've participated in the ergot ritual. The aristocratic view of contemplative asceticism reappears in the doctrine of Meister Eckhart. Like Buddha, Eckhart addressed the noble man and the noble soul whose metaphysical dignity is witnessed by the presence of a string, a light, and a fire within it. In other words, of something before which even the deity conceived as a person, i.e. theistically, becomes something exterior. The method he employed consisted essentially of detachment from all things, abe, Guess height a virtue that, according to Eckhart, is about love, humility, or mercifulness, and he explained, as he explained in his sermon, on detachment. Meister Eckhart, The Essential Sermons, Commentaries, Treatises, and Defense. Translated by E. Coolidge, C-O-L-L-E-D-G-E, -L -L -E -E, and H. McGinn, New York, 1982, page 286. The principle of spiritual centrality was affirmed. The true self is God. God is our real center, and we are external only to ourselves. Fear, hope anguish, joy, and pain, or anything that may bring us out of ourselves must be allowed to seep into us. An action dictated by desire, even when its goal is the kingdom of heaven itself, eternal life, or the beatific vision, the ru'ya in Arabic, must not be undertaken. The path suggested by Eckhart leads from the outside to the inside, beyond everything that is mere image, beyond things and what represents the quality of a thing, dingheit, beyond forms and the quality of form, formlichkeit, beyond essences and essentiality, from the gradual extinction of all images and forms, and eventually of one's own thoughts, will, and knowledge, what arises is a transformed and supernatural knowledge that is carried beyond all forms, uberformt, or uberformt. Thus one reaches a peak in respect to which God himself, always according to his theistic view, appears as something ephemeral, that is, as a transcendent, an uncreated peak of the self, without which God himself could not exist. A wick waiting for the flame. But the flame does not exist knowingly without the wick. All the typical images of the religious consciousness are swallowed up by a reality that is an absolute, pure possession, and that in its simplicity cannot help but to appear terrifying to any finite being. Once again, we find a solar symbol before this barren and absolute substance. God appears as the moon next to the sun. The divine light is, 
the divine light in comparison with the radiance of this substance pales, just as the sun's light outshines the moon's, except during an eclipse. After this brief mention of the meaning of contemplative asceticism, it is necessary to say something about the other path, namely the path of action. Well, in contemplative asceticism, we find a mostly inner process in which the theme of detachment and the direct orientation toward transcendence are predominant. In the second case, we have an imminent process aimed at awakening the deepest forces of the human being and at bringing them to the limit, thus causing a super life to spring from life itself in a context of absolute intensity. This is the heroic life according to the sacred meaning, often displayed in the traditional Eastern and Western worlds. The nature of such a realization causes it to present simultaneously an outer and an inner, a visible and an invisible aspect. Conversely, pure contemplative asceticism may also lie entirely in a domain that is not connected to the external world by something tangible. When the two poles of the ascetical path are not separated and neither one becomes the dominating trait of a particular type of civilization, but on the contrary, both poles are present and joined together, then the ascetical element feeds in an invisible way the forces of centrality and stability of a traditional organism while the heroic element enjoys a greater relationship with the dynamism and the force animating its structure. In relation to the path of action, in the next two chapters, I will discuss the doctrine of the holy war and the role played by games in antiquity. I will further develop the topic of heroic action, given the interest it should evoke in Western man, who, by virtue of his nature, is more inclined to contemplate. Special views concerning one's Julius fate. Evola, Revolt Against the Modern World, Chapter 17, uh, end of chapter The 16. Greater and the Lesser Holy War, Al-Jihad Al-Akbar wa Jihad Al-Asgar. Considering that, in the traditional view of the world, every reality was a symbol and every action a ritual. The same was true in the case of war, since war could take on a sacred character. Holy war and the path to God became one and the same thing. In more or less explicit forms, this concept is found in many traditions. A religious aspect and a transcendent intent were often associated with the bloody and military deeds of traditional humanity. Livy relates that the Samnite warriors looked like initiates. Note 1. Socratos mor Samnitium Milites Ioque Candida Vesta et Paribus Tandore Armis Insignis History of Rome 9.44.9 And also, they had also called in the aid of the gods by submitting, to, by submitting the soldiers to a kind of initiation into an ancient form of oath. Ritu Quodam Sacramenti Ve Tusta Velut initiatis militibus. Similarly, among savage populations, the magical and the warrior elements are often inter intermingled. In ancient Mexico, the bestowal of the title of commander, Tec Watli, was subordinate to the successful outcome of different trials of an initiatory type. Also, until recent times, the Japanese warrior nobility, the samurai, 
was to a large degree inspired by the doctrines of a was to a large degree inspired by the doctrines and asceticism of Zen, an esoteric form of Buddhism. The ancient worldview and myths in which the theme of antagonism repeatedly occurred automatically propelled the elevation of the art of war to a spiritual plane. This was the case of the Persian Aryan tradition and also of the Hellenic world which often saw in material warfare the reflection of a perennial cosmic struggle between the spiritual Olympian Uranian element of the cosmos on the one hand and the titanic, demonic, feminine, unrestrained elements of chaos on the other hand. The interpretation is possible, especially in those instances where war was associated with the idea of the empire, and also because of the transcendent meaning this concept evoked. It was then translated into a very powerful idea, the symbolism of Heracles' labors he being the hero fighting on the side of the Olympian forces was applied to as late as, was applied to a, as late a figure of as Frederick the First of Hohenstaufen. In the background, uh, the reader here has a an astrological clock that announces the planetary hours of the day. Uh, this now is the hour of Saturn. Special views concerning one's fate in the afterlife introduce us to the inner meanings of warrior asceticism. According to the Aztec and Nahua races, the highest seat of immortality, the house of the sun, or the house of was reserved not only for sovereigns, but for heroes as well. As far as ordinary people were concerned, they were believed to slowly fade away in a place analogous to the Hellenic Hades. The Nordic Aryan mythology conceived Valhalla as the seat of heavenly immortality, reserved for the heroes fallen on the battlefield, in addition to nobles and freemen of divine origin. This seat was related to the symbolism of heights, as Glitnirburg, this resplendent mountain, or Himnenburg, the heavenly mountain, the highest divine mountain on whose peaks an eternal brightness shines beyond the clouds, and was often identified with Asgard, namely with the Aesir's seat located in the middle land, Midgard. The lord of this seat was Odin, Wotan, the Nordic god of war and victory. According to a particular myth, Odin was the king who with his sacrifice showed to the heroes the path that leads to the divine dwelling where they will live forever and be transformed into his sons. Yinglingasagaten. Thus, according to the Nordic races, no sacrifice or cult was more cherished by the supreme God and thought to bear more supernatural fruits than the one celebrated by the hero who falls on the battlefield. From a declaration of war to its bloody conclusion, the religious element permeated the Germanic hosts and inspired the individual warrior as well. Moreover, in these traditions, we find the idea that by means of a heroic death, the warrior shifted from the plane of the material, earthly war, to the plane of struggle, of a transcendent and universal character. 
the hosts of heroes were believed to constitute the so-called wild hare, the mountain stormtroopers led by Odin, who took off from the peak of Mount Valhalla and then returned to rest on it. In the higher forms of this tradition, the host of the dead heroes selected by the Valkyrie for Odin, with whom the wilds here eventually become identified was the army the god needed in order to fight against the Ragna Rukur, the twilight of the gods, that has been approaching for a very long time. Note 3. The term Ragna Rukur is found in the Lokasena 39, and it literally means twilight of the gods. More often we encounter the term Ragna Rukur, Voluspa 44, which signifies the doom or the end of the gods. The term Ragna Rukur became prevalent because for the twelfth because from the twelfth or thirteenth century on, Norse writers adapted it instead of Ragna Ruk. The Nordic view of the wild's hair corresponds to the Iranian view of Mithras, the sleepless warrior who at the head of the Fravashi leads the fight against the enemies of the Aryan race. Yashna 10.10 .10. It is written, There is a very large number of dead heroes in Valhalla, and many more have yet to come. And yet they will seem too few when the wolves come. Gilfangining 38 what has been said so far concerns the transformation of the war into a holy war. Now I wish to add some specific references found in other traditions. In the Islamic tradition, a distinction is made between two holy wars, the greater holy war, al-jihad al-akbar, and the lesser holy war, El Jihad al Asgar. The distinction originated from a saying, hadith, of the Prophet Muhammad, who on the way back from a military expedition said, You have returned from a lesser holy war to the greater holy war. The greater holy war is of an inner and spiritual nature, the other is material war waged externally against an enemy population with the particular intent of bringing infidel populations under the rule of God's law, al-Islam. The relationship between the greater and the lesser holy war, however, mirrors the relationship between the soul and the body in order to understand the heroic asceticism or path of action. It is necessary to recognize the situation in which the two paths merge, the lesser holy war becoming the means through which a greater holy war is carried out, and vice versa. The little holy war, or the external one, becomes almost a ritual action that expresses and gives witness to the reality of the first. Originally, Orthodox Islam conceived a unitary form of asceticism, that which is connected to the jihad or holy war. The greater holy war is man's struggle against the enemies he carries within. More exactly, it is the struggle of man's higher principle against everything that is merely human in him, against his inferior nature and against chaotic impulses of all sorts of material attachments. Note 5. René Guénon, The Symbolism of the Cross, 77, in reference, French edition, in reference to the Bhagavad Gita, a text written in the form of a dialogue between the warrior Arjuna and the Lord Krishna. Guénon wrote, Krishna and Arjuna, Ka, who represent respectively the self and the empirical ego or personality and individuality, 
or the unconditioned Atman and the living soul, Jivatma, climbed into the same chariot, which is the vehicle of being, considered in its manifested state. As Arjuna fights on, Krishna drives the chariot without becoming involved in the action. The same meaning is also found in various Upanishads. The two birds sitting in the same tree, and the two birds who entered into a cave, Al-Halaj said, We are two joined. Al-Halaj said, Rahimahumallah, we are two souls joined together within the same body. He also said, Your body is mingled with mine, as wine is mixed with water. Whatever touches you, touches me, in all the stations of the soul, you are The famous seal found in the Knights Templar tradition, a horse mounted by two knights wearing a helmet and a spike, and underneath the inscription, Sigilum Militum Christi, may be interpreted along the same lines. Thus the tradition is beautiful. This is expressly outlined in a text of Iron Warrior Wisdom. Know him, therefore, who is above reason, and let his peace give thee peace. Be a warrior and kill desire through accomplishment, the powerful enemy of the soul. Bhagavad Gita 3.4.3 Krishna edit. The enemy who resists us and the infidel within ourselves must be subdued and put in chains. The enemy is the animalistic yearning and instinct, the disorganized multiplicity of impulses, the limitations imposed on us by a fictitious self, and thus also fear, weakness, and uncertainty. This subduing of the enemy is the only way to achieve inner liberation or the rebirth in a state of a deeper inner unity and peace in the esoteric and triumphal sense of the word. In the world of traditional warrior asceticism, the lesser holy war, namely the external war, is indicated and even prescribed as the means to wage the greater holy war. Thus, in Islam, the expressions holy war, jihad, and Allah's way are often used interchangeably. In this order of ideas, action exercises the rigorous function and task of a sacrificial and purifying ritual. The external vicissitudes experienced during a military campaign cause the inner enemy to emerge and to put up a fierce resistance and a good fight in the form of the animalistic instincts of self-preservation, fear, inertia, compassion, or other passions. Those who engage in battles must overcome these feelings by the time they enter the battlefield if they wish to when and to defeat outer enemy and to defeat the outer enemy or infidel. Obviously, the spiritual orientation and the right intention, niya, that is, the one toward transcendence, the symbols employed to refer to transcendence are heaven, paradise, Allah's gardens, and so on are presupposed as the foundation of jihad, lest war lose its sacred character and degenerate into a wild affair in which true heroism is replaced with reckless abandonment 
and what counts are the unleashed impulses of the animalistic nature. It is written in the Quran, let those who would exchange the life of this world for the hereafter fight for the cause of Allah. Whether they die or conquer, we shall richly reward them. Quran 476 The presupposition according to which it is prescribed, when you meet the unbelievers in the battlefield, strike off their heads, and when you have laid them low, bind your captives firmly, or do not falter or sue for peace, when you have gained the upper hand, is that the life of this world is but a sport and a pastime, and that whoever is ungenerous to this cause is ungenerous to himself. These statements should be interpreted along the lines of the evangelical saying, whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whosoever loses his life, for my sake shall find it. Matthew 16.25 This is confirmed by yet another Quranic passage. Why is it that when it is said to you, March in the cause of Allah, you linger slothfully in the land? Are you content with this life in preference to the life to come? Say, are you waiting for anything to befall us except victory or martyrdom? Another passage is relevant as well. Fighting is obligatory for you, as much as you dislike it. But you may hate a thing although it is good for you, and love a thing although it is bad for you. Allah knows, but you do not. This passage should also be connected with the following one. They were content to be with those who stayed behind. A seal was set upon their hearts, leaving them bereft of understanding. But the apostle and the men who shared his faith fought with their goods and their persons. These shall be rewarded with good things. They shall surely prosper. Allah has prepared for them gardens watered by running streams, in which they shall abide for ever. This is the supreme triumph. Quran 9, 88-89 This place of rest, paradise, symbolizes the super-individual state of the being the realization of which is not confined to the post-mortem alone. This place of rest, paradise, symbolizes the super-individual states of being, the realization of which is not confined to the post-mortem alone. As the following passage indicates, as for those who are slain in the cause of Allah, he will not allow their works to perish. He will vouchsafe them guidance and ennoble their state. He will admit them to the paradise he has made known to them. Quran chapter 47 verses 5 through 7 In the instance of real death in battle, we find the equivalent of the Mors Triumphalis found in classical traditions those who have experienced the greater holy war during the lesser holy war have awakened a power that most likely will help them overcome the crisis of death. This power, having already liberated them from the enemy and from the infidel, will help them avoid the fate of Hades. This is why, in classical antiquity, the hope of the deceased and the piety of his relatives often caused figures of heroes and of victors to be inscribed on the tombstones. It is possible, however, to go through death and conquer 
as well as achieve the super life and to ascend to the heavenly realm while being alive. The Islamic formulation of the heroic doctrine corresponds to that formulated in the Bhagavad Gita, in which the same meanings are expressed in a pure way. The doctrine of liberation through pure action, which is expounded in this text, is declared to be solar in origin and is believed to have been communicated by the founder of the present cycle, are passed at this point, to dynasties of sacred kings rather than to priests, Brahmana. The piety that keeps the warrior, Arjuna, Arjuna has the title of Guda Gesha, which means Lord of Sleep. Thus, he represents a warrior version of the Awakened One. Arjuna also ascended a mountain in the Himalayas to practice asceticism and to achieve superior warrior skills. In the Iranian tradition, the attribute of sleepless was referred in an eminent sense to the God of Light. Ahura Mazda, Vendidad 19.20, and Tumitras Yashna 10.10. The piety that keeps the warrior Arjuna from going to battle against his enemies, since he recognizes among them his own relatives and teachers, is characterized by the Bhagavad Gita as lifeless dejection. The text adds, Strong men do not know despair, for that wins neither heaven nor earth. Bhagavad Gita 2.2 The promise is the same. In death, thy glory in heaven. In victory, thy glory on earth. Arise, therefore, with thy soul ready to fight. The inner attitude, the equivalent of the Islamic niya, that in that is capable of transforming the holy war, the inner attitude, the equivalent of the Islamic niya, that is capable of transforming the lesser war into a greater war, is described in clear terms. Offer to me all thy works. Venus. Zenith. Offer to me all thy works, and rest thy mind on the Supreme. Be free from vain hopes and selfish thoughts, and with inner peace fight thou thy fight. Venus Zenith The purity of this type of action, which must be willed for its own sake, is also celebrated in clear terms. Prepare for war with peace in thy soul. Be in peace in pleasure and pain, in gain and in loss. In victory or in the loss of a battle. In this peace there is no sin. In the Chinese tradition, mention is made of the brave and virile warrior who regards equally defeat and victory and of his noble continence, which is unaffected by tumultuous passions. When I journey inward, I find a pure heart, even if I had to face a thousand or ten thousand enemies, I march against them without any fear. Mencius 3.2 In other words, you will not stray from the supernatural direction by fulfilling your dharma as a warrior. The Law of Manu 5.98 When a man is killed by upraised weapons in battle, in fulfillment of the duty of a ruler, instantly he completes both a sacrifice and the period of pollution caused by his death. Also, 7.89, kings who try to kill one another in battle and fight to their utmost ability, never averting their faces, go to heaven.
The relationship between war and the path to God is presented in the Gita too. Though the metaphysical rather than the ethical aspect is more heavily stressed, the warrior reproduces somewhat the deity's transcendence. The teaching Krishna imparts to Arjuna concerns first of all the distinction between what is pure and undying, and that which, as a human and naturalistic element, only appears to exist. The unreal never is. The real never is not. This truth indeed has been seen by those who can see the truth. Interwoven in his creation, the spirit is beyond destruction. No one thing, no one can bring to an end the spirit which is everlasting. If any man thinks he slays, and if another thinks he is slain, neither knows the ways of truth. The eternal in man cannot kill. The eternal in man cannot die. He does not die when the body dies. These bodies have an end in their time, but he remains immeasurable, immortal. Therefore, great warrior, carry on thy fight. Bahad Gita 2.16-20 The consciousness of the irreality of what can be lost or caused to be lost as ephemeral life and as mortal body, the equivalent of the Islamic view that this life is just a sport and a pastime, is associated with the knowledge of that aspect of the divine according to which this aspect is an absolute power before which every conditioned existence appears as a negation. This power becomes naked and dazzles in a terrible theophany, precisely in the act of destruction. In the act that negates the negation. In the whirlwind that sweeps away every finite life, neither destroying it are making it arise again in a transhuman state. In order to free Arjuna from doubt and from the soft bond of the soul, Krishna says, I am the life of all living beings and the austere life of those who train their souls. And I am from everlasting, the seed of eternal life. I am the intelligence of the intelligent. I am the beauty of the beautiful. I am the power of those who are strong when this power is free from passions and selfish desires. I am desire when this is pure. When this desire is not against righteousness. In the end, having abandoned all personification, Krishna manifests himself in the wonderful and fearful form before which the three worlds tremble, vast, reaching the sky, burning with many colors, with wide open mouths, with vast flaming eyes. Finite beings as lamps outshone by a much greater source of light, or as circuits pervaded by a much greater current, giving way, disintegrate, melt, because in their midst there is now a power transcending their form, 
that wills something infinitely greater than anything that as individual agents they may will by themselves. This is why finite things become being transformed and going from the manifested into the unmanifested, from the material to the immaterial. On this basis, the power capable of producing the heroic realization is clearly defined. The values are overturned. Death becomes a witness to life. And the destructive power of time displays the indomitable nature hidden inside what is subject to time and death. Hence the meaning of these words uttered by Arjuna at the moment in which he experiences the deity as pure transcendence. As roaring torrents of waters rush forward into the ocean, so do these heroes of our mortal world rush into thy flaming mouths. And as the moths swiftly rushing enter a bla blazing flame and die, so all these men rush to thy fire, rush fast to their own destruction. Krishna also added, I am all powerful time which destroys all things, and I have come here to slay these men. Even if thou dost not fight, all the warriors facing thee shall die. Arise, therefore, win thy glory, conquer thy enemies, and enjoy thy kingdom. Through fate of their own karma, I have doomed them to die. Be thou merely the means of my work. Tremble not, fight and slay them. Thou shalt conquer thy enemies in battle. In this way, we find again the identification of war with the path to God. The warrior evokes in himself the transcendent power of destruction. He takes it on, becomes transfigured in it and free, thus breaking loose from all human bonds. Life is like a bow, and the soul like an arrow. The target being aimed at is the Supreme Spirit. Another text of the same Hindu tradition says that what matters is to become united with the Supreme. And as an arrow is united with its target, this is the metaphysical justification of war and the transformation of the lesser into the greater holy war. It also sheds further light on the meaning of the traditions concerning the transformation in the course of the battle of a warrior or a king into a god. According to an Egyptian tradition, Ramesses Meriannun, Ramesses Meri Anun, was transformed in the battlefield into the god Amu and said, I am like Baal in his own time. When his enemies recognized him in the melee, they cried out, This is not a man. He is Sethu, the great warrior. He is Baal in the flesh. In this context, Baal is the equivalent of the Vedic Shiva and Indra of the solar god Dius Dir, who is represented by a sword and by the rune Y, which is the ideogram of resurrection, a man with raised arms, and of Odin Wotan, the god of battles and of victories. It should not be forgotten that both Indra and Wotan are conceived of as gods of order and as the overseers of the world's course. Indra is called the one who stems the tides. As the god of the day and of clear skies, he also exhibits Olympian traits. 
What we find in these examples is the general theme of war being justified as a reflection of the transcendent war waged by form against chaos and the forces of the inferior nature that accompany it. Further on, I will discuss the classical Western forms of the path of action. As far as the Western doctrine of the Holy War is concerned, I will refer here only to the Crusades, the fact that during the Crusades men who fought in the war, the fact that during the Crusades men who fought the war intensely and experienced it according to the same spiritual meaning were found on both sides demonstrates the true unity between people who share the same traditional spirit, a unity that can be preserved not only through differences of opinion, but also through the most dramatic contrasts. In their rising up in arms against each other, Islam and Christianity gave witness to the unity of the traditional spirit. The historical context in which the Crusades took place abound with elements capable of conferring upon them a potential symbolical and spiritual meaning. The conquest of the Holy Land, located beyond the sea, in reality had many more connections with ancient traditions than it was first thought. According to these traditions, in the ancient east where the sun rises, there lies the happy region of the Aesir, and in it the city of Ayard, where there is no death, and where journeys where journeyers enjoy a heavenly peace and eternal life. B. Kugler, History of the Crusades, Milan, 1887. This region appears as one of the representations of the symbolic center of the world. In this context, though, it is mingled with, motif, with motifs proper to the Nordic tradition, Considering that Ayard is Asgard, the Aesir's seat described in the Edict Saga, which is often confused with Valhalla. Moreover, the struggle against Islam, by virtue of its nature, shared from the beginning several common traits with asceticism. It was not a matter of fighting for earthly kingdoms, but for kingdoms of God, but for the kingdom of God. The Crusades were not a human, but a divine affair. Consequently, they should not be considered like all other human events. The Holy War was at that time the equivalent of a spiritual war and of a cleansing that is almost a purgatorial fire that one experiences before death. To use an expression found in a chronicle of those times, popes and preachers compared those who died in the Crusades to gold tested three times and purified seven times in the furnace. The fallen warriors were believed to find grace with the Supreme Lord in his De Lode Nove Militia. St. Bernard wrote, Whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. What a glory it is for you to emerge from the battle crowned with victory. But what a greater glory it is to win on the battlefield an immortal crown. What a truly blessed condition when one can wait for death without any fear, yearning for it and welcoming it with a strong spirit. St. Bernard de Lode Nove Melatia. The crusader was promised a share in the absolute glory and rest in paradise. In the coarse language of the time, conquere lit in paradis, Corsal, which is the same kind of supernatural rest mentioned in the Quran. 
Likewise, Jerusalem, Herio, Salam, the military objective of the Crusades, appeared in the double aspect of an earthly and of a heavenly city. Note 33. In the Judeo-Christian belief system, Jerusalem was often considered as an image of the mysterious Salem ruled by, ruled by Melchizedek. Melech Asadek. And thus, the crusade became the equivalent in terms of heroic tradition of a ritual, a pilgrimage, and the passion of the Via Crucis. Moreover, those who belonged to the orders that contributed the most to the crusades, such as the Knights Templar and the Knights of St. John, were men who, like the Christian monks of ascetics, Learn to despise the vanity of this life. These orders were the natural retirement place for those warriors who were weary of the world, who had seen and experienced just about everything, and who had directed their spiritual quest towards something higher. If you're not a part of something, don't take this into your own hands. The teaching that Vita es Melatia Super Terum was instilled in these knights, these knights initiated in an integral inner and outer fashion, through prayers that ready themselves to fight and to move against the enemy. Their matins was the tr their matins was the trumpet, their hair shirts the armor they rarely took off, their fortresses, the monasteries, the trophies taken from the infidels, the relics, and the images of saints, a similar kind of asceticism paved the way for that spiritual realization that was also related to the secret dimension of chivalry. The military defeats the crusaders suffered after an initial surprise and perplexity helped to purify the Crusades from any residue of materialism and to focus on the inner rather than on the outer dimension, on the spiritual rather than on the temporal element. By comparing the unfortunate outcome of a Crusade with that of an unnoticed virtue, which is appreciated and rewarded, only in the next life, people learn to see something superior to both winning and losing and to put all their values in the ritual and sacrificial aspect of an action as an end in itself, which is performed independently from the visible earthly results as an oblation aimed at deriving the life-giving absolute glory from the sacrifice of the human element. Therefore, in the Crusades, we find the recurrence of the main meanings of expressions such as paradise lies under the shade of the swords and the blood of the heroes is closer to God than the ink of the philosophers and the prayers of the faithful, as well as in the view of the seat of immortality as the island of heroes or Jannah ala qaddam ummi or Bahalla and as the court of heroes what occurs again is the same spirit that animated the warrior in Zoroastrian dualism by virtue of the spirit, the followers of Mithras assimilated the exercise of their cults to the military profession. The neophytes swore by an oath, sacramentum, similar to that required of the recruits in the army, and once a man joined the ranks of the initiates, he became part of the sacred militia of the invincible god of light. F. Gumont, the Oriental Religions in Roman Paganism, 15 through 16. Moreover, it must be emphasized that during the Crusades, the realization of universality and of supranationalism 
through asceticism, was eventually achieved. Leaders and nobles from all lands converged into the same sacred enterprise, above and beyond their particular interests and political divisions, to forge a European solidarity. Informed by the same ecumenical ideal of the Holy Roman Empire, the main strength of the Crusades was supplied by chivalry, which, as I have already remarked, was a supranational institution whose members had no homeland because they would go anywhere they could to fight for those principles to which they swore unconditional faithfulness. Since Pope Urban II referred to chivalry as the community of those who show up everywhere a conflict erupts in order to spread the terror that their weapons evoke in defense of honor and justice. He expected chivalry to answer the call to a holy war. Thus, here too, we find a convergence of the inner and outer dimensions. In the holy war, the individual was afforded the experience of a meta-individual action. Likewise, the teaming up of warriors for a purpose higher than their own race, national interests, or territorial and political concerns was an external expression of the overcoming of all particular particularities, already an ideal of the Holy Roman Empire. An analogous form of universality through action was achieved to a large degree by the ancient Roman civilization. Even the Greek city-states experienced something higher than their political particularisms through action, that is, through the Olympic Games, Los Angeles 2028, Paris 2024, and through the League of the Hellenic Cities against the Barbarians. In reality, if the universality connected with the asceticism of the pure spiritual authority is the condition for an invisible traditional unity that exists over and above any political division within the body of a unitary civilization informed by the cosmic and by the eternal, in respect of which everything that is pathos and human inclination disappears, and the dimension of the spirit presents the same characteristic of purity and power as the great forces of nature. And when this universality is added to universality as action, then we arrive at the supreme ideal of the empire, an ideal whose unity is both visible and invisible, material and political, as well as spiritual. Heroic asceticism and the untamability of the warrior vocation strengthened by a supernatural direction are the necessary are the necessary instruments that allow the inner unity to be analogically reflected in the outer unity, namely in the social body represented by many peoples that are organized and unified by the same one great conquering stock. Moreover, those who love to contrast the past with our recent times should consider what modern civilization has brought us to in terms of war. A change of level has occurred from the warrior who fights for the honor and for the right of his lord Society has shifted to the type of the mere soldier that is found in association with the removal of all transcendent or even religious elements in the idea of fighting. To fight on the path to God has been characterized as medieval fanaticism. Conversely, it has been characterized as a most sacred cause to fight for patriotic and nationalistic ideals and for other myths that in our contemporary era have eventually been unmasked 
unmasked, and shown to be the instruments of irrational, materialistic, and destructive forces, it has gradually become possible to see that when con that when country was mentioned, it has gradually become possible to see that when country was mentioned, this rallying cry often concealed the plans of annexation and oppression and the uh, interests of monopolistic industries. All talk of heroism was done by those who accompanied soldiers to the train stations. Soldiers went to the front to experience war as something else, namely as a crisis that all too often did not turn out to be an authentic and heroic transfiguration of the personality, but rather the regression of the individual to a plane of savage instincts, reflexes, and reactions that retained very little of the human by virtue of being below and not above humanity. The era of nationalism has known a worthy surrogate for the two great traditional culminations that are the universality of spiritual authority and heroic universality. I am referring to imperialism, although in society, the act of one who takes over somebody else's goods by force whether out of envy or out of need, is considered to be reprehensible. A similar behavior in the relationships between nations has been considered as a natural and legitimate thing. It has consecrated the notion of fighting, and it has constituted the foundation of the imperialistic ideal. It was thought that a poor nation, lacking living space, has every right, if not the duty, to take over the goods and the lands of other people. In some instances and conditions, leading to expansion and to imperialist conquests, have been fabricated ad hoc. A typical example has been the pursuit of demographical growth, inspired by the password, there is power in numbers, Another example, more widespread and denoting a lower mentality since it is exclusively controlled by economic and financial and the demographical or commercial need for space, it desperately requires an outlet. When the outlets of a Cold War or diplomatic intrigues are no longer sufficient, what ensues are military expeditions that, in my view, rank much lower than what the barbaric invasions of the past may have represented. Such an upheaval, which has recently assumed global proportions, is accompanied by hypocritical rhetoric. The great ideas of humanity, democracy, and the right of a people to self-determination have been mobilized. From an external point of view, not only in the idea of holy war considered outdated, but also the understanding of it that people of honor have developed. Note 36. The reading of the so-called war novels written by E. M. Remark, especially All Quiet on the Western Front, a staple for AP European history students, reveals the contrast between the patriotic idealism, advanced placement, I imagine the International Baccalaureate has a similar need for all quiet on the Western Front, reveals the contrast between the patriotic idealism and rhetoric on the one hand and the realistic results of the experience of the war among European youth. An Italian officer in the aftermath of World War I wrote, War, when war is seen at a distance, it may have idealistic and nightly overtones for the enthusiastic souls and some sort of choreographic beauty for esthetes. It is necessary that future generations learn from our generation that there is no fascination more false and no legend more grotesque than that which attributes to war any virtue or influence on progress. 
and an education that is not based on cruelty, revolution, and brutishness. Once stripped of her magical attractive features, Bellona is more disgusted than Alcina, and the youth who died in her arms have shivered in horror at her touch. But we had to go to war. Vi coda dalla benziza al piave. It was only in the earlier works of Ernst Jünger, inspired by his personal experiences as a soldier in the German army, that we find again the idea that these processes may change polarity and that the most destructive aspects of modern technological war may condition a superior type of man beyond the patriotic and idealist rhetoric as well as beyond humanitarianism and anti-humanitarianism, uh, rhetoric as well as beyond humanitarianism and anti-militarism. The heroic ideal has now been lowered to the figure of policemen. Because the new crusades have not been able to find a better flag to rally around than that of the struggle against the aggressor. From an inner point of view, beyond all this rhetoric, what proved to be decisive was the brute, cynical will to power of obscure, international, capitalist, and collectivist powers. At the same time, science has promoted an extreme mechanization and technization, technologization of war. T-E-C-H-N-O-L-O-G-I-Z-A-T-I-O-N. So much so that today war is not a matter of man against man, but of machine against machine. Rational systems of mass extermination are being employed through indiscriminate air raids, atomic weapons, and chemical warf warfare that leave no hope and no way out. Such systems could only, and again, we're in the 1940s here, if not before, such systems could only, such systems could once have been dis devised only to exterminate germs and insects. In contrast to medieval superstitions that refer to a holy war, what our contemporaries consider sacred and worthy of the actual progress of civilization is the fact that millions of human beings taken away en masse from their occupations and vocations, which are totally alien to the military vocation and literally turned into what military jargon refers to as cannon fodder, will die in such events. Julius Evola, Revolt Against the Modern World, Chapter 18, The Chapter of Jonah, Games and Victory. In classical antiquity, games, ludi, had a sacred character, and they therefore became typical expressions of the traditional path of action. Ludorum primum initium procurandis regionibus datum, wrote Livy. 
It was considered dangerous to neglect the sacred games. Ni gligeri sacra surtamina. Thus, if the state's funds were depleted, the games were simplified but never suppressed. An ancient Roman law required the duoviri and the iodiles to have the games celebrated in honor of the gods. Vitruvius, made famous by the sketch of da Vinci, wanted every city to be endowed with its own theater. Diorum immortalium debus festis ludorum spectationibus. And originally, the person presiding over the games in the Circus Maximus was also the priest of Ceres, Liber and Libera. In any event, the person in charge of the games in Rome was always a representative of the official patrician religion. In the case of some games, such as Salis, special priestly colleges were formed for the occasion. The games were so closely related to pagan temples that Christian emperors had no choice but to keep them open. Since shutting them down would have caused those games to be canceled, these games even outlasted most ancient Roman institutions and eventually ended with the Roman Empire itself. An agape, or agape, to which demons were invited, invitatione demonum, usually closed the games, signifying a ritual participation of the people and the mystical forces associated with them. Augustine reported that Ludi Senisi interes divinas a doctissimus conscribuntur. De Civita De 4.26. The games assume the character of res divene, and they have been replaced today by contemporary sports and by the plebeian infatuation with them. In the Hellenic tradition, the institution of the most important games bore a close relationship with the idea of the struggle of Olympian, heroic, and solar forces against natural and elemental forces. The Pythian games in Delphi celebrated Apollo's triumph over Python and the victory of this hyperborean god in the contest with other gods. Likewise, the Olympian games are related to the idea of the triumph of the heavenly race over the race of Titans. Heracles, the demigod who was the ally of the Olympian host in the struggle against the giants, was believed to have instituted the Olympian games and to have symbolically taken the olive branch with which the winners were crowned from the land of the Hyperboreans. These games had a side. These games had a rigorously, these games had a rigorously virile character. Women were absolutely forbidden to attend them. Besides, it was not a coincidence that in the Roman arenas, several numbers and sacred symbols appeared repeatedly. The three in the Turne Summitates Meta Rum, the tops of the three columns, and in the Tres Are Junes Dis Magnis Potentibus Valentibus Valentibus, three altars for the triple gods, the great, 
the potent, the prevailing. The Tertullian, that Tertullian, attributed to the great Samothracian triad, the five in the five spathia of the Domitian, Domitian racetracks, the zodiac's twelve in the number of doors from which the chariots entered and exited in the early empire, the seven in the annual games at the time of the Republic, and the number of altars of the planetary gods in the Circus Maximus, with the sun's pyramid at the top, in the total number of rounds of a complete race, and in the eggs, dolphins, and tritons located in each of these seven curricula, Bakofen has noticed that the egg and the triton symbolically refer to the fundamental dualism of the powers at work in the world. The egg represented the generating matter that encompasses every potentiality, while the triton, or seahorse, hippocampus, sacred to Poseidon, Neptune, and a frequent symbol of the waves expressed the same fecundating phallic and telluric power whereby, according to a tradition reported by Plutarch, the current of the waters of the Nile was thought to represent the fecundating sperm of the primordial male spilled on Isis, herself a symbol of the land of Egypt. This duality was reflected in the very location where the ancient games and Equiria, horse races dedicated to Mars, were held. Darwinius had his circus built in the valley between the Aventine and the Palatine, which was sacred to Morthea, a feminine telluric goddess. The tracks of the Equiria began at the Tiber's banks, and the finish line was marked with swords planted into Mars's field. Thus, heroic and virile symbols were found at the end of the tracks. While the feminine and the material elements of generation, namely, Following waters are whatever was sacred to Chthonic deities was found at the beginning of and alongside the tracks. In this way, action took place in the context of material symbols representing higher meanings, so that the magical method and technique hidden in the ludi, the sport, which always began with solemn sacrifices and were often celebrated to invoke divine powers at times of an imminent national danger, could have a greater efficacy the impetus of the horses and the vertigo of the race through seven rounds, which was also compared with and consecrated to the sun's journey in the sky. In antiquity, the god Sol had a temple in the middle of the circus. The circus races were sacred to this god, who was represented as steering the chariot of the sun. In Olympia, there were twelve rounds, dodeca, na, dodeca nomptus, see Pindar, Olympian Odes 2.50, that represented the position of the sun in the zodiac. Cassius Dio relates that the Roman circus represented the sequence of the four seasons. The impetus of the horses and the vertical of the race through seven rounds, which was also compared with the consecrated, was also compared with and consecrated to the sun's journey in the sky, evoked the mystery of the cosmic current at work in the cycle of generation 
according to the planetary hierarchy, the ritual slaying of the victorious horse, which was consecrated to Mars, should be connected to the general idea of sacrifice. It seems that the force that was consequently unleashed was for the most part directed by the Romans to increase the crops in an occult fashion. Ad frugum eventum, this sacrifice may be considered as the equivalent of the Indo-Aryan Ashvamedha, which originally was a magical ritual propitiating power. The Roman ritual was celebrated in extraordinary occasions, for instance, at the time of declaration of war, or after a victory, two horsemen entered into the arena, one from the east and the other from the west, to engage in mortal combat. The original colors of the two factions, which were the same colors of the Orphic cosmic egg, white symbolizing winter and red symbolizing summer, are better, the former symbolizing the lunar chthonic power, the latter the solar Uranian power. These Roman games are connected with analogous traditions found in other Indo-European stocks. During the feast of Mahavrata, which was celebrated in ancient India during the winter solstice, a representative of the white and divine Aryan caste fought against a representative of the dark caste of the Sudras for the possession of an object symbolizing the sun. In an ancient Nordic saga, we find the periodic combat between two knights, one riding a white and the other a black horse, in the proximity of a symbolic tree. These evoke the struggle of the two great elemental forces, Every goal, Meta Sudans, was considered as a living thing. The altar erected in honor of the god Gonsus, he who gathers in, a jama, a demon who fed on the blood spilled in the violent games, or Munira. At one of the finish lines of the circus, which was unveiled only on the occasion of the games, appeared as the outfit of infernal forces, just like its Etruscan counterpart, Butial. Higher up, statues of triumphant deities were erected, which referred to the opposite Uranian principle, so that the circus was transformed into a council of Numina Demonum Concilium, whose invisible presence was ritually sanctioned by seats left purposely vacant. The concourse of demons in Tertullian, De Spectaculis 8. Thus, what one on thus what on the one hand appeared as the unfolding of action in an athletic competitive or a scenic event on the other hand was elevated to the plane of a magical evocation the risk inherent in this evocation was real in a wider order that than that of the lives of the participants in the Sertamina, whose victory renewed and strengthened in the individual and in the collectivity the victory of Uranian forces over the infernal forces, a victory that became transformed into a principle of destiny. For instance, Apollo's games were instituted on the occasion of the Punic Wars as a protection against the danger foretold by the oracle. They were repeated to ward off an epidemic of plague, and eventually they came to be celebrated periodically. 
Thus, during the parade preceding the games, the images ex uvie of the capital gods, protectors of Rome, were solemnly carried from the capital to the circus in consecrated chariots. Special regard was paid to the ex uvie of Jovis Optimi Maximi, the thunderbolt, the scepter surmounted by the eagle and the, go the golden crown, which were also the symbols of the Imperium. This was done with the assumption that the same occult power inherent in Roman sovereignty witnessed to and participated in games consecrated to it, Ludi Romani, or that it was involved in them. The magistrate, Magister, who was elected to preside over the games, led the parade that carried the divine symbols as if he were a conqueror. He was surrounded by his people and followed by a public slave holding over his head a crown of oak leaves encrusted with gold and diamonds. It is probable that in the early games, the quadriga was a symbol of Jupiter's attributes and an insignia of triumphal royalty. An ancient quadriga of Etruscan origins, kept in a Capitoline temple, was considered by Romans as a pledge of their future prosperity. This explains why those games were not performed according to tradition, this explained why those games that were not performed according to tradition were looked down upon as unorthodox sacred rituals. If their representation were upset by an accident or interrupted for any reason, it was considered an omen of bad luck and a curse, and the games had to be started over, and the games had to be started all over again in order to placate the divine powers. Conversely, according to a famous legend, when the people following a surprise attack by the enemy left the games, which in the meantime were not interrupted in order to take up arms, they found the enemy miraculously routed by a supernatural power that was later on identified with the power evoked by the right of the game dedicated to the savior, Apollo. Macrobius, the Saturnalia, 1.17.25. See also the Platonic saying, their victory, the Olympian winners, is the nobler, since by their success, the whole commonwealth is preserved. Republic 465D. If the games were often consecrated to victories, Nasir, that personified the triumphant power, their purpose was to renew the life in presence of such a power, to nourish it with the new energies that were awakened and that imparted the same direction. This explains why, in specific reference to the Sertamina and to the Munira, the winner appeared to be endowed with a divine character and at times to be a temporary incarnation of a deity. In Olympia, in the moment of triumph, the winner was thought to be an incarnation of the local Zeus, and the public acclamation to the victorious gladiator was incorporated into the ancient Christian liturgy. Forever and ever. Tertullian de Spectaculus De Spectaculus 25. What should really be considered in this context is what kind of inner, besides ritual and magical, meaning the event may have had for the individual. What should really be considered in this context is what kind of inner, besides ritual, and magical, meaning the event may have had for the individual. What has been said about the notion of holy war, 
applies in this context as well. The heroic exaltation found in competition and in victory, once it was given a ritual meaning, became the imitation of or the introduction to that higher and pure impetus the initiate used to defeat death. This explains their frequent references to the certamina, to the games of the circus, and to the figures of winners in classical funerary art. All these references immortalize in the an analogical way the highest hope of the deceased, and visibly portrayed the kind of action most likely to help him overcome Hades and obtain the glory of an eternal life in a way conforming to the traditional path of action. What we find over and over again in sarcophagi, funerary urns, and classical bas reliefs of the images of a triumphal death, winged victories open the doors of the outer world's domain, or uphold the medallion of the deceased or crown him with the evergreen that usually crowns the heads of the initiates. In the context of the Pindaric celebration of the divinity of victorious wrestlers, the Enagogues and the Promachi were portrayed as mystical deities leading the souls to immortality. And vice versa, in Orphism, every victory, Nike, became the symbol of the victory of the soul over the body and those who achieved initiation were called the heroes of a dramatic and endless struggle. What in the myth is the expression of a heroic life constitutes the model of an Orphic life. Therefore, in the sepulchral images, Heracles, Theseus, and Dioscuri, Achilles, and others are designated as Orphic initiates. Melitia, in Latin, is a term designating the host of initiates. The term designating mis and, a term in Greek, the term designating the mysteries hierophant. Light, victory, and initiation were eventually represented next to each other in several Hellenic monuments. Helios, as the rising sun, alias Aurora, is a Nike and is endowed with a triumphal chariot. Other Nike were Teletis, Maestis, and other deities or personifications of the transcendent rebirth. When we go from the symbolic and esoteric to the magical aspect, it should be noted that the competition and the warrior dances celebrated on the occasion of a hero's death the Roman equivalent were the Ludi, celebrated at the funerals of major figures, had the purpose of awakening a mystical saving force that was supposed to accompany and strengthen him during the crisis that occurred at the moment of death. People also paid homage to the heroes by periodically repeating the contest that followed their funerals. All this is typical of a traditional civilization, qualified by the pole of action rather than the pole of contemplation. Action as spirit and spirit as action. As far as Greece is concerned, I have already mentioned that in Olympia, action in the form of games exercised a unifying function beyond the particularism of the city-states similar to that function manifested through action as holy war, as in the case of the supranational phenomenon of the Crusaders, or, in the context of Islam, during the period of the first caliphate. There are plenty of elements that enable us to perceive the innermost aspect of such traditions, I have pointed out in the antiquity the notion of soul or double or daemon and later on of furies and erinies and finally of the god of, goddess of death and the goddess of victory were often confused in the same one notion. 
so much so as to establish the notion of deity who is simultaneously goddess in battles and a transcendental element of human soul. There are plenty of elements that enable us to perceive the innermost aspect of such traditions. I have pointed out that in antiquity, the notions of soul, of double, or daemon, and later on of furies and erinies, and finally of the goddess of death and the goddess of victory were often confused in the same one notion, so much so as to establish the notion of a deity who is simultaneously goddess of battles and a transcendental element of the human soul. This was the case, for instance, with the notions of free ligia, or freya, Nordic tradition, and the Farvashi Iranian, the free, the Freya, which literally means the escort, was conceived as a spiritual entity dwelling in every man. She may be perceived in special times, for instance, at the time of death or of mortal danger. The Freya was confused with Hugir, the equivalent of the soul, but was also believed to be a supernatural power. Freya Yukoma, namely the spirit of both the individual and of his stock, Gain Freya, but the Freya was often portrayed as the equivalent of the Valkyrie, who in turn was conceived as an entity of fate, leading the individual to victory and to a heroic death. The same was true for the Fravashi of the ancient Iranian tradition, the terrifying goddess of war who give victory, health, and good glory to those who invoke them, while appearing as the inner power in every being that maintains it and grows it and makes it grow and subsist, and as the everlasting and deified souls of the dead in relation to the mystical power of the stock, as in the Hindu Pitri and in the Latin Manus. I have already discussed this kind of life's life, or deep-seated power of life hidden behind the body and the state of finite consciousness. Here it will suffice to say that one's guiding principle, or double, transcends every personal and particular form in which it is manifested. Thus, the abrupt and sudden shift from the ordinary state of individuated consciousness to the state characterized by such a principle would usually have the meaning of a destructive crisis, which effectively takes place after death. If we conceive that in some special circumstances, the double may burst into one's conscious eye and manifest itself according to its destructive transcendence, the meaning of the first of the above-mentioned assimilations will become apparent. Hence, the double, or man's guiding principle, and the deity of death that manifests itself, ergo, as a vocary, at the moment of death, or in circumstances of mortal danger, become one and the same. In the asceticism of a religious and mystical type, self-mortification, renunciation of one's self, and devotion to God are the preferred means that are employed to induce and to overcome the above-mentioned crisis. According to the other path to transcendence, however, the means to induce this crisis consists in the act of exaltation and awakening of the elements of action in a pure state. At an inferior level, dance was used as a sacred method to attract and to manifest various divinities and invisible powers through the ecstasy of the soul. This was the orgiastic, orgiastic shamanistic, bacchic, mainadic, and corybantic thing. In ancient Rome, too, there were sacred priestly dances performed by Luperci, 
and by the Arvali. The words of the Arvali hymnal help us, O Mars, dance, dance, already show the relationship between dance and war, which was sacred to Mars. The name of yet another priestly college, the Sali, is usually derived from saliri or sotari, to climb or to jump. According to the Muslim mystic Jalaluddin Rumi, he who knows the power of dance dwells in God, since he knows that love slays. Another life unleashed by the rhythm, was grafted unto the life of the dancer, representing the emergence of the abysmal root of the previous life, dramatized by the Lari, as Lares, Ludintis, or as Kuruti, Kureti. E. Saglio, Dictionar des Anteques, Greques et Romans de Apres las Textes et les Monument 6.947, the Curetti, armed dancers who engaged in orgies, Arquesteres, Aspide, Foroi, were regarded as demigods endowed with the power to initiate and also as the child's rearers, and Pandotrofoi, C. J. E. Harrison Themis, Cambridge, 1912. This, that is, as the mentors of the new principle that emerges through similar experiences. These were manifestations of the guiding principle in its fearful and active transcendence. At a higher level, there were the games of Asmunira, namely as sacred games, and war in the clear-minded inebriation and in the heroic Elan, Elan, generated in the struggle and in the tension for victory, in the games, but especially in war, tradition recognized the opportunity to undergo an analogous experience. It appears that even etymologically, Ludere conveyed the idea of untying, which esoterically referred to the ability usually found in competition to untie the individual bond and to reveal deep-seated powers. Hence, a further assimilation through which the guiding principle and the goddess of death not only are identical to the Furies and to the Aranes, but to the goddess of war known as the Valkyrie. Virgin warriors who magically strike the enemy with a frantic panic, Herf Jotur, and to the Fravashi, who are terrible, omnipotent powers who act impetuously. These powers were eventually transformed into goddesses, such as Victory or Nike, into the Lar Victor, into the Lar Martis et Passis Triumphalis, and into Leris, who in Rome were considered as demigods who have founded the city and instituted the empire. This further transformation corresponds to the positive outcome of such experiences, such as the double signified the deep power at a latent state in relation to the external consciousness, just as the goddess of death dramatized the sensation of the manifestation of this power as a principle of crisis in the es essence of the imperial self. And just as the Furies and the Aranes or the Lares Ludentes reflected a particular way for this power to become unleashed and to burst out, likewise the goddess Victoria and the Lar Victor expressed the triumph over this power, the two merging into one the triumphant passage to the state that lies beyond the danger of the formless ecstasy and dissolution occurring at the precise frantic moment of action. Moreover, wherever the actions of the spirit take place within the body of real actions and events, unlike what takes place in the domain of contemplative asceticism, a real parallelism can be established between the physical and the metaphysical the visible and the invisible. Therefore, 
Those actions can appear as the occult counterpart of warrior feats or of competitive events that have a real victory as their climax. Then the material victory reflects a corresponding spiritual event that has determined it alongside the previously disclosed paths of the energies connecting the inside to the outside. In other words, it appears as the real sign of an initiation and of a mystical epiphany taking place simultaneously. The warrior and the military leader who face the furies and death in a real way met them simultaneously within himself in his spirit under the form of dangerous manifestations of powers emerging from his abysmal, abyssal nature. By triumphing over them, he achieved victory. Note 18. The Nordic view, according to which battles are won thanks to the Valkyrie, expresses the idea that the outcome of a fight is determined by these powers rather than by human strength in a materialistic and individualistic sense. In the Roman world, we often find the idea of the manifestation of a transcendent power. This manifestation was sometimes expressed through the voice of the god Faunus that was heard by the troops before a battle and that filled the enemy with a holy terror. We also find the idea that it is sometimes necessary to sacrifice a leader in order to actualize this presence. According to the general meaning of ritual slayings, this was the rite of devotio, the sacrifice of the leader that unleashed infernal powers and the genius of terror unto the enemy. The minute the leader died, the panic and horror that corresponded to the power liberated from the body was manifested. This horror could be compared to Herfjotur, the panic and terror that was magically transmuted, transmitted by the unleashed Valkyrie to the enemy. One of the last echoes of similar meanings was found in the Japanese kamikaze during World War II. The word kamikaze referred to the suicide pilots unleashed against the enemy, and it means divine wind. On the fuselages of their planes, there was the inscription, You are gods who are free from all human yearnings. This is why, in classical traditions, every victory often acquired a sacred meaning. In the Imperator, in the hero, and in the leader who was acclaimed victorious on the battlefield, just as in the winner of the sacred Ludi, it was possible to detect the abrupt manifestation of a mystical force that transformed him and made him more than a human being. One of the warrior customs practiced by the Romans, which is susceptible to an esoteric interpretation, was the act of carrying the victorious general on shields. Aeneas 239-169 BC had previously assimilated the shields of the vault of heaven, Aldisonum Quelli Glupium, and the shield was sacred in the temple of the Olympian Jupiter. In the third century, the title of Imperator became one and the same with that of victor and the ceremony of triumph more than a military parade was a sacred ceremony in honor of the supreme capitoline god the winner appeared as the living image of jupiter and proceeded to put into the hands of this god the triumphal laurel of his victory the triumphal chariot was the symbol of jupiter's cosmic quadriga and the insignia of the leader corresponded to those of the god. The symbolism of victories, valkyries, or analogous entities leading the souls of the fallen heroes to the heavens, or the symbolism of a triumphant hero who, like Heracles, receives from Nike the crown reserved for those who partake of the Olympian immortality, becomes clear and completes 
what has been said so far about the holy war, we are in the context of traditions in which victory acquires the meaning of immortality similar to that bestowed in an initiation and in which victory appears as the mediatrix because of either her participation in transcendence or the manifestation of transcendence into a body of power. The Islamic idea according to which the warriors slain in a holy war have never really died should be referred to the same principle. See the, enigma see the enigmatic saying in the Quran 2, 153. Do not say that those who were slain in the cause of Allah are dead. They are alive, although you are not aware of them. Plato also wrote, And of those who are slain in the field, we shall say that all who fell with honor are of that golden race, who when they die, according to Hesiod, dwell here on earth pure spirits, beneficent, guardians to shield us mortal men from harm. Republic 468e. Last but not least, the victory of a leader was often regarded by the Romans as a separate entity, Numen, the mysterious life of which constituted the focus of a special cult, feasts, sacred games, Rituals and sacrifices were destined to renew its presence. The Victoria Sacerdus is the best example of this, being the equivalent of an initiatory or sacrificial action. Every victory was believed to generate an entity that was distinct from the destiny and from the particular individuality of the mortal being from which it derived. Just as in the case of the victory of the divine ancestors, this entity was believed to be capable of establishing a line of special spiritual influences. And as in the case of the cult of the divine ancestors, such influences needed to be confirmed and developed through rites acting in accord with the laws of sympathy and analogy. Therefore, it was mainly through games and competitions that the victori as numina were periodically celebrated. The regularity of this competitive cult, which was decreed by law, had the power to materialize a presence that was ready to join the forces of the race in an occult fashion and led them toward a good outcome in order to transform new victories into the means necessary for the revelation and for the strengthening of the energy of the original victory. Thus, in Rome, once the celebration of the deceased Caesar was confused with that of his victory and once regular games were dedicated to the Victoria Cesaris, it became possible to see him as a perennial winner. The cult of victory, believed to predate history, may be considered, generally speaking, as the secret soul of the Roman greatness in Fides. Since the times of Augustus, the statue of the goddess Victory had been placed on the altar of the Roman Senate, like Colombia is today in the United States. According to a traditional custom, any senator heading for his seat was first expected to approach that altar in order to burn some incense on it. That force was thus believed to preside invisibly over the deliberations of the curia. Hands were raised toward it when an oath of faithfulness was pronounced upon the advent of a new Caesar and also on every January 3rd, when solemn vows were made for the well-being of the emperor and for the prosperity of the empire. This was the most resilient Roman cult and the last to fall under the onslaught of Christianity. No belief was more strongly upheld by the Romans than the belief that the divine powers were responsible for creating Rome's greatness and for supporting its 
eternitas, and consequently that a war before being won on the battlefields had to be won or at least actuated in a mystical way. Following the defeat at Lake Trasimene, Fabius told his soldiers, your fault consists in having neglected the sacrifices and in having ignored the declarations of the augurs rather than in having lacked courage or ability. Livy, History of Rome, Plutarch tells us, to such a degree did the Romans make everything depend upon the wills of the gods, and so intolerant were they of any neglect of omens and ancestral rites, even when attended by the greatest success, considered it of more importance for the safety of the city that their magistrates should reverence sacred things than that they should overcome their enemies. It was also an article of faith that in order to take a city it was necessary to first it was necessary first to cause its tutelary god to abandon it. No war was initiated without sacrifices. A special college of priests, Fetiales, was entrusted with the rites pertaining to war. The bottom line of the Roman art of war was not to be forced to fight if the gods were opposed to it. Themistocles, Themistocles said, The gods and heroes perform these deeds, not us. Again, the real focus of everything was the sacrum. Supernatural actions were invoked to assist human actions and to infuse in them the mystical powers of victory. In savage populations, we still find characteristic echoes of these views, which should not be considered superstitious, provided they are properly contextualized and interpreted. According to these populations, War, in the last analysis, is a confrontation between warlocks. Victory goes to those who have the more powerful war machine with every other apparent factor, including the equal courage of warriors being a consequence. Since I have mentioned action and heroism as traditional values, it is expedient to underline the difference between them And the forms that, a few exceptions notwithstanding, can be seen in our day and age. The difference consists once again in the lack of the dimension of transcendence, and thus of an orientation that, even when it is not dedicated by pure instinct and blind force, does not lead to a true opening, but rather generates qualities that are destined to bestow on the empirical subject only a dark and tragic splendor. In the case of ascetical values, we find an analogous alteration that deprives asceticism of every enlightening element as one goes from the notion of asceticism to that of ethics, especially in relation to moral doctrines such as the Kantian and the Stoic ethical systems. Every morality in its higher versions, such as Kant's autonomous morality, is nothing but secularized asceticism. As such, it is only a surviving stump, and, it's la and it lacks a real foundation, a living foundation. Thus, the critique of the modern free spirits, Nietzsche, thus, the critique of the modern free spirits, Nietzsche included, could easily dismiss the values and the imperatives of the morality improperly designated as traditional. Improperly because in a traditional civilization, no morality enjoyed an autonomous dimension. Our contemporaries, however, have fallen to an even lower level in the shift that occurred from the autonomous and categorically imperative morality to a utilitarian and social morality affected by a fundamental relativity and contingency. As in the case with asceticism in general, when heroism and action are not aimed at leading back one's personality to its true center, they are nothing but an artificial device that begins and ends with man. 
As such, they do not acquire a meaning or a value beyond that of sensation, exaltation, and frantic impulsiveness. Such is almost without exception the work of the modern cult of action, even when everything is not reduced to a cultivation of reflexes and to con a control of elementary actions as in the case of war on the front line. Considering the advanced degree of mechanization of the modern varieties of action, it is almost inevitable for a man to seek out and to feed himself with existentially liminal experiences wherever they are to be found. Moreover, the plane is often shifted to collective and subpersonal forces, the incarnation of which is furthered by the ecstasy associated with heroism, sport, and action. The heroic myth based on individualism, voluntarism, and a superman attitude constitutes a dangerous deviation in our modern era on its basis, on its basis the individual. Precluding to himself all possibilities of extra individual and extra human development assumes, by virtue of a diabolical construction, the principle of his insignificant physical will as an absolute reference point and assails the external phantasm by opposing to it the phantasm of his own self. It is ironic that when confronting this contaminating insanity, he who realizes what game these poor and more or less heroic individuals are playing recalls Confucius, his advice according to which every reasonable person has the duty to safeguard his own life in view of the development of the only possibilities by virtue of which a man truly deserves to be called a man. G. de Giorgio, la contemplazione e la azione, la torre, number 7, 1930. The fact remains that modern man needs these degraded and desecrated forms of action, as if they were some kind of drug. He needs them to elude the sense of his inner emptiness, and to be aware of himself, and to find an exasperated sensations the surrogate for the true meaning of life. One of the characteristics of the Western Dark Age, Kali Yuga, is a sort of titanic restlessness that knows no limitations and that includes an existential fever and awakens new sources of elation and of stupefaction. Before continuing, I need to mention an aspect of the traditional spirit that is related to the law and to the view expounded so far. I am talking about various ordeals of character in so-called divine judgment. Quite often, the test of truth, right, justice, and innocence was made to depend on a trial that consisted of a decisive action, experimentum crucis, just as the law was traditionally believed to have a divine origin. Likewise, injustice was considered to be a violation of divine law and to be detectable through the outcome of a human action that had been given an adequate orientation. A Germanic custom consisted of delving into the divine will through the test of arms as a particular form of oracle mediated by action. The idea that originally was at the basis of the custom of challenging somebody to a duel is not very different. Starting with the principle, de coelo est fortitudo analis fulgensis, this, per, pr, this principle was eventually extended to feuding states and nations. A battle as late as that as, a battle as late as that of Fontaine, AD 841, was conceived as a divine judgment that was invoked to establish the rights of two brothers, both claiming the legacy of Charlemagne. When a battle was fought in this spirit, it followed special rules. The winner was forbidden to loot 
and to exploit strategically and territorially the successful outcome. And both sides were expected to tend equally to the fallen and to the wounded. According to the general view, that was preserved through the entire Carolingian period, however, even when the idea of a specific proof was not required, victory and defeat were felt to be signs. From above establishing justice or injustice, truth or guilt, in the legend of the combat between Roland and Ferugus, and in analogous themes of chivalrous literature, we can see the during we can see that during the Middle Ages, people believed that the test of arms was the criterion capable of assessing the truer faith. In instances, the trial consisted in the induction of a paranormal phenomenon. This was the case of classical antiquity, too. According to a Roman tradition, a Vestal Virgin suspected of sacrilege demonstrated her own innocence by carrying water from the Tiber River in a sieve. There was, or a sieve, there was also the custom which is not confined to the degenerative forms that have survived among savage populations of challenging a suspect who claimed his or her own innocence to ingest a poison or a substance inducing vomit. If the substance induced the usual effects, the charge was violated. I'm sorry. If the substance induced the usual effects, the charge was validated. During the Middle Ages, analogous voluntary ordeals were found not only in the context of temporal justice, but in the sacred domain too. Monks and even bishops agreed to submit themselves to such a criterion in order to establish the truth of their claims in the matter of doctrine. Around the year AD 506, during the reign of Emperor Athanasius, a Catholic bishop proposed to an Arian bishop to undergo the test of fire in order to determine which one of the two faiths was the true one. After the iron refused, the Catholic entered the fire and exited unscathed. This power was also attributed to the priests of Apollo, Super Ambustum Ligni Struum Ambulantes Non Aduri Tradbantur, says Pliny 7.2. The same idea is also found on a higher plane. According to the ancient Iranian idea, at the end of the world, all people will have to go through a fiery current. The righteous will not be harmed, but the evil ones will be consumed by the flames. Bun Dahesh. Even torture, which was conceived as a means to interrogate prisoners, was originally related to the notion of divine ju judgment. Truth was believed to have an almost magical power it was common it was a common belief that no torture could undermine the inner truth of an innocent person and of somebody who was telling the truth there is a clear connection between all this and the mystical character traditionally associated with victory in these trials, including the trials of arms, God was called as a witness by the participants in order for them to receive from him a supernatural sign that would then be used as a judgment. It is possible to rise from the lower level of these naive theistic representations to the pure form of the traditional idea, according to which truth, law, and justice ultimately appear as the manifestations of a metaphysical order conceived as a reality that the state of truth and of justice in man has the power to evoke in an objective way. In antiquity, the overworld was conceived as a reality in the higher sense of the word, superior to the laws of nature and capable of manifesting itself in this world every time one opened oneself to it without reservations and concern for oneself. In the next stage, the individual entered into certain psychic states, the already mentioned heroic, 
competitive states that unties the extreme tensions of the ordeal and of the danger being faced that were destined to open that were destined to open the closed human circuits to wider circuits and through which it was possible to generate unusual and apparently miraculous efforts effects this view explains and gives the proper meaning to tradition and customs such as the above mentioned ones in the order of ha of these customs truth and reality might and law victory and justice formed one thing having the supernatural as their center of gravity These views were destined to be regarded as pure supposition. Whenever progress systematically deprived the human virtue of any possibility of establishing an objective contact with a superior order of things, once man's strength was thought to be on the same level as that of animals, that is, as the faculty of mechanical action is a, in a being who is not at all connected to what transcends him as the individual, the trial of strength obviously becomes meaningless and the outcome of every competition becomes entirely contingent and lacking a potential relation with an order of higher values. Once the ideas of truth law and justice were turned into abstraction or social conventions once the sensation thanks to which the Aryan India is it was possible to say once again once the ideas of truth law and justice were turned into abstractions or social conventions once the sensation thanks to which in Aryan India it was possible to say the earth has truth as its foundation, was forgotten. Once every perception of these values as objective and almost physical apparitions of the supernatural amid the network of contingencies was lost, then it is natural to wonder how truth, law, and justice could possibly influence the determination of the phenomena and facts that science until recently has decreed not to be susceptible to modification. I said until recently because modern metaphysical researches have established the existence of paranormal powers latent in men that can become objectively manifested and modify the network of physical and chemical phenomena and electrical. In addition to the fact that it would have been unlikely for the practice of divine judgment to be continued for such a long time if no extra normal phenomenon were ever produced, the said metaphysical findings ought to modify the common opinion regarding the superstitious variations of the so-called divine trials. Nowadays, decisions with regard to what is true or right as well as matters of innocence and guilt are left to the clamor of petty forgers, the laborious promulgation of legal documents, the lengthy paragraphs of laws that are equal for everybody and made omnipotent by the secularized states and the plebeian masses who rule themselves without kings and self-appointed rulers. Conversely, the proud self-assurance with which traditional man reacted valiantly and super-individually against the unrighteous, armed with faith and the sword, and the spiritual impassibility that placed him in an a priori absolute relation to the subnatural power not subject to the power of the elements, sensation, and natural laws. All these things have come to be considered mere superstitious. 
In this context too, the decline of traditional values have been followed by their inversions. That can be seen at work wherever the modern world makes in law with the principle, makes a profession of realism, and seems to take up again the idea of an identity of victory, and the law with the principle might is right, since this is might in the highest material sense of the word, or better, if we refer to war in its most recent forms, in an almost demonic sense, since the technical and industrial potential has become the most decisive factor, a demon being something used, then we can see that discussions about values and righteousness are merely rhetorical. Such rhetoric is employed through big words and a hypocritical declamation of principles as a means in the service of an ugly will to power. This is a particular upheaval characterizing the last times, more on which later. End of chapter 18. In the name of God, the gracious, the merciful, when the sky is ruptured and hearkens to its Lord as it must, and when the earth is leveled out and casts out what is in it and becomes empty and hearkens to its Lord as it must, O oh man, you are laboring towards your Lord and you will meet him. As for him who is given his book in his right hand, he will have an easy settlement, and will return to his family delighted. But as for him who is given his book behind his back, he will call for death, and will enter the blaze. He used to be happy among his family. He thought he would never return. In fact, his Lord was watching him. I swear by the twilight, and by the night, and what it covers, and by the moon, as it grows full, you will mount stage by stage. What is the matter with them that they do not believe? And when the Quran is read to them, they do not bow down. In fact, those who disbelieve are in denial. But God knows what they hide inside. So inform them of a painful punishment. Except those who believe and do good deeds. They will have an undiminished reward. Anu, VV, VVV, Soul, 16 degrees Cancer. Luna, 6 degrees, Libra, Dies, Lune, July 8, 2019, Er, Virgo, 9.51 a.m. Do what thy wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. That was the way in which an aspirant to the AA addresses certain works that he hopes to be read and understood by those who read such language. It also allows, within a greater context of time and space, to locate a particular document uh, in the verbal realm as calendars are wont to change. Julius Evola revolts against the modern world. Chapter 19 And 19 rules over it. Space, time, the earth. I have previously pointed out that the difference between traditional and modern man is not simply a matter of mentality and type of civilization. Rather, the difference concerns the experiential possibilities available to, to each and the way in which the world of nature is experienced according to the categories of perception 
end the fundamental relationship between I and not I. For a traditional man, space, time, and casuality had a very different character than they have in the experience of modern men. The mistake of epistemology from Kant on is to assume that these fundamental forms of human experience have always remained the same, especially those with which we are most familiar in recent times. On the contrary, even in this aspect, it is possible to notice a deep transformation that reflects the general involutive process at work in history. With this said, I will limit myself to discussing the difference in the perception of time and space. As I mentioned in the foreword, my main contention is that time in traditional civilization was not a linear, historical time. Time and becoming are related to what is superior to time. In this way, the perception of time undergoes a spiritual transformation. In order to clarify this point, it is necessary to explain what time means today. Time is perceived as the simple, irreversible order of consecutive events. Its parts are mutually homogeneous and therefore can be measured in a quantitative fashion. Moreover, a distinction is made between before and later, namely between past and future. In reference to a totally relative, the present point in time, but whether an event is past or future, whether it takes place in one or another point in time, does not confer upon it any special quality. It merely makes it a datable event, that's all. In other words, there is some kind of reciprocal indifference between time and its contents. The temp Temporality of these contents simply means that they are carried along by a continuous current that never inverts its course and in which every moment, while being different from all others, is also equal to all others. In the most recent scientific theories, such as Minkowski's and Einstein's, Time even loses this particular character. Scientists talk about the relativity of time, of time as space's fourth dimension, and so on. This means that time becomes a mathematical order per se that is absolutely indifferent with regard to events, which may thus be located in a before rather than and after, depending on the reference system being adopted. The traditional experience of time was of a very different kind. Time was not regarded quantitatively, but rather qualitatively, not as a series, but as rhythm. It did not flow uniformly and indefinitely but was broken down into cycles and periods in which every moment had its own meaning and specific value in relation to all others, as well as a lively individuality and functionality. Each of these cycles are periods, the Chaldean and Hellenic Great Year, the Etruscan or Latin Seculum, the Iranian Aeon, the Aztec sons, the Hindu Kalpas, represented a complete development, forming closed and perfect units that were identical to each other, although they occurred, although they reoccurred, they did not change, nor did they multiply, but rather followed each other, according to Hubert Mauss. 
according to Hubert Mouse's fitting expression, as a series of eternities. <clears throat> Hubert Mouse, Melange de Histoire, Religious 207. According to the Chaldeans, the universe's entirety was divided into a series of great years in which the same events kept on recurring. Just like winter and summer keep on recurring every small year. If some time periods were sometimes personified as divinities or as divinities organs, this was yet another expression of the idea of the cycle as an organic unity. Since this wholeness was not quantitative but organic, the chronological duration of the seculum was ephemeral. Quantitatively, different periods of time were regarded as equal provided that each of them contained and reproduced all the typical phases of a cycle, and so certain numbers such as 7, 9, 12, and 1,000 were traditionally employed not to express quantities, but rather typical structures of rhythm. Thus, they had different durations, though they remained symbolically equivalent. Accordingly, instead of in, instead of an indefinite chronolo accordingly, instead of an indefinite chronological sequence, the traditional world knew a hierarchy based on analogical correspondences between great and small cycles. The result was a sort of reduction of the temporal manifold. To the supertemporal unity. The duration of traditional time may be compared to numbers that in turn are regarded as enumeration of lower unities or as sums capable of serving as units for the composition of higher numbers. Continuity is given to them by the mental operation that synthesizes their elements. Since the small cycle reproduced analogically the great cycle, this created the possibility of participation in ever greater orders and in durations increasingly free from all residues of matter or contingency until what was reached was some kind of space-time continuum. This idea is reflected in the Hindu view, according to which a year on the earth corresponds to a day for some lesser gods, while a year of these gods' lives corresponds to a day for gods occupying a higher hierarchical level, until we reach the days and nights of Brahman, which express the cyclical unfolding of the cosmic manifestation. See the laws of Manu, 1.64 through 74. In the same text, it is written that these cycles are repeated by the Supreme Lord as if he were playing. This expresses the irrelevance and the anti- historicity of the repetition in comparison to the immutable and eternal element that is manifested in it. We may also recall the biblical saying, for a thousand years in your sight are as yesterday. Now it is past. Psalms 94. Chapter 90, verse 4. By ordering time from above so that every duration was divided into equal cyclical periods reflecting such a structure, and by associating to specific moments of these cycles the celebrations, rituals, or festivities that were destined to reawaken or to reveal the corresponding meanings, 
the traditional world destined to reawaken or to reveal the corresponding meanings. The traditional world actively promoted a liberation and a transfiguration. It arrested the confused flow of the waters and created in them a transparency in the current of becoming, thus revealing immobile metaphysical depths. Therefore, it should not come as a surprise that the base calendar that measured time in ancient times had a sacred character and that it was entrusted to the wisdom of the priestly caste and that the hours of the day, the days of the week, and given days of the year were considered sacred to certain deities are associated with specific destinies. After all, as a residue of this notion, Catholicism developed a liturgical year spangled with religious festivities and with days marked by sacred events. In this liturgical year, we can still find an echo of that ancient view of time that was measured by ritual, transfigured by the symbol, and shaped into the image of a sacred history. The fact that stars, stellar periods, and given points in the course of the sun were traditionally utilized to determine the units of rhythm hardly lead hardly lends support to the so-called naturalistic interpretation of time. In fact, the traditional world never deified the natural or heavenly elements, but on the contrary, these elements were thought fit to convey divine forces in an analogical fashion. There is in the heaven a great multitude of gods who have characterized who have been recognized as such by those who survey the heavens, not casually, nor like cattle. The Emperor Julian, him to King Helios, 148c. Therefore, we can assume that the position of the sun in the course of the year was primordially the center and the beginning of an organic system of which the calendar notation was just another aspect that established constant interference and symbolical and magical correspondences between man, cosmos, and supernatural reality. From a traditional point of view, great reservation should be expressed about the theory of H. Wirth concerning a sacred series derived in primordial times from the astral movements of the sun as god year this series according to worth was the basis for the measurement of time for the signs and for the roots of a common prehistoric language and also for meanings related to the cult the two arches of the ascent and the descent of the solar light during the year appeared to be the most apt to express the sacrificial meaning of death and rebirth, as well as the cycle constituted by the dark descending path and by the bright ascending path. I will discuss later the tradition according to which the area that today corresponds to the Arctic regions was the original homeland of the stocks that created the main Indo-European civilizations. It is possible that when the Arctic freeze occurred, the division of the year into one long night and one long day highly dramatized the perception of the sun's journey in the sky and thus made it one of the best ways to express the above-mentioned metaphysical meaning substituting them with what was referred to in more remote periods as a peer, though not yet solar, polar symbolism. Considering that the constellations of the zodiac, which were articulations of the god year, were used to identify the moments of the sun's position in the sky. 
The number 12 is repeatedly found as one of the most apt rhythms to express anything that may have the meaning of a solar fulfillment. This number is also found whenever a center was established that in one way or another embodied or attempted to embody the Uranian solar tradition, or wherever myths or legends have portrayed the type of an analogous reg regency through figurations or symbolical personifications. The number 12, characterizing the signs of the zodiac, which correspond to the Hindu Aditya, appear in the number of chapters of the laws of Manu. In the 12 great Namshans of the circular council of the Dalai Lama, in the 12 disciples of Lao Tzu, originally two, who in turn initiated another ten. In the number of the priests of several Roman collegia, such as the Arvali and the Sali and the Simbri, in the number of the Ancilia established by Numa, in return for the sign of the heavenly protection he received, twelve is also the number of vultures that gave to Romulus, rather than Remos, the right to give his name to the city. Twelve were also the hist the Lictorians instituted by Romulus. And in the altars dedicated to Janus, in the twelve disciples of Christ, and in the twelve gates of the heavenly Jerusalem, in the twelve great Hellenic and Roman deities, in the twelve judges of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, in the twelve jasper towers built on the Taoist sacred mountain named Quanlun, in the twelve main Aesir, and their corresponding dwellings are thrones in the Nordic tradition. In the twelve labors of Hercules, or Heracles, in the number of days of Siegfried's journey, and in twelve kings subjected to him, in the twelve main knights sitting at King Arthur's round table, and in the twelve palatines of Charlemagne, the list could go on and on. Traditionally, the number seven refers to rhythms of development, of formation and of fulfillment in man the cosmos, and the spirit. As far as the spiritual dimension is concerned, see the seven trials found in many initiations, the seven deeds of Rostan, the seven days Buddha spent under the Bodhi tree, the seven cycles of seven days, each necessary to learn the doctrine. According to some Buddhist traditions, while the days of biblical creation were believed to be seven, these days corresponded to the millennia of the Iranian Chaldean traditions. These millennia were cycles, the last of which was considered a cycle of consummation, that is, of fulfillment and resolution or destruction in a solar sense. See Argonon's Le Symbolisme de la Croix. Thus, the week corresponds to the great hebdomadary of the ages of the world, just as the solar year corresponds to the cosmic great year. There are many references to the development and duration of some civilizations, such as the six secula of life attributed to the Roman world, the seventh being the Seculum and its demise, the number of the first kings of Rome, the ages of the first Manus of the great present cycle, according to the Hindu tradition, and so on. But in the course of the solar journey along the twelve points of the zodiac, one point in particular acquires a special meaning.
and that is the critical one corresponding to the lowest point on the ellipsis, winter solstice, which marks the end of the descent, the beginning of the reascent, and the separation of the dark and the bright periods, according to figurations formulated in remote prehistory. The god ear is portrayed in the context as the axe or the god axe, who splits in half the circular symbolism of the year or other equivalent symbols. From a spiritual perspective, this marks the typically triumphant moment of solidarity, of solarity and the beginning of a new life and of a new cycle. Natalis di solis invicti. Natalis di solis invicti. Natalis di solis invicti. This moment was represented in various myths as the victorious outcome of the struggle of a solar hero against creatures manifesting the dark principle. These creatures were often represented by the sign of the zodiac in which the winter solstice happened to fall in that particular year. The dates corresponding to stellar positions in the sky, such as the solstice, which were apt to express higher meanings in terms of a cosmic symbolism, are preserved almost identically in the various forms assumed by tradition and passed on from one people to another. Through a comparative study, it is possible and very easy to point out the correspondence and the uniformity of feasts and of fundamental cal calendar rhythms through which the sacred was introduced into the fabric of time, thus breaking its duration into many cycles or into many cyclical images of an eternal history that various natural phenomena contributed to recall and to make the rhythm. In the traditional view, moreover, time presented a magical aspect, since the virtue of the law of analogical correspondences, every point of a cycle had its own individuality. During Duration consisted in the periodical succession of manifestations typical of certain influences and powers. It presented times that were favorable and unfavorable, auspicious and inauspicious. This qualitative element of time played the main role in the science of the right. The parts of time could not be considered indifferent to the things to be performed and thus presented an act of character that had to be reckoned with. Concerning this future, see the characteristic expressions of Macrobius in Saturnalia 1.15. Available on archive.com by Harvard University Press. Every rite had its own appointed time. It had to be performed at a particular moment, outside of which its virtue was diminished or paralyzed, and could even produce the opposite effect. In many ways, we can agree with Herbert Mouse, who said that the ancient calendar marked the periodicity, periodicity of a system of rites. More generally, there were disciplines, such as the science of divination, that attempted to establish whether a given time or period was auspicious or not for the performance of a given deed. I have already mentioned the attention given to this matter in Roman military enterprises. This is not fatalism. It rather expresses traditional man's constant intent to prolong and to integrate his own strength with a non-human strength by discovering the times in which two rhythms, the human rhythm and the rhythm of natural powers by virtue of a law of syntony, of a concordant action 
and of a certain correspondence between the physical and the metaphysical dimensions are liable to become one thing, and thus cause invisible powers to act. In this way, the qualitative view of time is confirmed. Within time, every hour and every aspect has its sacred aspect and its virtue. Also, acting within time on the higher symbolical and sacred plane, such a plane should not be confused with the magical plane, although the latter, in the last analysis, presupposes an order of knowledge deriving more or less directly from the former. A separate group consists of those rites and those celebrations which, despite their cyclical character, do not find real correspondences in nature, but are rather originated by fatal events connected to a given race. There are cyclical laws that actualize in an identical fashion an uninterrupted chain of eternity. The consideration the considerations that follow from these premises are very important. If traditionally empirical time was measured by a transcendent time that did not contain events but meanings, and if this essentially meta-historical time must be considered as the context in which myths heroes and traditional gods lived and acted, then an opposite shift acting from below must also be conceived. In other words, it is possible that some historically real events or people must have repeated and dramatized a myth, incarnating meta-historical structures and symbols whether in part or entirely whether consciously or unconsciously. Thereupon, by virtue of this, these events are being shipped from one time to another, becoming new expressions of pre-existing realities. They belong to both times. They are characters in events that are simultaneously real and symbolical. And on this basis, they can be transported from one period to another, before or after their real existence, as long as one is aware of the meta-historical element they represent. This is the reason why some of the findings of modern scholars concerning the alleged historicity of events or characters of the traditional world much of their obsession to separate what is historical from what is mythical or legendary, some of their doubts about the childish traditional chronology, and finally their belief in so-called euhemerism, can most decisively be said to lack solid foundations. In these cases, as I have previously argued, myth and anti-history represent the path leading to a deeper knowledge of what we regard as history. Moreover, it is in this same order of ideas that we must look for the true meaning of the legends concerning characters who became invisible and who never died, and who are destined to reawaken or to manifest themselves at the end of a given time cyclical correspondence such as Alexander the Great, King Arthur, Frederick, King Sebastian. The latter are all different incarnations of some one theme transferred from reality into super-reality. The Hindu doctrine of the avatars, the periodical divine incarnations who assume different personalities, but who nevertheless express the same function, must be interpreted along these lines. If traditional man had an experience of time essentially different from that of modern man, 
it follows that analogous considerations must be made concerning the experience of space. Space is considered today as the simple container of bodies and of motions, totally indifferent to both. It is homogeneous. A particular area of it is the objective equivalent of another one. And the fact that a thing is found or that an event may take place in one point of space rather than another, rather than in another, does not confer any particular quality to the intimate nature of that thing or that event. I am referring here to what space represents in the immediate experience of modern man and not to certain recent physical mathematical views of space as a curved and non-homogeneous multidimensional space. Moreover, beside the fact that these are mere mathematical schemata, the value of which is merely pragmatic and without correspondence to any real experience, the different values that the points of each of these spaces represent when considered as intensive fields are referred only to matter, energy, and gravitation, and not to something extra physical or qualitative. In the experience of traditional man, on the contrary, and even in the residues at times present among some savage populations, space is alive and saturated with all kinds of qualities and intensity. The traditional idea of space is often confused with the same idea of vital ether, the akasha or mana, which is a mystical, all-pervasive substance energy, more material than immaterial, more psychic than physical, often conceived as light, and distributed according to various saturations in various regions. Thus, each of these regions seems to possess its own virtues and to participate essentially in the powers that reside in it so as to make every place a fatidic space endowed with its own intensity and occult individuality. In the well-known expression of Epimenides of Gnosus, 6th century BC, that was quoted by Paul in his speech in the Areopagus, in him we live and move and have our being, Acts 17.28. If we substitute for the word him, the word divine or sacred or numinous, it may be employed to express what traditional man often saw instead of the space of the moderns, which is ultimately an abstract and impersonal place filled with objects and motions. It is not possible in this context to discuss all of what in the traditional world was based on such an expression of space. I will limit myself to references in the two distinct orders mentioned above, namely the magical and symbolical. Space, in antiquity, has constantly provided the basis for the most characteristic expressions of the metaphysical dimension. The heavenly and the earthly regions, high and low, the vertical and the horizontal axes, left and right, were all categories that provided the material for a typical, highly significant, and universal symbolism one of the most famous forms of which was the symbolism of the cross. 
there may well have been a relationship between the two-dimensional cross and the four cardinal points. Between the three-dimensional cross and the schema derived by adding to these points the dimensions of above and below. Still, this does not lend any support whatsoever to the naturalistic and geoastronomical interpretations of ancient symbols. At this point, it is helpful to repeat what has been said concerning the astral elements of the calendars, namely, that when the cross is found in nature, this means that true symbolism, far from being artificially devised by man, is found in nature itself, or better, nature is in its entirety. Nothing but a symbol, nature in its entirety, is nothing but a symbol of transcendent realities. When we shift to the magical plane, every direction in space corresponded to given influences that were often portrayed as supernatural beings or as spirits. This knowledge not only helped to establish important aspects of the augural science and of geomancy, see the characteristic development of this discipline in the Far East, but also the doctrine of the sacred orientations in the right and the arrangement of the temples. The art of orientation of the cathedrals was provided in Europe up to the Middle Ages. Always in conformity with the law of analogies and with the possibility afforded by this law to extend the human and the visible elements into the cosmic and invisible dimension. Just as one moment of traditional time did not correspond to another because of the action, especially a ritual one, that had to be undertaken, likewise there was not a point, a region, or a place of traditional space that corresponded to another. This was the case in an even wider sense, owing to the fact that some rites required subterranean places or caves, while others required mountain peaks, and so on. In fact, there was such a thing as a real, that is, not arbitrary, but conformed to physical transpositions of metaphysical elements, sacred geography, that inspired the belief in sacred lands and cities. In the traditional centers of spiritual influence on earth, and also in environments consecrated so as to vitalize any action oriented to the transcendence taking place within them. Generally speaking, in the world of tradition, the location of the temples and many and of many cities was not casual, nor did it obey simple criteria of convenience. Their construction was preceded by specific rites and obeyed special laws of rhythm and of analogy. It is very easy to identify those elements that indicate that the space in which traditional that the space in which the traditional rite took place was not space as modern man understands it, but rather a living fatidic magnetic space in which every gesture had a meaning and in every and in which every sign word and action participated in a sense of inelectability and of eternity thus becoming transformed into a kind of decree of the invisible and yet the space in which the rite occurs should be regarded as more intense as a more intense kind of space in the general perception of the man of tradition i will now briefly discuss the myths which with which according to our contemporaries ancient man embellished the various elements and aspects of nature the truth in that the truth 
is that here we find once more that opposition between hyperrealism and humanism that separates what is traditional form from what is modern. The experience of nature as it is understood by modern men, namely as a lyrical, subjectivist, pathos awoken in the sentiments of the individual at the sight of nature, was almost entirely absent in traditional men. Before the high and snowy peaks, the silence of the woods, the flowing of the rivers, mysterious capes, and so on, traditional man did not have poetic and subjective impressions typical of a romantic soul but rather real sensations, even though at times confused of the supernatural, of the powers, noumena, that permeated those places, these sensations were translated into various images, spirits and gods of the elements, waterfalls, woods, and so on, often determined by the imagination, yet not arbitrarily and subjectively, but according to a necessary process. In other words, we may assume that in addition, we in other words, we may assume that in traditional man, the power of the imagination was not merely confined to either the material images corresponding to sensible data or arbitrary and subjective images as in the case of the reveries or dreams of modern men. On the contrary, we may conclude that in traditional man, the power of the imagination was free, to a high degree, from the yoke of the physical senses, as it is nowadays in the state of sleep or through the use of drugs. This power was so disposed as to be able to perceive and translate into plastic forms subtler impressions of the environment, which nonetheless were not arbitrary and subjective, when in the state of dream a physical impression, such as the pressure of the blankets, is dramatized with the image of a falling rock. This is obviously the case of a fantastic and yet net and yet not arbitrary production. The image arose out of necessity, independently from the eye, as a symbol that effectively corresponds to a perception. The same holds true for those fantastic images, primordial man introduced in nature. Primordial man, in addition to the physical perception, also had a psychic or subtle perception of things and places corresponding to the presences found in them that was generated by a power of the imagination free from the physical senses and responsible for determining in its corresponding symbolical dramatizations. For example, gods, demons, elementals, and spirits ruling over places and phenomena. It is clear that there have often been different personifications according to the multi-form power of the imagination of various races and sometimes even of different people. But a trained eye is able to see a unity behind this variety. Just as a person who is awake is immediately able to see unity in the variety of impressions created by the diversity of symbols in the dreams of different people. These images are nevertheless equivalent once they are reduced to the common objective, caused and perceived in a distinct way. Far from being fantastic, poetical tales drawn from nature are better from those material representations of nature that modern man can perceive, the myths of the ancients and their fantastic fundamental figurations originally represented an integration of the objective experience of nature. 
the myths also represented something that spontaneously penetrated into the fabric of sensible data. This completing them would thus completing them with lively and at times even visible symbols of the subtle, demonic, or sacred elements of space and time. These considerations concerning the traditional myths and the special relations they have with the sense of nature must naturally be applied to every traditional myth. It must be acknowledged that every traditional mythology arises as a necessary process in the individual consciousness, the origin of which resides in real, though unconscious and obscure relationships with a higher reality. These relationships are the dramatization, are then dramatized in various ways by the power of the imagination. Therefore, not only naturalistic or theological myths but historical ones as well, should not be regarded as arbitrary. Inventions totally devoid of an objective value with regard to facts or people, but rather as integrations that did not occur casually. These integrations eventually reveal the superhistorical content that may be found to varying degrees in those historical individuals and events. Therefore, the eventual lack of correspondence of the historical element with a myth demonstrates the untruth of history rather than that of the myth. This thought occurred to Hegel too when he spoke about the impotence on Macht of nature. What has been said so far relates to the presence of some kind of existential situation concerning the basic relationship between the I and the not I. This relationship has lately been characterized by a set of and rigid separation. It so appears that in the origins, the borders between I and not I were potentially fluid and unstable and in certain cases they could partially be removed. When that happened, either one or two possibilities could occur. The possibility of incursions of the not I, or nature in the sense of its elemental forces and its psychism, and the I, or an incursion of the I into the not I. The first possibility explains that the first possibility explains what have been called the perils of the soul. It is the idea that the unity and the autonomy of the person may be threatened and affected by processes and possessions that the person may be threatened and affected by processes and possession, and of obsession, hence the existence of rituals in various institutions. That have as their goal the spiritual defense of the individual or of the collectivity and the confirmation of the independence and the sovereignty of the I and of its structures. This should refer mainly to civilizations of a higher kind. When talking about the earth, I will mention the existence of an opposite orientation in the primitive connection between man and earth. The general presupposition for the efficacy of a body of magical procedures 
was that the second possibility, which consists of the removal of the boundaries and of the ensuing incursions in the opposite direction of the one into the not I, or of the I into the not I, or of the one into the not one in Roman numeral, could take place, since the two possibilities shared the same basis. The advantages of the latter had as a counterpart the existential risk in derived from the former. We should remember that during the last times, following the progressive materialization of the I, both possibilities have disappeared. The active and positive magic possibility has disappeared everywhere but in few insignificant and marginal residues. As far as the perils of the soul are concerned, modern man who boasts to have finally become free and enlightened and who laughs at everything that in traditional antiquity derived from that different relationship between I and not I is really deceiving himself to think he is safe from them. These, those dangers have only assumed a different form, which disguises them. Modern man is open to the complexes of the collective unconscious, to emotive and irrational currents, to collective influences, and to ideologies, with consequences far more harmful and deplorable than those found in other areas and other eras, and deriving from different influences. Returning to what I have expounded before, I would like to say something about the ancient meaning of the earth and of its properties. From a traditional point of view, between man and his land, between blood and soil, there existed an intimate relationship of a living and psychic character since a given area had a psychic individuality in addition to its geographic individuality, those who were born in it were bound to be deeply affected by it. From a doctrinal point of view, we must distinguish a double aspect in this state of dependency, the former naturalistic, the latter supernaturalistic, which leads us back to the above-mentioned distinction between totemism and the tradition of a patrician blood that has been purified by an element from above. The former aspect concerns beings who do not go beyond empirical and ordinary life. In these beings, the collective predominates, both as a law of blood and stock and as law of the soil, even if the mystical sense of the region to which they belong is awakened, such a sense does not go beyond mere terrorism. Though they may know a tradition of rites, these rites have only a demonic and totemic character, and they contribute to strengthening and renewing rather than overcoming and removing the law by virtue of which the individual does not have a life of his own and is thus destined to be dissolved into the subpersonal stock of his blood. Such a stage may be characterized by an almost communist and at times even matriarchal social organization of the clan or of the tribe. What we find in it, however, is what in modern man has either become extinguished or has become naturalistic or romantic or has become naturalistic or romantic rhetoric, namely the organic and living sense of one's own land, which is a direct derivation of the qualitative experience of space in general. The second aspect of the traditional relationship between a man and his land is very different. Here we find the idea of a supernatural action that has permeated a given territory with a supernatural influence by removing the demonic telluric elements of the soil and by imposing upon it a triumphal seal. Thus, 
reducing it to a mere substratum for the powers that transcend it. We have already found this idea in the ancient Iranian belief that the glory, the celestial living and triumphal fire that is the exclusive legacy of kings pervades the lands that the Aryan race has conquered and that it possesses and defends against the infidels and the forces working for the god of darkness. After all, even in more recent times, there has been an intimate and not merely empirical relationship between spear and plow, between nobility and the farmers. It is significant that Aryan deities such as Mars or Donar Thor were simultaneously deities of war and of victory over elemental natures in the case of Thor and of the soil presiding over its cultivation. I have already mentioned the symbolical and even initiatory transpositions that surrounded the cultivator, and the memory of it remains in the derivation of the world word culture. Another characteristic expression lies in the fact that in every higher form of tradition, private ownership of the land as private property was an aristocratic and sacred privilege. The only people who could lay claim to land were those who had rights in the specific patrician sense I mentioned in chapter 6, namely those who are the living bearers of a divine element. In Rome, this might right this right In Rome, this right belonged only to the patres, the lords of the sacrificial fire. In Egypt, it belonged only to the warriors and the priests. The slaves, those without family names and tradition, were thought to be qualified to own land, were thought were not thought to be qualified to own land. The slaves, those without family names and tradition, were not thought to be qualified to own land because of their social status. For instance, in the ancient Nahua, Nahua Aztec civilization, two distinct and even opposite types of property coexisted. One was an aristocratic, hereditary, and differentiated type that was transmitted together with one's family's social status. The second was popular and plebeian of a promiscuous type, like the Russian Mir. This opposition can be found in several other civilizations and is related to that which existed between the Uranian and the Chthonic cults. In traditional nobility, a mysterious relationship was established between the gods of the heroes and of a particular gents and that very land. It was through its noumena and with a net accentuation of the meaning, originally not only material, of ownership and lordship that the gents was connected to its own land. So much so that, due to a symbolical and possibly magical transposition, its limits, the Greek and the Roman Herculum, were regarded as sacred fatal and protected by gods of order, such as Zeus and Jupiter. These are almost the equivalent of another plane, of the same inner limits of the noble caste and of the noble family. We can say that at this level, the limits of the land, just like the spiritual limits of the caste, were not limited that enslaved were not limits that enslaved, but that preserved and freed. Thus, we can understand why exile was often regarded as a punishment of a seriousness hardly understood today. It was almost like dying to the gents to whom one belonged. 
The same order of ideas is confirmed in the fact that in several traditional civilizations, to settle in a new unknown or wild land and to take possession of it was regarded as an act of creation and as an image of the primordial act whereupon chaos was transformed into cosmos. In other words, it was not regarded as a mere human deed, but rather as an almost magical and ritual action believed to bestow on a land and on a physical location a form by bathing such land in the sacred and by making it living and real in a higher sense. Thus, there are examples of the ritual of taking possession of lands and of territorial conquests. As in the case of the land Nama in ancient Iceland, or in the Aryan celebration of a territory through the establishment in it of an altar with fire. In China, the, the assignment in China, the assignment of a thief which turned a patrician into a prince implied among other things, the duty to maintain a sacrificial ritual. For one's divine ancestors, who thus became the protectors of the territory, and for the God of this piece of land, who was created for the benefit of the prince himself. Moreover, if in the ancient Aryan law the firstborn was entitled to inherit the father's property and lands, often with the bond of inalienability, the property belonged to him essentially because he was regarded as the one who perpetuated the ritual of the family as the pontifex of his own people and as the one whose responsibility it was to tend the sacred fire and not let it be put out, since the fire was considered the body or life of the divine ancestor, we must also consider that the legacy of the right and that of the earth formed one whole, filled with meaning. The Odell, the Mundium of free northern Aryan men in which the ideas of possession of the land, nobility, warrior blood, and divine cult were aspects of an unbreakable synthesis was an example of this. In inheriting the ancestral land, there existed an unspoken and expressed commitment toward it almost as a counterpart of the duty toward the divine and aristocratic legacy that was passed on through the blood and that alone had originally introduced the right to property. The last traces of these values can be found in the feudal Middle Ages. Even though during this time, the right to property no longer belonged to the type of the aristocrat of sacred origins who was surrounded only by equals or by inferiors, as in the traditional forms of the origins found in the oldest constitution of the German people. And even though an aristocratic warrior class came to own the right to the land, Nevertheless, the counterpart of such a right was the capability of a super-individual, though not sacred dedication. The assignment of a thief implied from the Franks on the commitment on the part of the feudal lord to be faithful to his prince, that is, to exercise the fides that had a heroic and religious as well as a political and military value, sacramentum. Fidelitatis. This fides represented readiness to die and to sacrifice. In essence, a connection to a superior order in a mediated way rather than immediately as in the case of sacred aristocracy, sometimes without a metaphysical insight, although 
always with the virile superiority over the naturalistic and individualistic element and with a well-developed ethics of honor. Thus, those who are prone to consider not only the contingent and historical element, but also the meaning that social institutions assume on a higher plane may detect in the feudal regimes of the Middle Ages traces of the traditional idea of the aristocratic and sacred privilege of ownership of the land, the idea according to which to own and to be lord of a land, the inalienable right of superior stocks, is a spiritual and not merely a political title and commitment. Even the feudal interdependence between the state of the people and the state of the lands had a special meaning. Originally, the state of the people determined the state of the territorial property, depending on whether a man was more or less free, more or less powerful. The land he inhabited assumed either this or that character, which was validated by various titles of nobility. The state of the lands reflected, therefore, the state of the people. On this basis, the dependency that arose the ideas of ownership and land became so intimate that later on the sign often appeared as a cause, and the state of a people not only was indicated by determined, but determined by that of the lands. Moreover, the social status and the various hierarchical and aristocratic dignities were incorporated in the soil. Thus, I agree wholeheartedly with the idea expressed by Golangis, according to which the apparition of the will, Thelema, in the sense of an individualistic freedom, of those who own the land to divide their property, break it up, and separate it from the legacy of blood and the rigorous norms of the paternal right in primogeniture, truly represents one of the characteristic manifestations of the degradation of the traditional spirit. More generally, when the right of property ceases to be the privilege of the two higher castes and shifts to the two lower castes, the merchants and the serfs, what de facto occurs in a virtual naturalistic regression, and therefore man's dependency on the spirits of the land, is re-established. In the case of the solar traditionalism of the lords of the soil, superior presences transformed these spirits into zones of favorable influences and into creative and preserving limits. The land, which may also belong to a merchant, the owners of the capitalist bourgeois age may be regarded as the modern equivalent of the ancient merchant caste, Kasatria, or to a serf or modern worker, is a desecrated land. In conformity with the interests typical of two inferior castes, which have succeeded in taking the land away from the ancient type of feudal lords, the land is only valued from an economic point of view, and it is exploited as much as possible with machines and with other modern technical devices. That being the case, it is natural to encounter other typical traits of a degeneration, such as the property increasingly shifts from the individual to the collectivity. Parallel with the collapse of the aristocratic title to the lands and the economy having become the main factor, what emerges first is nationalism, which is followed by socialism and finally by Marxist communism. In other words, there is a return to the rule of the collective over the individual that reaffirms the collectivist and promiscuous concept of property typical of inferior races as an overcoming of private property and as nationalization, socialization, and, proletarization and proletarization of goods and of land. End 
of chapter 19. Chapter 20 discusses man and woman. Julius Evola, Baron, Revolt Against the Modern World, Chapter 20, Man and Woman. To complete these considerations on traditional life, I will now briefly discuss the sexual dimension. In this context, too, we find that in the traditional worldview, Realities corresponded to symbols and actions to rights. What derives from these correspondences are the principles for understanding the sexes and for regulating the relationships that are necessarily established between men and women in every normal civilization. In traditional symbolism, the supernatural principle was conceived as masculine, and the principle of nature and of becoming as feminine. In Hellenic terms, the one, which is in itself complete and self-sufficient, is regarded as masculine. Conversely, the dyad, the principle of differentiation and of other than self, and thus the principle of desire and of movement is regarded as feminine. In Hindu terms, according to the Samkhaya Darsana, the impassable spirit, Purusa, is masculine, while Prakriti, the active matrix of every conditioned form, is feminine. The Far Eastern tradition has expressed equivalent concepts through the cosmic duality of yin and yang, whereby yang, the male principle, is associated with the virtue of heaven, and yin, the feminine principle, with the principle of the earth. Further metaphysical and mythical references are found in Julius Evola, Eros and the Mysteries of Love. Among the philosophers of the Song Dynasty, we find the teaching that heaven produces men while the earth produces women. Therefore, woman must be subjected to man as the earth is subjected to or within heaven. Considered in and of themselves, the two principles are in opposition to each other. But in the order of the creative formation that I have repeatedly identified as the soul of the traditional world, and that was destined to develop historically in relation to the conflict between various races and civilizations, they are transformed into elements of a synthesis in which both retain a distinctive function. This is not the place to show that behind the various representations of the myth of the fall, we often find the idea of the male principle's identification with and loss in the feminine principle until the former has acquired the latter's way of being. In any event, when this happens, 
when that which is naturally a self-subsistent principle succumbs to the law of that which does not have its own principle in itself by giving in to the forces of desire, then it is appropriate to talk about a fall. On the plane of human reality, the diffidence that various traditions have nurtured toward women is based precisely on this belief. The woman is often considered as a principle of sin, impurity, and evil, as well as a temptation and a danger for those who are in search of supernatural or of the supernatural. Nevertheless, it is possible to consider another possibility that runs counter to the direction of the fall. And that is to establish the correct relationship between the two principles. This occurs when the feminine principle, whose force is centrifugal, does not turn to fleeting objects, but rather to a virile stability in which she finds a limit to her restlessness. Stability is then transmitted to the feminine principle to the point of intimately transfiguring all of its possibilities. What occurs in these terms is a synthesis in a positive sense. What is needed, therefore, is a radical conversion of the feminine principle to the opposite principle. Moreover, it is absolutely necessary for the masculine principle to remain holy itself. Then, according to metaphysical symbols, the female becomes the bride, and also the power or instrumental generating force that receives the primordial principle of the immobile male's activity and form, as in the doctrine of Sakti, which can also be found in Aristotelianism, and in Neoplatonism, though expressed in different terms. I have mentioned the Tantric Tibetan representations that are very significant in this regard, in which the male bearer of the scepter is immobile, cold, and substantiated with light, while the substance of Shakti, which envelops it and uses it as its axis, is a flickering flame. In the erotic symbolism of these traditions, the same meaning is expressed through the figuration of the divine couple as they engage in the so called the Parita Mithuna, an intercourse in which the male is still while the Shakti moves her body. These meanings constitute the foundation of the traditional teachings concerning the human sexes. This norm obeys the principle of the caste system and it also emphasizes the two cardinal tenets of Dharma and Bhakti or Fides, self-subsistent nature and act of dedication. If birth is not a matter of chance, then it is not a coincidence for a being to awaken to itself in the body of a man or a woman. Here, too, the physical difference should be viewed as the equivalent of a spiritual difference. Hence, a being is a man or a woman in a physical way, only because a being is either masculine or feminine in a transcendental way. Sexual differentiation, far from being an irrelevant factor in relation to the spirit, is the sign that points to a particular vocation and to a distinctive dharma. We know that every traditional civilization is based on the will to order and give form and that the traditional law is not oriented toward what is unqualified, equal, and indefinite, or in other words, toward that impersonal mix in which the various parts of the whole become promiscu promiscuously 
are atomically similar, but rather intends these parts to be themselves and to express as perfectly as possible their own typical nature. Therefore, particularly with regard to the genders, man and woman are two different types. Those who are born as men must realize themselves as men, while those who are born as women must realize themselves as women. Overcoming any mixture and promiscuity of vocations, even in regard to the supernatural vocation, man and woman must both have their own distinctive paths to follow, which cannot be altered without them turning into contradictory and inorganic ways of being. I have already considered the way of being that corresponds eminently to man. I have also discussed the two main paths of approach to the value of being a principle to oneself, namely action and contemplation. Thus the warrior, the hero, and the ascetic represent the two fundamental types of pure virility. In symmetry with these types, there are also two types available to the feminine nature. A woman realizes herself as such and even rises to the same level reached by a man as warrior and ascetic only as lover and mother. These are bipartitions of the same ideal strain, just as there is an act of heroism, there is also a passive heroism. There is a heroism of absolute affirm affirmation and a heroism of absolute dedication. They can both be luminous and produce plenty of fruits as far as overcoming human limitations and achieving liberation are concerned when they are lived with purity and in the sense of an offering. This differentiation of the heroic strain determines the distinctive character of the paths of fulfillment available to men and women. In the case of woman, or in the case of women, the actions of the warrior and of the ascetic who affirm themselves in a life that is beyond life, the former through pure action and the latter through pure detachment, correspond to the act of the woman totally giving of herself in being entirely for another being. Whether he is the loved one, the type of the lover, the aphrodisiatic, the aphrodistic woman, or the son, the type of the mother, the Demetrian woman, finding in this dedication the meaning of her own life her own joy, and her own justification. This is what bhakti or fides, which constitute the normal and natural way of participation of the traditional woman really mean. Both in the order of form and even beyond form, when it is lived in a radical and impersonal way, to realize oneself in an increasingly resolute way according to these two distinct and unmistakable directions, to reduce in a woman all that is masculine and in a man everything that is feminine, and to strive to implement the archetypes of the absolute man and of the absolute woman. That was the traditional law concerning the sexes according to their different planes of existence. Therefore, a woman could traditionally participate in the sacred hierarchical order only in a mediated fashion through her relationship with a man. In India, women did not have their own initiation even when they belonged to a higher caste. Before they got married, they did not belong to the sacred community of the noble ones, Arya other than through their fathers, and when they were married, through their husbands, who also 
represented the mystical head of the family. Note 3. Apart from their husbands, women cannot sacrifice or undertake a vow or fast. It is because a wife obeys her husband, an obedience in the sense of a Catholic obedience, that she is exalted in heaven. The Laws of Manu 5.155 It is not possible in this context to discuss the meaning of female priesthood and to explain why it does not contradict the above-mentioned example. Female priesthood traditionally had a lunar character. Rather than representing another path available to women, it expressed an affirmation of feminine dharma as an absolute elimination of any personal principle so as to make room for the voice of the oracle and of the god. Further on, I will discuss the alteration proper of decadent civilizations in which the lunar feminine element usurps the hierarchical peak. We must also consider the sacral and initiatory use of women in the path of sex. In Doric Hellas, the woman in her entire life did not enjoy any rights. Before getting married, her priest was her father. In Rome, in conformity with a similar spirituality, a woman, far from being equal to men, was juridically regarded as a mother. Apologies. In Rome, in conformity with a similar spirituality, a woman, far from being equal to men, was juridically regarded as a daughter of her own husband, Philea Loco and as a sister of her own children, Sorias Loco. When she was a young girl, she was under the potestas of her father, who was the leader, who was the leader and the priest of his own gents. When she married, according to a rather blunt expression, she was in Manu Viri. These traditional decrees regulating a woman's dependency can also be found in other civilizations. In an ancient Chinese text, the Nio Gi Se Pyeon 5, we read, When a woman leaves the house of her father to join the house of her husband, she loses everything, including her name. She does not own anything in her own right. Whatever she has and whatever she is belongs to her husband. And in the new Hin Shu, it is said that a woman must be in the house as a shadow and as a mere echo. Quoted in St. Trovatelli, La civiltà e le legislazioni del antico oriente. Bologna, 1890, pages 157 through 58. Far from being unjust and arrogant, as the modern free spirits are quick to decry, they helped to define, they helped to define the limits and the natural place of the other, of the only spiritual path proper to the pure feminine nature. I will mention here some ancient views that expressly describe the pure type of the traditional woman who is capable of being an offspring that is half human and half divine. In the Aztec Nahua tradition, the same privilege of heavenly immortality proper to the warrior aristocracy was partaken of by the mothers who died while giving birth. Since the Aztecs considered this sacrifice on the same level as the one made by those who die on the battlefield. Another example is the type of the traditional Hindu woman 
a woman who in the deepest recesses of her soul was capable of the most extreme forms of sensuality and yet who lived by an invisible and vota fetus by virtue of this fetus that offering that was manifested in the erotic dedication of her body, person, and will culminated in another type of offering of a different kind and way beyond the world of the senses. Because of this fetus, the bride would leap into the funerary pile in order to follow the man whom she had married in the next life, or into the next life. This traditional sacrifice, which was regarded as a sheer barbarism, by Europeans and by westernized Hindus, and in which the widow was burnt alive with the body of the dead husband. It's called Sati in Sanskrit, from the root us and the prefix Sat being, from which the word Satya, the truth, comes. Sati also signifies gift, faithfulness, love. Analogous customs are also found among other Indo-European stocks, among the Thracians, the Greeks, the Scythians, and Slavs. In the Inca civilization, the suicide of widows, though it was not decreed by law, was nevertheless common practice. These women, who had not the courage to commit suicide, or believed they had good reason not to commit it, were despised by their community. Therefore, this sacrifice was considered as the supreme culmination of the relationship between two beings of a different sex and as the sign of an absolute type of relationship from the point of view of truth and superhumanity. In this context, Man provides the, the role of the support for a liberating bhakti, and love becomes a door and a pathway. According to the traditional teaching, the woman who followed her husband in death attained heaven. She was transformed into the same substance as her deceased husband, since she partook of that transfiguration which occurred through the incarnation or through the incineration of the material body, into a divine body of light symbolized among Aryan civilizations by the ritual burning of the cadaver. The woman who is not unfaithful to her husband, but restrains her mind and heart, speech and body, reaches her husband's worlds after death, and good people call her a virtuous woman, the laws of Manu. 9.29 In this fire, the gods offer a person. For this oblation, the man arises having the color of light. Brahad Aranyaka Upanishad 4.2.14 See also Proclus in Timius 5.331b Also 2.65b I imagine the Greek standard text. We find an analogous renunciation of life on the part of Germanic women if their husbands or lovers die in battle. I have previously suggested that, generally speaking, the essence of bhakti consists of indifference toward the object or the means of an action. That is, in pure action and in selfless attitude. This helps us understand how the ritual sacrifice of a widow, sati, 
could have been institutionalized in a traditional civilization such as the Hindu. Whenever a woman gives herself and even sacrifices herself only because of a stronger and reciprocated bond of human passion toward another being, her actions are still on the level of ordinary events. Only when her dedication can support and develop itself without any other external motivation whatsoever does she truly participate in a transcendent dimension. In Islam, the institution of the harim or harem was inspired by these motivations. In Christian Europe, it would take the idea of God for a woman to renounce her public life and to withdraw to a cloistered life. And even in this case, this was the choice of only a very few. In Islam, a man suffice to provide such a motivation and the cloistered life of the harim was considered as a natural thing that no well-born woman would ever criticize or intend to avoid. It seemed natural for a woman to concentrate all her life on only. It seemed natural for a woman to concentrate all her life on one man only, who was loved in such a vast and unselfish way as to allow. other women to share in the same feeling and to be united to him through the same bond and the same dedication. What surfaces in all this is the character of purity, which is considered to be essential in this path. A love that sets conditions and requires the reciprocated love and the dedication of a man was reputed to be of an inferior kind. On the other hand, a real man could not know love in this way other than by becoming feminine, thus losing that inner self-sufficiency thanks to which a woman finds in him a support in something that motivates and excites her desire to totally give herself to him. According to the myth, Lord Shiva, who was conceived as the great ascetic of the mountain peaks, turned Kama, the love, the god of love, once again, according to myth, the Lord Shiva, who was conceived as the great ascetic of the mountain peaks, turned Gama, the god of love, into ashes with a single glance when the latter tried to awaken in him passion for his bride, Parvati. Likewise, there is a profound meaning in the legend about the Kalki of Atara, which talks about a woman who could not be possessed by anybody because the men who desired her and fell in love with her turned into women as a result of their passion. As far as the woman is concerned, there is true greatness in her when she is capable of giving without asking for anything in return. When she is like a flame feeding itself, when she loves even more as the object of her love does not commit himself, does not open himself up and even create some distance. And finally, when the man is not perceived by her as a mere husband or lover, but as her Lord. The spirit animating the harim consisted in the struggle to overcome jealousy and thus the passionate selfishness and thus the passionate selfishness and the woman's natural inclination to possess the man 
a woman was committed a woman was asked to commit herself to the harim from her adolescence to her old age and to be faithful to a man who could enjoy other women beside herself and possess them all without giving himself to any one in particular in this inhuman trait there was something ascetical and even sacred in the laws of manu it is written a girl a young woman or even an old woman should not do anything independently even in her own house in childhood a woman should be under her father's control in youth under her husband's and when her husband is dead under her sons 5.147 through 48 and also a virtuous wife should constantly serve her husband like a god even if he behaves badly freely indulges his lust and is devoid of any good qualities 5.154 In this apparent reification of woman, she experienced a true possession, an overcoming and even a liberation, because vis-a-vis -vis such an unconditional fides, a man, in his human appearance, was just a means to higher ends. Thus she discovered new possibilities to achieve higher goals. Just as the rule of the harim imitated the rule of the convents, likewise the Islamic law regulating a woman's life according to the possibilities of her own nature, without excluding, but on the contrary, including, and even exasperating the life of the senses, elevated her to the same plane of monastic, asceticism the sacral offering of the body and of virginity itself has been sanctioned in a rigorous form in what amounts to yet another cause of scandal for our contemporaries namely in sacred prostitution which was practiced in ancient syrian lycian lydian and theban temples the woman was not supposed to offer her virginity out of a passional motive toward a given man. She was supposed to give herself to the first man who tossed her a sacred coin within the enclosure. As if it were a sacred offering to the goddess of the temple. A woman was supposed to get married only after this ritual offering of her body. Herodotus, the Histories, 1.199, noted that the woman goes with the first man who throws her a coin and rejects no one. When she has gone with him and so satisfied the goddess, she returns home and from that time forward no gift, however great, will prevail with her. To a lesser degree, an analogous attitude in a woman should be considered the natural presupposition in those civilizations, such as Greece and Rome, in which the institution of the concubinage enjoyed a sort of regular character and was legally acknowledged as a way to complement the monogamic marriage and in which sexual exclusivism was overcome. It goes without saying that I am not referring here to the harim or analogous institutions in mere materialistic terms. I have in mind what the harim meant to the pure traditional idea and the superior possibility inspiring these institutions. It is the task of tradition to create solid riverbeds so that the chaotic currents of life may flow in the direction may flow in the right direction free are those people who upon undertaking this traditional direction 
Do not experience it as a burden, but rather develop it naturally and recognize themselves in it so as to actualize through an inner elon the highest and most traditional possibility of their own nature. The others, those who blindly follow the institutions and obey and live them without understanding them, are not what we may call self-supported beings. Although devoid of light, their obedience virtually lends, their obedience virtually leads them beyond their limitations as individuals and orients them in the same direction followed by those who are free. But for those who follow neither the spirit nor the form of the traditional riverbed, there is nothing but chaos. They are the lost, the fallen ones. This is the case of our contemporaries, as far as the woman is concerned. And yet it was not possible that a world that has overcome, to employ a Jacobin term, the caste system by returning to every human being his or her own dignity and rights, could preserve some sense of the correct relationship between the two sexes. The emancipation of women was destined to follow that of the slaves and the glorification of people without a caste and without traditions, namely the pariah. In a society that no longer understands the figure of the ascetic and of the warrior, in which the hands of the latest aristocrats seem better fit to hold tennis rackets or shakers for cocktail mixes than swords or scepters, in which the archetype of the virile man is represented by a boxer or by a movie star, if not by the dull wimp represented by the intellectual, the college professor, the narcissistic puppet of the artist, or the busy and dirty money maker, or the busy and dirty money making banker, and the politician in such a society, it was only a matter of time before women rose up and claimed for themselves, before women rose up and claimed for themselves a personality and a freedom according to the anarchic or anarchist and individualist meaning, IST is essential, to be an ist versus an er, ist is a diminutive. Er is someone who is an expert. In such a society, it was only a matter of time before women rose up and claimed for themselves a personality and a freedom according to the anarchist and individualist meaning usually associated with these words. And while traditional ethics asked men and women to be themselves to the utmost of their capabilities and express with radical traits their own gender-related characteristics, the new civilization aims at leveling everything since it is oriented to the formless and to a stage that is truly not beyond but on this side of the individuation and differentiation of the sexes. What truly amounts to an abdication was thus claimed as a step forward. After centuries of slavery, women wanted to be themselves and to do whatever they pleased. But so-called feminism has not been able to devise a personality, first, second, or third wave, maybe first, for women other than by imitating the male personality so that the woman's claims, first because of their overwhelming support of making men better through uh, so-called drunk houses and reducing pain relievers, etc. For, for a time in the late 1800s America. What truly amounts to an abdication was thus claimed as a step forward. 
After centuries of slavery, women wanted to be themselves and to do whatever they pleased. But so-called feminism was not, has not been able to devise a personality for women other than by imitating the male personality. So that the woman's claims conceal a fundamental lack of trust in herself, as well as her inability to be and to function as a real woman and not as a man. Due to such a misunderstanding, the modern woman has considered her traditional role to be demeaning and has taken offense at being treated only as a woman. This was the beginning of a wrong vocation. Because of this, she wanted to take her revenge, reclaim her dignity, prove her true value, and compete with men in a man's world. But the man she set out to defeat is not at all a real man. Only the puppet of a standardized, rationalized society that no longer knows anything that is truly differentiated and qualitative. In such a civilization, there obviously cannot be any room for legitimate privileges, and thus women who are unable and unwilling to recognize their natural traditional vocation and to defend it, even on the lowest possible plane since no woman who is sexually fulfilled ever feels the need to imitate and envy a man, could easily demonstrate that they too virtually possess the same faculties and talents, both material and intellectual, that are found in the other sex and that, generally speaking, are required and cherished in a society of the modern type. Man, for his part, has irresponsibly let this happen and has even helped and pushed women into the streets, offices, schools, and factories into all the polluted crossroads of modern culture and society. Thus, the last leveling push has been imparted. And wherever the spiritual emasculation of materialistic modern man did not tacitly restore the primacy typically found in ancient gynecocratic communities of the woman as heta era, ruling over men enslaved by their senses and at her service, the results have been the degeneration of the feminine type, even in her somatic characteristics, the atrophy of her natural possibilities, the suppression of her unique inner life. Hence, the types of the woman, Rasson, and the shallow and vain woman, incapable of any elan beyond herself, utterly inadequate as far as sensuality and sinfulness are concerned because to the modern woman the possibilities of physical love are often not as interesting as the narcissistic cult of her body or as being seen with as many or as few clothes as possible or as engaging in physical training dancing practicing sports pursuing wealth and so on as it is, Europe knew very little about the purity of the offering and about the faithfulness of the one who gives her all without asking anything in return, or about a love strong enough so as not to be exclusivist, besides a purely conformist and bourgeois faithfulness. The love Europe has celebrated is the love that does not tolerate the other person's lack of commitment. Now, when a woman, before consecrating herself to a man, pretends that he belongs to her body and soul, not only has she already humanized and impoverished her offspring, but worse yet, she has begun to betray the pure essence of femininity in order to borrow characteristics typical of the male nature. 
and possibly the lowest of these, the yearning to possess and lay claim over another person, and the pride of the ego. After that, everything else came tumbling down in a rush, following the law of acceleration. Eventually, because of the woman's increased egocentrism, men will no longer be of interest to her. She will only care about what they will be able to offer to satisfy her pleasure or her vanity. In the end, she will even incur forms of corruption that usually accompany superficiality, namely a practical and superficial lifestyle of a masculine type that has perverted her nature and thrown her into the same male pit of work, profits, frantic activity in politics. The same holds true for the results of the Western emancipation of women, which is on its way to infecting the rest of the world faster than a plague. Traditional woman are the absolute woman in giving herself and her living for another and wanting to be only for another being with simplicity and purity fulfilled herself, belonged to herself, displayed her own heroism, and even became superior to ordinary men. Modern woman in wanting to be for herself has destroyed herself. The personality she so much yearned for is killing all semblance of female personality in her. It is easy to foresee what will become of the relationship between the sexes, even from a material point of view. Here too, like in magnetism, the higher and stronger the creative spark, the more radical the polarity. The more a man is a man, the more a woman is a woman, what could possibly go on between these mixed beings lacking all contact with the forces of their deepest nature? Between these beings for whom sex is reduced to the physiological plane, between these beings who in the deepest recesses of their souls are neither men nor women, or who are masculine women or feminine men, and who claim to have reached full sexual emancipation while truly having only regressed. All relationships are destined to have an ambiguous and crumbling character. The comrade The camaraderie, promiscuities, and morbid intellectual sympathies, such as are commonplace in the new communist realism, not the old French one, or the 1960s America one. In other words, modern women will be affected by neurotic complexes and all the other complexes upon which Freud constructed a science that is truly a sign of our times. For he had actual proof and that in itself is detrimental. The possibilities of the world of the emancipated woman are not dissimilar. The avant-garde of this world, North America and Russia, are already present and give interesting and very meaningful testimonies to this fact. According to some statistics gathered in the 1950s, C. Fried and W. Kroger, an estimated 75% of North American women are sexually anesthetized while their libido has allegedly shifted in the direction of exhibitionist narcissism. In Anglo-Saxon women, the neurotic and typically 
feminine sexual inhibition was typical of their culture and was due to their being victims of a false ideal of dignity in addition to the prejudices of Puritan moralism. The reaction of the so-called sexual revolution has only led the masses to a regimen of quick, easy, and cheap sex treated as an item of consumption. All this cannot have, all this cannot but have repercussions on an order of things that goes way beyond what our contemporaries, because of their recklessness, will ever suspect. Baron Julius Evola, Revolt Against the Modern World, Chapter 21 The Decline of Superior Races The modern world is far from being threatened by the danger of underpopulation. The cry of alarm some political leaders have launched in the past, with the absurd slogan, there is power in numbers, is totally unfounded. The truth is that we are facing an opposite danger. The constant and untrammeled increase of population in purely quantitative terms. The deterioration of the population affects only those stocks that should be considered the bearers of the forces that preside over the demos and the world of the masses, and that contribute to any authentic human greatness. When I criticized the racist worldview, I mentioned that occult power, when present, alive, and at work constitutes the principle of a superior generation that reacts on the world of quantity by bestowing upon it a form and quality. In this regard, one can say that the superior Western races have been agonizing for many centuries and that the increasing growth in world population has the same meaning as the swarming of worms on a decomposing organism or as the spreading of cancerous cells. Cancer is an uncontrolled hypertrophy of a plasma that devours the normal, differentiated structures of an organism after subtracting itself from the organism's regulating laws. This is the scenario facing the modern world. The regression and the decline of fecundating in the higher sense of the term, forces and the forces that bear forms parallels the unlimited proliferation of matter, of what is formless, of the masses. This phenomenon must be related to what I have mentioned in the previous chapter concerning the sexes and concerning the relationship between men and women in this day and age since they affect the issue of procreation and its meaning. If it is true that the modern world seems destined not to know any longer what the absolute woman and the absolute man are all about, and if in this world the sexualization is incomplete, that is, limited to the corporal plane, then it must seem natural that the superior and even transcendent dimensions of sex, known by the world of tradition in multiple forms, have been lost. 
and that this loss may affect the regimen of sexual unions and the possibility offered by them as pure as a pure erotic as a pure erotic experience or in view of a procreation that may not exhaust itself in a simple opaque biological event the world of tradition effectively knew a sexual sacrum and a magic of sex, what constantly transpires in countless symbols and customs from all parts of the world is the acknowledgement of sex as a creative and primordial force rather than as a generative power. In the woman, Abyssal powers of passion and light, of danger and disintegration were evoked. The Chthonic power, namely the earth, lived in her while heaven lived in man. Everything that is experienced by ordinary men in the form of peripheral sensations and passional and corporal impulses was assumed in an organic and conscious way. Generation was decreed. And the being who was generated was willed as the child of duty, namely as one who must undertake and nourish the supernatural element of his stock and the liberation of the ancestor, and who must achieve and pass on to future generations strength, life, and stability. Today, all this has become an inane fancy. Men, instead of being in control of sex, are controlled by it and wander about like drunkards without having the least clue as to what takes place in the course of their embraces and without seeing the guiding principle acting behind their quest for pleasure or behind their own passions. Without people being aware of any of this, beyond and often against their own will, what comes into existence as a result of their intercourse is a new being who will have no spiritual continuity and, as in the case of the most recent generations, even without the pale residue constituted by bourgeois affective bonds. This being the case, it is no wonder the superior races are dying out before the ineluctable logic of individualism, which, especially in the so-called contemporary higher classes, has caused people to lose all desire to procreate, not to mention all the other degenerative factors connected to a mechanized and urbanized social life and especially to a civilization that no longer respects the healthy and creative limitations constituted by the castes and by the traditions of blood lineage. Thus proliferation is concentrated in the lower social classes and in the inferior races where the animal-like impulse is stronger than any rational calculation and consideration. The unavoidable effects are a reversed selection and the ascent and the onslaught of inferior elements against which the race of the superior caste and people now exhausted and defeated can do very little as a spiritually dominating element. Though today people talk more frequently about population control in view of the catastrophic effects of the demographical phenomenon that I have compared to a cancer, this still does not address the essential issue, since a differentiated and qualitative criterion does not come into play at all. But those who oppose population control on the basis of traditionalist and pseudo-moralistic ideas, which nowadays amount to mere prejudices, are guilty of an even greater obtuseness. If what really matters is the greatness and the might of a stock, it is useless to be concerned about the material quality of fatherhood unless an equal concern 
unless an equal concern for its spiritual dimension is present as well in the sense of superior interests of the correct relationship between the sexes and above all of what is really meant by virility of what it still signifies on a plane that is merely naturalistic after exposing the decadence of modern woman we must not forget that man is mostly responsible for such a decadence just like the plebeian masses would have never been able to make their way into all the domains of social life and of civilization if real kings and real aristocrats would have been in power. Likewise, in a society run by real men, women would never have yearned for or even been capable of taking the path she is following today. The periods in which women have reached autonomy and preeminence almost always have coincided with epochs marked by manifest decadence in ancient civilizations. Thus, the best and most authentic reaction against feminism and against every other female aberration should not be aimed at women as such, but at men instead. It should not be expected of women that they return to what they really are and thus reestablish the necessary inner and outer conditions for a reintegration of a superior race. When men themselves retain only the semblance of true virility, if all efforts to we reawaken, if all efforts to reawaken the spiritual dimension of sexuality fail, and if the form of virility is not separated from what has become an amorphous and promiscuous spiritual substance, then everything is in vain. The virility that is physical, phallic, muscular, and animal is lifeless and does not contain any creative germ in the superior sense. Phallic man deceives himself by thinking that he dominates. The truth is that he is passive and is always susceptible to the subtler power of women and to the feminine principle. The differentiation of the sexes is authentic and absolute only in the spirit. In all superior types of tradition, man has always been considered the bearer of the lineage of the Uranian solar principle. This principle transcends the mere blood principle, which is lost as soon as it converges into the fem feminine lineage. Its development is favored by the fertile ground, represented by a pure woman belonging to a higher caste. But in any event, it always remains the qualifying principle that bestows a form and that orders the feminine generating substance. This principle is related to the same supernatural element, to the power that can make the current ascend upward, and of which victory, fortuna, fortune, and prosperity of a particular stock are usually the consequences. Hence the symbolical association, which did not have an obscene, but rather a real and deep meaning, typical of ancient traditional forms, of the male organ with ideas of resurrection, asceticism, and energies that confer the highest powers. As an echo of superior meanings found even amongst, among savage populations, we find expressed in clear terms the idea that only the initiate is a true male and that initiation marks in an eminent way one's entrance into virility. This means that prior to initiation, the individuals, notwithstanding their physical appearance, have not yet turned into men. And even if they are old, they become and even if they are old, they belong to the same group of children and women and are deprived of all the privileges of the clan's virile elites, 
when the superbiological element that is the center and the measure of true virility is lost, people can call themselves men, but in reality they are just eunuchs, and their paternity simply reflects the quality of animals who, blinded by instinct, procreate randomly other animals, who in turn are mere vestiges of existence. If the expired civilization is propped up so as to make it look alive, and if men are treated like rabbits or stallions, their unions being carefully and rationally planned, let no one be fooled. What they will generate will either be a civilization of very beautiful animals destined to work, or if the individualistic and utilitarian element predominates, a stronger law will lead the races toward the path of regression or extinction according to the same inexorability of the law of entropy and the degradation of energy. What will then be registered by future historians is only one of the several aspects of the decline of the West that are today very much in evidence. By way of introduction to the second part of this work, let me make a final point that is directly related to what I have previously mentioned concerning the relationships between spiritual virility and devotional religiosity. From these last considerations, what has emerged is that what in the West goes by the name of religion, truly corresponds to an essentially feminine orientation. The relationship with the supernatural, conceived in a personalized form, theism, as dedication, devotion, and inner renunciation of one's own will, before the divine hypostasis presents the typical traits of the path on which a feminine nature may realize itself. Moreover, generally speaking, moreover and generally speaking, if the feminine element corresponds to the naturalistic element, then it is easy to see why in the world of tradition the inferior castes and races in which the naturalistic element was more predominant than in those castes and races governed by the power of aristocratic rituals and divine heritage befit it from the participation in a higher order precisely through relationships of a religious type. Thus, even religion could have a place and exercise its function within the whole hierarchy, though subordinated and relative to higher forms of spiritual realization such as initiation and the various types of higher asceticism. Following the mixing of the castes or of analogous social bodies and the coming to power of the inferior social strata and races, it was unavoidable that the spirit, it was unavoidable that their spirit triumphed even in this regard, that any relationship with the supernatural would be conceived exclusively in terms of religion, that any other higher form came under superstition that any other higher form came under suspicion and was even stigmatized as sacrilegious and demonic. This feminization of spirituality was already foreshadowed in ancient times. Wherever it prevailed, it determined the first alteration of the primordial tradition in the races. Baron, the object of the considerations I will Julius articulate Evola. in the second part of my work revolts is to against the modern this world. process of decadence, part two, together with all Genesis those processes in the face that of have the modern led world. to the collapse of primordial humanity. Many things Through are known these, by the, the wise. Genesis and face of the modern they foresee world many manifest. things. The decline of the world and the end of the AC. Page 171. Volopspa, in part one, bless the seers. I reveal to you a secret. The time has gone when the groom will crown the bride. But where is the crown? 
in the north? And whence comes the groom? From the center, where the heat generates the light and turns toward the north. Where the light becomes radiant. What are the people living in the south doing? They have fallen asleep in the heat. But they will reawaken in the storm, and many among them will be terrified unto death. J. Boam Aurora 2.11.43 Introduction I would like to point out the difference between the methodology employed in the first part of this work and the methodology adopted in the second part. In the first part, which had a morphological and, typo and typological character, in the first part, which had a morphological and typological character, I attempted to draw from various testimonies those elements that were more suitable for characterizing In a universal and meta-historical fashion, the nature of the traditional spirit and the traditional view of the world, of man, and of life. Therefore, I neglected to examine the relationship between the chosen elements and the overall spirit of the different historical traditions to which they belonged. Those elements that in the context of a particular and concrete tradition did not conform to the traditional spirit were considered to be absent and unable to influence the value and the meaning of the rest of the elements. I did not even attempt to determine up to what point certain attitudes and historical institutions had truly been traditional in the spirit rather than just in form. Now my approach is going to be different. I will attempt to follow the dynamic unfolding of the traditional and anti-traditional forces in history, and therefore it will no longer be possible to apply the same methodology. It will be impossible to isolate and to bring out some particular elements in the complex and various historical civilizations because of their traditional potential. The overall spirit of a given civilization and the way it has concretely utilized all the elements included in it will now become the relevant and specific object of my discussion. The synthetic consideration of the forces at work will replace my analysis, which had previously isolated the valid elements. I will attempt to discover the dominating factor within the various historical complexes and to determine the value of the different elements, not in an absolute and abstract way, but according to the action they exercise within a given civilization. While so far I have attempted to integrate the historical and particular element with the ideal, universal, and typical element, I will henceforth attempt to integrate the ideal element with the real one. The latter integration, just like the former, more than following the methods and the results of the researches of modern critical historiography, is going to be based mainly on a traditional and metaphysical perspective, on the intuition of a sense that cannot be deduced from the individual elements, but that presupposes them. By beginning from this sense, it is possible to grasp the different instrumental and organic roles that such elements may have played in various eras of the past and in the different historically conditioned forms. Therefore, 
it may happen that whatever has been left out in the first integration will become prominent in the second integration, and vice versa. In the framework of a given civilization, some elements may be valued and considered to be decisive, while in other civilizations they are present but in the background and deemed to be irrelevant. This warning may be helpful to a certain category of readers to shift from the consideration of tradition as meta-history to the consideration of tradition as history implies a change of perspectives. It causes the same elements to be valued differently. It causes united things to become separated and separated things to unite according to whatever the contingencies of history may determine from case to case. Chapter 22 the Doctrine of the Four Ages. Although modern man until recently has viewed the, and celebrated the meaning of the history known to him as epitomizing progress and evolution, the truth as professed by traditional man is quite the opposite. In all the ancient testimonies of traditional humanity, it is possible to find in various forms the idea of a regression or a fall. From originally higher states, beings have stopped. From originally higher states, beings have stooped to states, increasingly conditioned by human, mortal, and contingent elements. This involative process an involution, allegedly began in a very distant past. The term that best characterizes it is the Eddic term, Regna Rukur, the twilight of the gods. In 2019, July, there is a movie, Thor Ragnarok, which attempts to show this. In the traditional world, this teaching was not expressed in a vague and generic form, but rather was articulated in the organic doctrine of the four ages, which can be found with a large degree of uniformity in different civilizations. According to tradition, the actual sense of history and the genesis of what I have labeled, generally speaking, as the modern world results from a process of gradual decadence through four cycles or generations. The best known form of the doctrine of the four ages is that which was typical of the Greco-Roman tradition. Hesiod wrote about four eras symbolized by four metals, gold, silver, bronze, and iron inserting between the last two a fifth era, the era of the heroes, which, as we shall see, had only the meaning of a partial and special restoration of the primordial state. The Hindu tradition knows the same doctrine in the form of four cycles, called respectively Satya Yuga or Krita Yuga, Chrita Yuga, Devapara Yuga, and Kali Yuga or Dark Age. Together with the simile of the failing during each of these, of one of the four hooves, or supports of the bull symbolizing Dharma, or the traditional law, the Persian version of this myth is similar to the Hellenic version. The four ages are known and characterized by gold, silver, steel, and an iron compound. The Chaldean version articulated this same view in almost identical terms. In particular, we can find a more recent simile of the chariot of the universe represented by a quadriga led by the supreme god, the quadriga, 
is carried along a circular course by four horses representing the elements. The four ages were believed to correspond to the alternative correspond to the alternate predominance of each of these horses, which then leads the others according to the more or less luminous and rapid symbolic nature of the element that it represents. This view reappears, although in a special transposition in the Hebrew tradition. In one of the prophetic writings, mention is made of a very bright statue with the head made of gold, the chest and the arms of silver, the belly and the thighs of copper, the legs and the feet of iron and tile. And see the book of Daniel. Tanakh. This statue's four parts represent the four kingdoms with, that follow one another, beginning with the golden kingdom of the king of kings who has received dominion, strength, power, and glory from the God of heaven. If Egypt knew the tradition mentioned by Eusebius concerning three distinct dynasties consisting respectively of gods, demigods, and manas, we can see in them the equivalent of the first three ages, golden, silver, and bronze. Likewise, the ancient Aztec traditions speak about five suns or solar cycles, the first four of which correspond to the elements and in which, as in the Eurasian traditions, one finds portrayed the catastrophes of fire, water, flood, and the struggles against giants characterized by the cycle of heroes. Nephilim, that Hesiod added to the other four. In this we may recognize a variation of the same teaching, the memory of which may also be found more or less fragmentary among other populations. Upon examining the meaning of each of these periods, it is opportune to anticipate some general considerations, since the above-mentioned view is in open contrast with the modern views concerning prehistory and the primordial world, to uphold with tradition that in the beginning there were no animal-like cavemen, but rather more than human beings, and that in ancient prehistory there was no civilization but an era of the gods. This to many people who in one way or another believe in the gospel of Darwinism amounts to pure and simple mythology. Since I have not invented this mythology myself, however, critics still have to explain its existence. That is, the fact that according to the most ancient testimonies and writings, there is no memory that may lend support to evolutionism. What is found in them instead is the opposite. In other words, the recurrent idea of a better, brighter, and superhuman, divine past. These same testimonies also know very little about animal origins. Constant mention is made, rather, of the original relationship between men and deities, and a memory is kept alive of a primordial state and immortality together with the idea that the law of death appeared at one particular moment. Almost as an unnatural fact or as an anathema. In two characteristic testimonies, the cause of the fall was identified with the mixing of the divine race with the human race, which was regarded as inferior. In some text, that sin is compared to sodomy and to sexual mating with animals. On the one hand, there is the biblical myth of the Ben Elohim, Sodomy is divine 
in most biblical dictionaries as any aberrant sexual practice. In this case, the mixing between those of divine heritage and those who are not, without regard to their gender. On the one hand, there is the biblical myth of the Ben Elohim, the children of the gods who mated with the daughters of men, with the consequence that in the end, all mortals led deprived, depraved lives on earth. On the other hand, there is the Platonic myth of the inhabitants of Atlantis, conceived as the descendants and disciples of the gods, who lost the divine element and eventually allowed their human nature to become predominant because of their repeated intermingling with human beings. Tradition in more recent eras developed a variety of myths referring to races as bearers of civilization and to the struggles between divine races and animal, cyclopic and demonic races. They are the Aesir against the Elementar Weizen, the Olympians and the heroes against giants and monsters of the darkness, the water and the earth. The Fae. They are the Aryan Deva fighting against the Ashura, the enemies of the divine heroes. They are the Incas, the dominators who impose their solar laws on the Aborigines who worshipped Mother Earth. They are the Tuatha de Danan, who, according to Irish legends, overcame the dreadful race of the Formors and so on. On this basis, it can be argued that even though the traditional teaching retains the memory of the existence of stocks that could even correspond to the animalistic and inferior types described in the theory of evolution, this was the substratum predating the civilizations created by superior races. Evolutionism mistakenly considers these animal-like stocks to be absolutely primordial, while they are so only relatively. Another mistake of evolutionism is to conceive of some forms of miscegenation that presuppose the emergence of other races that are superior either as civilizations and biological specimens or as products of evolution. These races had their own origins, because so much time has elapsed, as in the case of the Hyperboreans and the Atlantic races, and because of geophysical factors, these races have left very few traces of their existence, and what remains is difficult to spot by those who are merely seeking archaeological and paleontological, paleontological races. By those who are merely seeking archaeological and paleontog paleontological traces accessible to profane research. On the other hand, it is significant that populations that still live in the alleged, original, primitive, and innocent state provide little effort to the evolutionists. Hypothesis These stocks instead of evolving, tend to become extinguished, thereby demonstrating, demonstrating themselves to be the degenerate residues of cycles, the vital potential of which has long since been exhausted. In other words, they are heterogeneous elements and remnants left behind by the mainstream of humanity. This was the case of the Neanderthal man who in his extreme morphological brutishness closely resembles the ape man. Neanderthal man mysteriously disappeared in a given period and the races that followed are Ori Nacian man and especially Cro-Magnum man and that represented a superior type so much so that we can recognize in it the stock of several contemporary human races cannot be considered further evolutionary stages of this vanished type. The same goes for the Grimaldi race, 
which also became extinct, and for the many primitive populations still in existence. They are not evolving, but rather becoming extinct. Their becoming civilized is not an evolution, but almost always represents a sudden mutation that affects their vital possibilities. There are species that retain their characteristics, even in conditions that are relatively different from their natural ones. Other species in similar circumstances instead become extinct. Otherwise, what takes place is racial mixing with other elements in which no assimilation or real evolution occurs. The result of this interbreeding closely resembles the processes that follow Mendel's laws concerning heredity. Once it disappears in the phenotype, the primitive element survives in the form of a separated, latent heredity that is capable of cropping up in sporadic apparitions. apparitions. Even though it is always endowed with a character of heterogeneity in regard to the superior type, evolutionists believe they are positively sticking to the facts. They ignore the facts per se are silent. They ignore that facts per se are silent and that if interpreted in different ways, they can lend support to the most incredible hypotheses. It has, it has happened, however, that someone, though fully informed of all the data that are adduced to prove the theory of evolution, has shown these data to support the opposite thesis, which in more than one respect corresponds to the traditional teaching. I am referring to the thesis according to which man is not alone in being far from a product of the evolution of animal species, but many animal species must be considered as the offshoots or as the aberration of a primordial impulse. Only in the racially superior human species does this primordial impulse find its direct and adequate manifestation. There are also ancient myths about the struggle between divine races and monstrous entities or animal-like demons that allegedly took place before the advent of the human race, humanity at its earlier stage. These myths may refer to the struggle of the primordial human principle against its intrinsic animalistic potentialities, which were eventually isolated and left behind, so to speak, in the form of certain animal stocks. Paying reference to what has been said before. As far as the alleged ancestors of mankind, such as the anthropoid and the Iceman are concerned, they could represent the first casualties in the above-mentioned struggle are the best human elements that have been mixed together with are swept away by the animal potentialities. If in totemism, which is found in inferior societies, the notion of the mythical collective ancestor of the clan is often confused with that of the demon or a given animal species. This appears to reflect the memory of a similar stage of promiscuity. Although this is not the proper context to raise the issues related to anthropogenesis, which are to a certain degree of a transcendent nature, the absence of human fossils and the sole presence of animal fossils in remote prehistory may be interpreted to mean that primordial mankind, provided that we may call primordial man a type that would be very different from historical mankind, was the last form of life to undergo the process of materialization, which process endowed the earlier animal-like human species with an organism capable of being. We may recall here that in some traditions there is the memory of a primordial race characterized by weak 
are soft bones. For instance, les zoo, when talking about the Hyperborean re region in which the present cycle began, mentioned that the inhabitants of this region have soft bones. In more recent times, the fact that superior races that came from the north did not bury but cremated their dead is just another factor that needs to be considered when facing the dilemma caused by the absence of pieces of bones. Somebody may object. There is no trace whatsoever of the fantastic mankind. Of this fantastic mankind. Besides being somewhat naive to think that superior beings could not have existed without leaving behind traces, trash, such as ruins, utensils, weapons, and so on, it must be noted that in relatively recent eras there are residues of cyclopic works. Though not all of them are typical of a civilized society, the circle at Stonehenge, enormous stones put in a precarious and miraculous equilibrium, the Pedra Cansada in Peru, the Colossus of Tiwanaku, and the like. The archaeologists are baffled as to what means were employed just to gather and transport the necessary material. Going back in time, not only should we not conveniently forget what has already been admitted or at least not excluded a priori, that is, the existence of ancient lost lands, and also that some lands were formed in recent geological eras. But we also... But we should also wonder whether it is fair to exclude a priori that a race in distant spiritual contact with cosmic forces ever existed, as tradition claims to be the case in the origins just because it did not work on materials such as stone or metal like those races that no longer have the means to act in accord with the power of the elements and being. Rather, it seems to me that the caveman is itself a legend. It seems that the primitive man did not employ caves, many of which betray a sacred orientation, as animal-like dwellings, but as places of a cult that has remained in this form even in undoubtedly civilized eras such as the Greek Minoan cult of caves and the ceremonies and the initiatory retreats on Mount Ida. It is only natural to find therein only traces as a natural protection of the site, which in other sites the combined work of time, men, and the elements did not leave behind for our contemporaries. According to a very basic traditional idea, generally speaking, the state of knowledge and of civilization was the natural state, if not of mankind in general, at least of certain primordial elites. And knowledge was, all, was not constructed and acquired just as true kingship did not originate from below. Joseph de Mestre Maestre, after remarking that what Rousseau and his epogenes assumed to be the natural state in reference to savages is only the last stage of brutishness of some stocks that have either been scattered or suffered the consequences of some primordial act of degradation that affected their deepest substance correctly pointed out as far as the development of science is concerned we are blinded by a gross misunderstanding that is to assume a judgmental attitude toward those times in which men saw effects in the causes on the basis of times in which men with effort ascended from the effects of the causes, in which people only care about effects.
in which it is said that it is useless to be concerned about causes and in which people have forgotten what a cause really means. In the beginning, mankind not only possessed a science, Bereshit, but a very different science, which originated from above and was therefore very dangerous. This explains why in the beginning science was always mysterious and confined to the temples in which it eventually became extinct when the only thing this flame could do was to burn. Thus, another science was slowly formed as a surrogate, namely, the merely human and empirical science of which our contemporaries are so proud, and, th and through which they have thought fit to judge everything that they consider to be civilization. This science merely represents the futile attempt to climb back up through surrogates. from an unnatural and degenerated state. What is most sad is that it is no longer even perceived to be such that did not characterize the origins at all. In any event, one must realize that these and similar indications will play a minimal role for those who are not determined to change their own frame of mind. Every epoch has its own myth through which it reflects a collective, a given collective climate. climate. Every epoch has its own myth, through which it reflects a given collective climate. Today, the aristocratic idea that mankind has higher origins, namely a past of light and of spirit, has been replaced by the democratic idea of evolutionism which derives from the higher which derives the higher from the lower man from animal civilization from barbarism this is not so much the objective result of a free and conscious scientific inquiry but rather one of the many reflections that the advent of the modern world characterized by inferior social and spiritual strata and by men without traditions has necessarily produced on the intellectual and cultural plane. Thus, we should not delude ourselves. Some positive superstitions will always produce alibis to defend themselves. The acknowledgement of new horizons will be possible, not through the discovery of new findings, but rather through a new attitude toward these findings. Any attempt to validate, even from a scientific perspective, what the traditional dogmatic point of view upholds will generate results only among those who are already spiritually well disposed to accept this kind of knowledge. If that is you, proceed. Chapter 23 The Golden Age I will now engage in an ideal a morphological assessment of the cycles corresponding to the four traditional errors. Further on, I will discuss their geographical and historical trajectories. First of all, the Golden Age. This era corresponds to an original civilization that was naturally and totally in conformity with what has been called the traditional spirit. For this reason, in both the location and the stock that the Golden Age is historically 
and metaphorically, metahistorically associated with, we find symbols and attributes that characterize the highest function of regality. Symbols of polarity, celerity, height stability, glory and life in a higher sense. In later epochs, and in particular traditions which are already mixed and scattered, the dominating, in a traditional sense, elites effectively appeared as those who still enjoyed or reproduced the state of being of the origins. This allows us, through a shift from the derivative to the integral, so to speak, to deduce also from the titles and the attributes of those dominating strata of society some elements that may help us to characterize the nature of the first era. The first era is essentially the era of being, and hence of truth in a transcendent sense. This is evident not only from the Hindu designation of Satya Yuga, Sat means being, hence Satya or truth but also from the Latin name Saturn, who is the king or god of the golden age. Saturn, who corresponds to the Hellenic Kronos, is a subtle reference to this idea, since in his name we find the Aryan root Sat, being, together with the attributive ending er nus as in Nocturnus. As far as the era of being, or of spiritual stability is concerned, we shall see below that in several representations of the primordial site, in which this cycle unfolded, it is possible to find the symbols of terra firma, surrounded by waters, or of the island, the mountain, or the Middle Land. As the Age of Being, the first era is also the era of the living, in the eminent sense of the word. According to Hesiod, death, which for most people is truly an end that bequeaths Hades, made its appearance only during the last two ages, the Iron and Bronze Ages, during Kronos' golden age, mortal people lived as if they were gods, and no miserable old age came their way. The cycle ended, but those men continued to live upon the earth in an invisible way, mantling themselves in dark mist and watching over mortal men. These words allude to the previously mentioned doctrine according to which the representatives of the primordial tradition, as well as their original site, disappeared in the realm of Yema, the Persian king of the Golden Age, before the new cosmic events forced him to withdraw into a subterranean refuge, occultation the inhabitants of which were thus enabled to evade the dark and painful destiny befallen the new generations. There was neither disease nor death. Yema, the brilliant, the most glorious of those yet to be born, the sun-like one of men, banished death from his kingdom. Just as in Saturn's golden kingdom, according to both Romans and Greeks, Men and immortal gods shared one common life. The rulers of the first of the mythical Egyptian dynasties were called gods or divine beings. Theoi. According to a Chaldean myth, death reigns universally only in the post-Diluvian era in which the gods left death to men while keeping eternal life for themselves. Tir na bio, the land of the living, and Tir na no, the land of youth, 
are the names in the Celtic traditions of an island or a mysterious Atlantic land the Druids believed to be the birthplace of mankind. In the saga, Ia, of Kano Gernach, where this land is identified with the land of the victorious one, Tir na Boadag, it is, it is called the land of the living, in which there is no death or age. Moreover, the relationship that the first error always has with gold symbolizes what is incorruptible, solar, luminous, and bright. In the Hellenic tradition, gold had a relationship with the radiant splendor of light and with everything that is sacred and great. Thus, anything that was bright, radiant, and beautiful was designated as golden. In the Vedic tradition, the primordial germ, Hiranya, Garba was golden. It was also said, for gold indeed is fire, light, and immortality. In the Egyptian tradition, the king was believed to be made of gold or of the same solar fluid. The incorruptible body of the heavenly gods and the immortals was made of. So much so that the title golden applied to the king, Horus, made of gold and designated his divine and solar origin, his incorruptibility and indestructibility. Plato, a flatun, believed gold to be the distinctive element that characterized the nature of the race of rulers. From the golden top of Mount Meru, which was considered to be a pole, the original homeland of mankind, and the Olympian, Olympian seat of the gods, and from the golden top of the ancient Asgard, which was believed to be the seat of the Aesir and of the divine Nordic king located in the middle abode, to the Peerland, Jiangdu, and to equivalent locations portrayed in Chinese traditions, time. And time again, we find the concept of the original cycle in which the spiritual quality symbolized by gold had its definitive and most eminent manifestation. We may also assume that in several myths that mention the deposit of the transmission of some golden object, reference is being made to the deposit or transmission of something closely related to the primordial tradition. According to the Eddic myth, immediately following the Ragnarokur, the twilight of the gods, a new race and a new sun will arise. Then the Aesir will be brought together again, and they will discover the mysterious golden tablets that they possessed in the time of the origins. Equivalent ideas are further explanations of the golden symbol during the first era are light, splendor, and the glory, in that specific triumphal meaning that I already explained when discussing the concept of the Masdian Heverenu. According to the Persian tradition, the primordial land Eriana Vego inhabited by the seed of the Aryan race, and by Yema himself, who was called the Glorious and the Radiant One, was regarded as the first of the good lands and countries created by Ahura Mazda. According to an equivalent figuration found in the Hindu tradition, the Zvetta Divapa, the white island or continent situated in the north, just like Aslan, the northern primordial seat of the Aztecs, California, which implies the idea of whiteness or brightness, is the place of Tejas, or Texas, 
of a radiant force and inhabited by the divine Narayana, who was regarded as the light or as he in whom a great fire shines, radiating in every direction. The Thule mentioned by the Greeks was characterized as the land of the sun. Someone said, Thule otima a sole nomen habens. Thule otima a sole nomen habens. Thule otima a sole nomen habens. Through the etymology of the word Thule, though the etymology of the word Thule is obscure and uncertain, it still signifies the idea the ancients had concerning this divine region, and it points to the solar character of the ancient Tlapalan, Tulan or Tula, a contraction of Tonalan, the place of the sun. The original homeland of the Toltecs and the paradise of their heroes. It also points to the home of the Hyperboreans, since according to the sacred geography of ancient traditions, the Hyperboreans were a mysterious race that lived in an eternal light and whose region was believed to be the dwelling place and the homeland of the Delphic Apollo, who was the Doric god of light the pure and radiant one, who was also represented as a golden god and as a god of the golden age. There were stocks like the Borets that were simultaneously priestly and kingly and who derived their dignity from the Apollonian land of the Hyperboreans. Here, too, there are plenty of references that can be cited. Cycle of Being Solar Cycle Cycle of light as glory, cycle of the living in an eminent and transcendent sense. These are the characteristics of the first age, the golden age, the era of the gods found in traditional memory. Baron Julius Evola, Revolt Against the Modern World, Part 2, Chapter 24, The Pole and the Hyperborean Region. At this time, it is important to consider a peculiar characteristic of the primordial age that allows us to associate with it very specific historical and geographical representations. I have previously discussed the symbolism of the pole. This pole is either represented as an island or as terra firma and symbolizes spiritual stability, the seat of transcendent beings, heroes and immortals, opposed to the contingency of the waters or as a mountain or elevated place usually associated with Olympian meanings. In ancient traditions, both of these representations were often associated with the polar symbolism that was applied to the supreme center of the world and thus to the archetype of any kind of religiety in the supreme sense of the word. In addition to the symbol of the pole, there are some recurrent and very specific traditional data that indicate the north as the site of an island, terra firma, or mountain, the meaning of which is often confused with the location of the first era, 
In other words, we are confronted by a motif that simultaneously has a spiritual and a real meaning, pointing back to a time when the symbol was reality, and the reality a symbol, and the history and meta-history were not two separated parts, but rather two parts reflecting each other. This is precisely the point in which it is possible to enter into the events conditioned by time. Allegedly, according to tradition, in an epoch of remote prehistory that corresponds to the golden age or age of being, the time before writing was publicly available, the symbolical island, our polar land, was a real location situated in the Arctic, in the area that today corresponds to the North Pole. This region was inhabited by beings who, by virtue of their possession of that non-human spirituality characterized by gold, glory, light, and life, that in later times will be evoked by the above-mentioned symbolism founded the race that exemplified the Uranian tradition in a polar state. This race, in turn, was the central and most direct source of the various forms and manifestations this, traditional, this tradition produced in other races and civilizations. The memory of this Arctic seat is the heritage of the traditions of many people, both in the form of real geographical references and in symbols of its function and its original meaning. These symbols were often elevated to a super-historical plane. In other words, they were applied to other centers that were capable of being considered as replicas of the former. For this reason, there is often a confusion of memories, names, myths, and locations, but a trained eye will easily detect the single component. It is noteworthy to emphasize the interference of the Arctic theme with the Atlantic theme, of the mystery of the North with the mystery of the West, since the latter succeeded the original traditional pole as the main seat. We know that owing to an astrophysical cause, that is, to the tilting of the terrestrial axis, in every era there has been a change in climate. According to tradition, this inclination occurred at the specific moment in which the syntony of a physical and a metaphysical event occurred, as if to represent a state of disorder in the natural world that reflected an event of a spiritual nature. When Lia Zhu described the myth of the giant Gong Gong, who shatters the column of heaven, he was probably referring to such an event. In this Chinese tradition, we also find other concrete references, such as the following one though it is mixed together with details that describe later cataclysms. The pillars of heaven were shattered. The earth shook at its foundations. The northern skies descended lower and lower. The sun, the moon, and the stars changed their course. Their course appeared changed as a result of the tilting of the terrestrial axis. The earth's surface cracked and the waters contained in its belly gushed forward and inundated various countries. Man was in a state of rebellion against heaven, and the universe fell victim to chaos. The sun darkened. The planets changed their course because of the above-mentioned shift in perspective, and the great harmony of heaven was destroyed. In any event, the freezing and the long night descended at a specific time on the polar region. Thus, when the forced migration from the seat ensued, the first cycle came to an end, and a new cycle, the Atlantic cycle, began. Aryan texts from India, such as the Vedas and the Mahabharata, 
preserve the memory of the Arctic seat through astronomical and calendar-related allusions that cannot be understood other than through an actual reference to such a seat. In the Hindu tradition, the term divappa, which means insular continent, is often used to designate different cycles by virtue of a spatial transposition of a temporal notion, cycle equals island. Now, in the doctrine of divappa, we find meaningful recollections of the Arctic seat, even though they are mixed with other things. The above-mentioned Svata Devapa, Island of Splendor, or Island of Seven, was situated in the far north. The Uran, the Uttara Kuru, are often mentioned as an original northern race that originated from Jambu Divo, Divapa, the polar insular continent, Jambu Divapa, the polar insular continent that in the first of the various Divapa and at the same time the center of them all, its memory is mixed with the memory of Saka Divapa located in the White Sea or Milky Sea namely the Arctic Sea. In this place, no deviation from the law from above occurred. According to Kurma Purana, the seat of the solar Vishnu, symbolized by the polar cross, the hooked cross or swastika, coincides with the Sveta Devapa that the Padma Purana claims to be the homeland located beyond anything connected with the samsaric fear and fret of the great ascetics, the Mahayogi, and the children of Brahman, the equivalent of the transcendent beings who inhabited the northern regions according to the Chinese tradition. These great souls live by Hari, who is Vishnu himself, represented as blonde and golden and living by and symbolic throne upheld by lions which shines like the sun and radiates like fire. These are variations of the theme of the land of the sun. As a reflection of this, on a doctrinal plane, the de Deva Yana, which is the way leading to solar immortality and to super individual states of being, as opposed to the way or a return to the Mani, or to the mothers, was called the way of the north. In Sanskrit, north, Uttara, also means the most elevated or supreme region. Also, Uttara Yana, northern path, is the ascending path followed by the sun between the winter and solar, between the winter and summer solstices. Among the Aryans from Iran, we find more precise memories. Their original seed Ariana Vego, created by the God of Light and in which the glory dwells and where the King Yema allegedly met Ahura Mazda, was a land situated in the far north. The tradition of the Zen Avesta relates that Yema was warned in advance of the approaching of fatal winters and that the serpent of winter, the pet of the God of Darkness, Angra Menu Marduk came upon Ariana Vegu. Then there were ten months of winter and two summers, and it was cold in the waters on the earth, and frost covered the vegetation. Ten months of winter and two months of summer. This is the climate of the Arctic regions. The Nordic Scandinavian tradition, notwithstanding its fragmentary nature, offers various testimonies that are often mixed together in a confused way. It is possible, however, to find analogous testimonies. The Asgard, the primordial golden seat of the Aesir, was located by those traditions in the Midgard, which was the land of in the middle. This mythical land was in turn identified both with Gardariki, which is a semi-Arctic region, 
and with the Green Island or Greenland. Gardariki may be Alaska, which, though portrayed in ancient cosmology as the first land to arise from the abyss, Gi Nun Gag Up, is likely to be related to, with Greenland itself. Greenland, as the name itself suggests, seems to have had a rich vegetation and to have been unaffected by the Ice Age up to the time of the Goths. In the Middle Ages, we still find the idea that the northern regions were the original birthplace of all races and people. Moreover, in the Edic tales describing the struggle of the gods against destiny, Rok, an eschatological struggle that they believed was going to affect their own homeland. It is possible to recognize some data that refer to the land of the first cycle. In these tales, reminiscences, reminiscences, remembrance of past events are mixed with apocalyptical themes. Here, just like in Vendidad, we find the theme of a terrible winter. The breaking out of the natural elements was coupled with the dimming of the sun. According to Gilfagning, first of all a winter was called first of all a winter will come called Thimbul winter, mighty or mysterious winter. Then snow will drift from all directions. There will be great frosts and keen winds. In Chinese tradition, the country of transcendent men and the country of a race of beings with soft bones are often identified with, or hollow bones, similar to angels or birds, are often identified with the northern region. An emperor of the first dynasty was thought to have resided in a country located north of the northern sea. In a boundless region spared by inclement weather and endowed with a symbolic mountain, Hu Ling, and a water spring. This country was called Far North, Mu. Another imperial type was said to have been broken hearted upon leaving it. Analogously, Tibet retains the memory of Shang Shambhala, the mystical northern city or city of peace although thought to be the island on which the hero Gisar was said to have been born, just like Zarathustra was born in the Ariana Vegu. The masters of Tibetan tradition say that the northern paths lead the yogin to the great liberation. The current tradition concerning the origins that is found in North America, from the Pacific to the region of the Great Lakes, mentions the sacred land of the far north, situated by the great waters whence allegedly came the ancestors of the Nawalan, the Toltecs and the Aztecs. Strangely, see La Crosse, Wisconsin. I previously mentioned that the name of this land, Aslan, just like the Hindu Zweta Divapa denotes the idea of whiteness or of white land. Chalky. In the northern traditions, there is the memory of a land inhabited by Gaelic races and situated by the Gulf of St. Lawrence, called Great Ireland or Havitra Mamaland which means homeland of white people. The names Wabanaki and Abenaki found among the inhabitants of these of those regions derive from the word Wabaya, which means white. Furthermore, some legends of Central America mention four primordial ancestors of the Quechua race who are trying to return to Tula, the region of light. When they get there, they only find ice. Also, the sun seldom appears, 
Then they scatter and move to the country of the Quechua. This Tula or Tulan was the original homeland of the Toltecs forefathers who probably derived their tribal name from it and who eventually called Tula the center of the empire they established on the Mexican plateau. This Tula was also conceived as the land of the sun and was sometimes located in North America in the Atlantic but this is probably due to the interference of the memory of a latter location that was destined to perpetuate for some time the function of the primordial Tula to which Aslan probably corresponds when the glacial weather descended upon it and when the sun disappeared the name Tula which visibly corresponds to the Greek Tule was also applied to other regions. According to Greco-Roman tradition, Tule lay in the sea that derives its name from the god of the Golden Age, namely the Chromium Sea. The Chromium Sea, which corresponds to the northern region of the Atlantic. A similar location was ascribed in later traditions to what became symbol and meta-history in the form of the Happy Islands, or the Islands of the Immortals, or the Lost Island. This island, as Honorius Augusta Dumensis wrote, is hidden from people's sight. Sometimes it is discovered by chance, but when it is actively sought after, it cannot be found. Thule is confused with both the legendary Hyperborean homeland situated in the far north and from which the original Achaean stocks brought the Delphic Apollo and with the Isle of Ojigia, the sea's navel, located far away in the vast ocean. Plutarch situated this island north of Great Britain and claim that it was in proximity of the Arctic region where Kronos, the god of the golden region, is still asleep. Wake not the one who sleeps, but is ever aware. In this location, the sun sets only for one hour each day. And even then, the darkness is not all enveloping, but looks more like twilight. Just like in the Arctic regions. The confused notion of the bright northern night became the foundation of the notion of the land of the Hyperboreans as a place of perennial light, free of darkness. This representation and this memory were so vivid that an echo of it lasted until the end of the Roman civilization. After the primordial land was identified with Great Britain, it is said that the Constantius Chlorus reigned, Anno Domini 305-306, went there with his legions, not so much to pursue trophies and military victories, but rather in order to visit the land that is most sacred and closest to heaven, to be able to contemplate the father of the gods, Kronos, and to enjoy a day without a night. In other words, to be able to anticipate the possession of the eternal light that is typical of imperial apotheosis. Even when the golden age was projected into the future as the hope of a new seculum, we still find references to Nordic symbolism. According to Lacadantius, the mighty prince who will re-establish justice after the fall of Rome will come from the north. Ab extremus finubus plege septentrionalis. The mystical and invincible Tibetan hero Gesar, who will re-establish a kingdom of justice and exterminate the usurpers. is expected to be reborn in the north. Shambhala, 
the sacred northern city will be the birthplace of Kalki Avatara, the one who will put an end to the Dark Age. The Hyperborean Apollo, according, according to Virgil, will inaugurate a new golden and heroic age in the sign of Rome. And so on. After stating these essential points, I will not make further reference to the law that connects physical and spiritual causes as it is applied to a plane upon which, between what may be characterized as a fall, the deviation of an absolutely primordial race, and the physical tilting of the terrestrial axis which determined radical changes in climate and periodical natural disasters affecting entire continents. It is possible to have a foreboding of an imminent connection. I will only point out that ever since the polar seat became deserted, it is possible to verify that progressive alteration and loss of the original tradition that will eventually lead to the Iron Age our Dark Age, our Kali Yuga, or Era of the Woof, Edda, and, strictly speaking, to modern times. End of chapter 24. Correlated with Aaron, brother of Moses. Baron Julius Evola, Revolt Against the Modern World Chapter 25, The Northern Atlantic Cycle As far as the migration of the northern primordial race is concerned, it is necessary to distinguish two great waves, the first moving from north to south, the second moving from west to east. Groups of Hyperboreans carrying the same spirit, the same blood, the same body of symbols, signs, and languages first reached North America and the northern regions of the Eurasian continent, supposedly tens of thousands of years later, a second great migratory wave ventured as far as Central America, reaching a land situated in the Atlantic region that is now lost, thereby establishing a new center modeled after the polar regions. This land may have been that Atlantis described by Plato in Diodorus. The migration and the re-establishment of a center help to explain the transposition of names, symbols, and topographies that I have discussed in reference to the first two ages. In regard to this, it is fitting to talk about a northern Atlantic people in civilization. From this Atlantic seat, 
the races of the second cycle spread to the American. Hence, the previously mentioned memories of the Nahuatlans, Toltecs, and Aztecs concerning their original homeland, European and African continents. Most likely, these races reached the borders of Western Europe in the early Paleolithic. These races supposedly corresponded to, among others, the Tuatha de Danan, the divine stock that came to Ireland from Avalon, and who were led by Ogma Glian Ainach, the hero with a sunny countenance, whose counterpart is the white and solar Quetzalcoatl, who came with his companions to America from the lands situated beyond the waters. Anthropologically speaking, these races correspond to Cro-Magnum men who made his appearance toward the end of the glacial age in the western part of Europe, especially in the area of the French Cantambric civilization of Abri la Madeleine, Roydain, and Alta Mira. Cro-Magnum man was clearly superior, both culturally and biologically, to the aboriginal Mousterian man of the Ice Age. So much so that somebody recently nicknamed the Cro-Magnum the Greeks of the Paleolithic, Paleolithic. As far as their origins is concerned, the similarity between their civilization and the civilization of the Hyperborean, which is found even in the vestiges of the people of the far north, civilization of the reindeer, is very significant. Among other prehistoric traces of the same cycle are those found on the Baltic and Frisian Saxon shores in the Doggerland, in a region that has partly disappeared, the legendary Veneta, a center of the civilization was eventually established. Besides Spain, other migratory waves landed on West Africa's shores. Later on, between the Paleolithic and the Neolithic are probably in conjunction with races of direct northern descent. Other people moved through the continent from northwest to southeast toward Asia into the area many believe to be the cradle of the Indo-European race and further on all the way to China. The West African Kingdom, Note 1, this is the legendary kingdom of Ubhaz and, in part, the prehistoric African civilization as it was imagined by Frobenius by confusing the partial center with the original seat of which Ubhaz was probably a colony. He identified it with the seat of Platonic Atlantis. C. L. Frobenius D. Atlantis Gotelehe. In China, there have been recent discoveries of the vestiges of a great prehistoric civilization, similar to the Egyptian Minoan, which was likely created by these migratory waves. Other waves followed the North African shoreline all the way to Egypt and went by sea from the Balearic Islands to Sardinia and to the prehistoric sites in the Aegean Sea, more particularly in Europe and in, near, and in the Near East, the origin of the megalithic civilization of the Dolmen and the so-called Battle Axe people, which remains, an enigmatic, which remains as enigmatic as the Cro-Magnum is very similar. This migration occurred in separate waves, through fluxes and refluxes, interbreeding, and conflicts with aboriginal or already mixed races. Thus, from, northern, from north to south, from east to west,
Thus, from north to south, from west to east, through diffusion, adaptation, or domination, there arose civilizations that originally shared, to a certain degree, the same matrix, and often strains of the same spiritual legacy found in the conquering elites. Encounters with inferior races, which were enslaved to the chthonic cult of demons and mixed with the animal nature, generated memories of struggles that were eventually expressed in mythologized forms that always underline the contrast between a bright, divine type, an element of northern origins, and a dark, demonic type. Through the institution of traditional societies, by the conquering races, a hierarchy was established that carried a spiritual, ethnic, and racial value. In India, in Iran, in Egypt, and even in Peru, we find evidence we find rather evident traces of this in the institution of the casteism. I have said the originally I have said that originally the Atlantic center was supposed to reproduce the polar function of the Hyperborean seat and that this second center occasioned frequent confusion in traditions and in memories. This confusion should not prevent us from detecting in a later period, yet still falling within remote history, a transformation of civilization and spirituality and a differentiation leading from the first to the second era, from the golden age to the silver age, that eventually prepared the way for the third era, the bronze age or titanic age. This age should be characterized as the age of Atlantis, considering that the Hellenic tradition regarded Atlas as related to the Titans by virtue of being Prometheus's brother. Anthropologically speaking, we must consider a first major group that became differentiated through idio variation, or variation without mixing. This group was mainly composed of the migratory waves of a more immediate Arctic derivation, and it made its last appearance in the various strains of the pure Aryan race. A second large group became differentiated through miscegenation with the aboriginal southern races, with proto-mongoloid and negroid races, and with other races that probably represented the degenerate residues of the inhabitants of a second prehistoric continent, now lost, which was located in the south, and which some designated as Lumeria. The second group includes the red-skinned race of the last inhabitants of Atlantis. According to Plato's mythical account, those who forfeited their pristine divine nature became of repeated unions with the human race. These people should be regarded as the original ethnic stock of several newer civilizations established by the migratory waves from west to east. The red race of Cretan Aegeans Eti, Ikrets, Pelas, Geans, Lycians, Egyptians, Kefti, etc. And of the American civilizations, these latter people and their myths remember the country of origin of their ancestors who had come from the divine Atlantic land situated on the great waters. The name Phoenicians means the red ones. And most likely, it is another memory of the first Atlantic navigators of the Neolithic Mediterranean. Two components must be considered both from an anthropological and from a spiritual point of view. The northern and the Atlantic components in the vast material concerning traditions and institutions found in this second cycle. The first component is immediately related to the light of the north.
and it retained, for the most part, the original Uranian and polar orientation. The second component reveals the formation that occurred as a result of the contrast established with the southern populations before considering the meaning of such a transformation which constitutes the first alteration or, so to speak, the inner counterpart of the loss of polar residence, it is necessary to emphasize another point. Almost every people retains the memory of a catastrophe that ended the previous cycle of mankind. The myth of the flood is the most frequent form employed to describe this memory. It is shared by many people, from the Persians and Mexicans to the Maya, from the Chaldeans and Greeks to the Hindus, and to the people who inhabited the Atlantic African coastline, to the Celts and to the Scandinavian people. Moreover, its original content is a historical event. According to the tale of Plato and Diodorus, it essentially represented the end of an Atlantic land the center of the Atlantic civilization to which its colonies were subordinated for a long time, sank into the sea in an era that by far predates the time that, according to Hindu tradition, inaugurated the Dark Age, according to some traces about 6,000 years ago. According to some traces of chronology built into the myth, this is what indeed happened. The history of the historical memory of that center gradually disappeared in the civilizations that derived from it, but in which elements of the ancient heritage were retained in the blood of the dominating caste. The roots of various languages and also in social institutions, signs, rituals, and hierograms. In the Hebrew tradition, the theme of the Tower of Babel, with the ensuing punishment represented by the confusion of the various languages, Genesis 11.7, may refer to the period in which the unitary tradition was lost and the various forms of civilization were disassociated or dissociated from their common origin and could no longer understand each other after the catastrophe of the flood ended the cycle of Atlantic mankind. The historical memory was often preserved in myth. This is in meta-history, the West in which Atlantis was located during its original cycle when it reproduced and perpetuated the much older polar function, very often represented a nostalgic reference point for the fallen ones, by virtue of a transposition onto a different plane. The waters that submerged the Atlantic land were called waters of death, which the following post-Diluvian generations, consisting entirely of mortal beings, must cross through initiation in order to be reintegrated with the divine state of the dead, namely, with the lost race. On this basis, the well-known figurations of the island of the dead could be understood in a similar sense as transformations of the memory of the sunken insular continent. The mystery of paradise and of places of immortality in general was connected with the mystery of the West, and in some instances of the North too, and thus it formed a body of traditional teachings, the same way the theme of those who are rescued from the waters and those who do not drown in the waters shifted from. See, for instance, Yama, Yema, Nuh, Noah, Diu, Cleon, Shemash, Napishtim, Romulus, the solar hero Karna in the epic Mahabharata, Atrahasis, and so on. Just as Manu, son of Vivasvat, 
the heir of the solar tradition who survived the flood and created the laws of the new cycle, the laws of Manu, had for a brother Yama compared with the Iranian Yema, or Yimr, whose well Odin hung over to gain the runes, the solar king who escaped the flood too, who was the god of the dead. Likewise, Minos, whose name corresponds etymology, etymologically to Manu, often appears as the counterpart of Radamant, who is the king of the island of the blessed, or of the heroes. Those who are rescued from water, and of those who do not drown in the waters, shifted from the real historical sense that referred to elites who escaped the catastrophe and went on to establish a new on to establish new traditional centers to a symbolic meeting and appeared in the legend of prophets, heroes, and initiates. Generally speaking, the symbols proper to that primordial race surface again in enigmatic ways until relatively recent times. Wherever traditional conquering kings and dynasties made their appearance. Moreover, the Greeks often discussed the exact spot of the divine garden, which was the original dwelling of the Olympian god Zeus. And of the garden of the Hesperides. Beyond the river ocean, according to some, the Hesperides were the daughters of Atlas. The king of the western island, it was precisely this garden that Heracles was supposed to find in that symbolic feat that has often been associated with his winning Olympian immortality, and having had Atlas as a guide, who alone knows the dark depths of the sea. Generally speaking, the Hellenic equivalent of the northern solar way or of the Indo-Aryan Devayana was a western path or Zeus's way, which led from the fortress of Kronos, located in the island of the heroes of the faraway sea, to the peaks of Mount Olympus. According to the Chaldean tradition, it is in the west, beyond the deep waters of death, which have no fjord, fjord and which have not been crossed for the longest time, that the divine garden is to be found in which the king Shamash Napishtim, the hero who escaped the flood and who still re retained the privilege of immortality, still reigns. The garden was reached by Gilgamesh, who followed the western path of the sun in order to receive the gift of life. It is significant that the Egyptian civilization did not have a barbaric prehistory. It arose all of a sudden, so to speak, enjoying from the start a high level of sophistication. According to tradition, the first Egyptian dynasties were formed by a race that had come from the West, also known as the race of Horus's companions, Shemsu Heru, or of those marked by the sign of the first among the inhabitants of the Western lands, namely Osiris, Ogun. Osiris himself was believed to be the eternal king on Yalu's fields in the land of the sacred Amentet, beyond the waters of death, which was thought to exist in the far west, Al Maghreb, and which sometimes has been associated with the idea of a great insular land. The Egyptian funerary rites carried on the symbolism and the ancient memory. In this rite, the ritual formula was to the West. 
and it included the crossing of the waters and a procession carrying the sacred Ark of the Sun, that is, the Ark of those who had been rescued from the waters. Just as among the Hellenes, the localization of the dwelling of the immortals alternated between the north and the west. Likewise, in some ancient Egyptian traditions, the fields of peace and the land of triumph that the deified soul of the deceased reached by first going through an existing passage in the mountain were also thought to be located in the north. Moreover, the Chinese and Tibetan traditions mention the existence of a western paradise with trees bearing golden fruits like the Hesperides garden. There is also a frequent image of Mi Tu with a rope and the inscription, He who draws the souls to the west. On the other hand, the memory that was transformed into the myth of paradise is also found in Celtic and Gaelic sagas concerning the land of the living, the Mav Mel, the pleasant plain, or Avalon, which was otherworldly, which which were otherworldly regions located in western lands. Avalon was believed to be the place in which the survivors of the race far above of the Tuatha de Danann, King Arthur himself, legendary heroes such as Kano, Wisin, Cuchelain, Leogeri, Ogier, the Dane, and others came to enjoy eternal life. This mysterious Avalon is the equivalent of the Atlantic Paradise, described in American legends. It is the ancient Telepalan or Tulan. It is the land of the sun, or the red land, to which both the white god Quetzalcoatl and legendary heroes such as the Toltec priest Wemok, Great Hand, mentioned in the Codex Chimal Popoco returned and did the Tuatha to Avalon, as did the Tuatha to Avalon, thus disappearing from people's sight. According to Jewish folklore, Enoch went to a western place, to the far end of the earth, in which there are symbolical mountains and divine trees guarded by the archangel Michael. These trees give life and salvation to the elect, but are barred to mere mortals until the time of the Last Judgment. Enoch 24, 1-6, 25, 4-6 The last echoes of this myth were kept secret until the Christian Middle Ages. The navigator monks of the monasteries of St. Matthias and of St. Albeus allegedly found a mysterious Atlantic land allegedly found in a mysterious Atlantic land a golden city, which was believed to be the dwelling place of Enoch and Elijah, the prophets who never died. On the other hand, in the myth of the flood, the disappearance of the sacred land, separated from continental land by a mere Dene prosum, the waters of death, may also assume a meaning that connects it to the symbolism of the ark, to the preservation of the germs of the living, the living in an eminent and figurative sense. The disappearance of the legendary and sacred land may also signify the passage of the center, which retains in an unaltered which retains, in an unadulterated way, the primordial non-human spirituality into the invisible, the occult, are the unmanifested. Hence, according to Hesiod, the beings of the first age who never died would continue to exist as mankind's invisible guardians. Thus, the legend of the subterranean people or the subterranean kingdom is often the counterpart of the legend of the sunken land, 
island or city. This legend is found among several populations. When impiety began to run rampant on the earth, the survivors of previous eras moved to an underground location. In other words, they acquired an invisible existence that is often situated in the mountains as a result of transpositions with the symbolism of the heights. These beings continue to exist on those mountain peaks until a new manifestation is made possible for them as the end of the cycle of decadence approaches. Pindar said that the road leading to the Hyperboreans can be found neither by ship nor by marching feet and that only heroes such as Perseus and Heracles were admitted to it. Moctezuma, the last Mexican emperor, may enter Aslan only after performing magical operations and undergoing a transformation of his physical body. Plutarch relates that the inhabitants of northern regions could consume Plutarch relates that the, the inhabitants of northern regions could commune with Kronos, the king of the Golden Age, and with the inhabitants of the far northern region, only in their sleep. According to Le Zhu, the those marvelous regions he mentions that are connected to the Arctic and the Atlantic Sea, you cannot reach by boat or carriage or on foot, only by a journey of the spirit. According to the Tibetan Lama's teaching, Shambhala, the mystical northern seat, is within everyone. This is how the testimonies concerning what once was a real location inhabited by non-human beings survived and assumed a meta-historical value. For what are human beings? Human beings are Homo sapien, Homo sapien sapien, Homo, man or human. These beings are Cro Magnum, possibly humanoid, as it were, but the humanoid beings are not human. This is how the testimonies concerning what once was a real location inhabited by non human beings survived and assumed a meta historical value providing at the same time symbols of states beyond ordinary life that can only be reached through initiation. Besides the symbol, we find the idea that the original center still exists in an occult and usually unreachable location, similar to what Catholic theology said about the Garden of Eden. Bahrain. Only a change of state or of nature can open its door to the generations living in the last age. This is how the second great transposition of metaphysics in history was established. In reality, the symbol of the West, just like that of the Pole, may acquire a universal value beyond all geographical and historical references. In the West, where the physical light that is subject to birth and to decline become extinguished, the unchanging spiritual light is kindled. There the journey of the sun's ship toward the land of the immortals commences. And since this region lies where the sun disappears beyond the horizon, it was also conceived as subterranean or as underwater. This is straightforward symbolism directly inspired by natural observations and thus used by various populations, even by those who have no relation with Atlantic memories. This, however, does not mean that such a theme, situated within given limits determined by concomitant testimonies, such as the ones I have presented, the historical method, may not have also a historical character. 
What I mean is that among the countless forms assumed by the mystery of the West, a group may be isolated from which it is legitimate to assume that the origin of the symbol did not consist in the natural phenomenon of the course of the sun, but rather by virtue of a spiritual transposition in the distant memory of the disappeared western land. In this regard, the surprising correspondence between American and European myths, especially Nordic and Celtic ones, constitute a dis very decisive proof. Secondly, the mystery of the West always marks a particular stage in the history of the spirit that is no longer the primordial one. It corresponds to a type of spirituality that cannot be considered to be primordial, and therefore it is defined by the mystery of transformation. It is characterized by a dualism and by a discontinuous passage a light is kindled, another fades away, transcendence has gone underground. Super mature, unlike the original state, is no longer nature. It is the goal of an initiation and the object of a problematic quest. Even when considered in its general aspect, the mystery of the West appears to be typical of those more recent civilizations the varieties and destinies of which I will explain in the next chapter. It is connected to the solar symbolism, rather to the polar one. We have now entered the second phase of the primordial tradition. Welcome. Anu, VV, VVV, Sol 19, Cancer, Luna, 9, Luna, 18 degrees, Scorpio, Dies Hoves, July 11th, 2019, Erevovet, 1041 AM, Do what thy wilt should be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will. AO 158, I give unimaginable joys on earth. Certainly not. I give unimaginable joys on earth. Certainty, not faith, while in life, upon death, peace unutterable, rest, ecstasy. Nor do I demand aught in sacrifice. Nuit. Baron Julius Evola, Revolt Against the Modern World, Chapter 26, North and South. In the first part of this work, I pointed out the relationship between the solar symbolism and several traditional civilizations. This symbolism naturally occurs in a number of traces, memories, and myths connected to the primordial civilization. When considering the Atlantic cycle, however, we can distinguish a typical alteration and differentiation of the polar symbolism from the symbolism relating to the previous Hyperborean civilization. The Hyperborean stage may be characterized as that in which the luminous principle 
presents the characteristics of immutability and of sensualism, which are, so to speak, typically Olympian. These are the same characteristics proper to the Hyperborean god Apollo, who, unlike Helios, does not represent the sun following its patterns of ascent and of descent over the horizon, but is rather the sun itself, the dominating and unchanging source of light. The swastika and other forms of the prehistoric cross that are found approximately at the beginning of the glacial period, like the other very ancient prehistoric solar symbol of the sun with an inner center that was sometimes represented by the colossal dolmen. Originally, seem to have had a connection with this early form of spirituality. In fact, the swastika is a solar symbol inasmuch as it represents a rotary movement around a determined and unmovable pivot, corresponding to the center of another solar symbol, the circle. See Argenon's L'Heroi de Monde, Chapter 2, from an analysis of the geographical distribution of the swastika on the earth prepared by T. Wilson, the swastika, the earliest known symbol in annual report of the Smithsonian Institute, 1896, while it seems that this sign was not properly only to the Indo-European races, as it was supposed at first, nevertheless, we find a distribution that largely corresponds to the Northern Atlantic migration, to the West, America, and to the East, Europe. There are different kinds of solar wheels and swastikas, circles, crosses, circles with crosses, and radiating circles. Later on, there are axes with a swastika, double axes, and axes and other objects made with aerial lifts, arranged in a circular pattern, and then images of the solar ship associated with the axis or with the Apollonian Hyperborean swan and reindeer. All of these symbols are the traces of the original stage of the Northern tradition. There is also a different spirituality connected to the polar symbolism, though it emphasizes the relationship with the year, the year God, and thus with a law of mutation, ascent, descent, death, and rebirth. The original theme, therefore, is distinct from what may be characterized as a Dionysian phase. Here we find the influences proper to another principle, another cult, another stock of races, and another geographical region. We notice a differentiating transposition. In order to classify this type of transposition, we may consider the most significant point in time for the symbol of the sun as the sun god, the winter solstice. Here a new element acquires an even greater relevance. It is that element into which the light seems to disappear and from which it seems to rise again, almost by virtue of renewed contact with the original principle animating its own life. This symbol does not appear in the traditions of pure boreal stock, and if it does, it appears only in a very subordinate way. Conversely, in the southern civilizations and races, this symbol is predominant and it often acquires a central meaning. It is the feminine, telluric symbol which is portrayed as the mother, the divine woman, the earth, or the waters, or serpent. These three characteristic impressions are equivalent to a great degree, 
and are often related to one another. Mother Earth, the generating waters, the serpent of the waters. The relationship established between the two principles, the mother and the son, is what gives meaning to two different redactions of the symbolism. The first of which still retains traces of the polar tradition, while the second characterizes a new cycle, namely the Silver Age, and a mingling which is already a degeneration of North and South. From an abstract perspective, in those places in which solstices are celebrated, there still is a connection with the polar symbolism, the vertical axis running from north to south, while the symbolism of the equinoxes is connected with the longitudinal east-west direction, so much so that the predominance of either one of the two symbolisms in different civilizations in and of itself allows us to characterize whatever in them refers to either the Hyperborean or Atlantic heritage. And what may be properly characterized as an Atlantic tradition, the civilization, however, we find a mixed form. Here, together with the presence of the solstice symbolism, we still have a polar element. But in the predominance of the theme of the solar god who changes, and in the appearance and ensuing predominance of the figure of the mother, or of similar symbols during the solstices, we may detect the effects of yet another influence, of another type of civilization and spirituality. Therefore, when the center consists of the solar male principle, conceived of as life that arises and declines and that goes through winter and spring, or death and rebirth, as in the case of the so-called vegetation deities, while the identical and immutable principle is identified with the universal mother and with the earth conceived as the eternal principle of every life, as the comic matrix and the inexhaustible as the comic matrix as the cosmic matrix an inexhaustible source and seat of all energy then we are truly confronted by a decadent civilization and by the second era which is traditionally under the aegis of the water or of the moon. Conversely, wherever the sun continues to be conceived of in terms of uncreated and unprecedented pure light and spiritual virility, following the lines of an Olympian meaning, and wherever people's attention focuses on the luminous and heavenly nature of the fixed stars, since they appear to be exempt from the law of rising and setting, which in the opposite view affects the sun as the year God himself, then what we are witnessing are instances of the highest, purest, and most ancient spirituality, the cycle of the Uranian civilizations. This is a very general and yet fundamental scheme. Generally speaking, we can distinguish between a southern and a northern light in the amount in which such an opposition has relatively well defined has relatively well defined traits within the mixed matter of what is historical and traceable back to very distant ages it is possible to distinguish between a uranian in a lunar spirituality between Arctic regions and Atlantis. Historically and geographically, Atlantis does not correspond to the South, but to the West. The South corresponds to Lemuria, which I mentioned in passing, and some Negroid in Southern populations may be considered the last 
crepuscular remnants of this commun of this continent. Since until now, however, I have essentially followed the trajectory of the decline of the primordial Hyperborean civilization, I will discuss Atlantis only in reference to a phase of this to a phase of this decline. Moreover, I will only consider the South in relation to the influence it exercised on primordial races and on northern civilizations during the Atlantic cycle. But not only in it, provided we do not give to this expression a general typological meaning, or in relation to immediate forms which have the double meaning of an alteration of the primordial heritage and of the elevation to higher forms of the chthonic and demonic themes typical of the southern aboriginal races. This is why I did not simply say south, but southern light, and why I will use the term lunar spirituality to characterize the second cycle in reference to the moon as a bright and yet non-solar symbol, which is almost similar to a heavenly earth, namely to a purified land, south. Because of numerous elements, there is no doubt that the themes of the mother or woman, the waters, and the earth all trace their origins to the south and are also recurrent through transpositions and interpolations in all the ensuing Atlantic traces and memories. This has misled some into thinking that the cult of the mother was typical of the Northern Atlantic civilization. According to a well-established idea, there is a connection between Mauru one of the creations that, according to the Zen Avesta, came after the Arctic Seat and the Atlantic Cycle. And therefore, Mauru should be equated with the land of the mother. This was the opinion of H. Wirth. The term Mu is often found in the Maya civilization, which may be considered a residue of the southern cycle. The seat of this cycle was a very ancient continent that included Atlantis and perhaps stretched to the Pacific. It seems that in the Mayan tablets of the Troana Codex, mention is made of a certain Mu, a queen or divine woman, who traveled west as far as Europe. Ma, or Mu, was also the name of the main goddess of ancient Crete. Moreover, if some have attempted to see in the prehistoric Magdalenian, Magdalenian civilization of an Atlantic origin, the original center from which a civilization in which the mother goddess enjoyed such a predominant role that some could say that at the dawn of civilization, the woman radiates such a bright light through religion that the male figure is confined to the shadows spread throughout the Neolithic Mediterranean. And if some have claimed to have discerned in the Hiberic Cantabric cycle, the same characteristics of the lunar Demetrian mystery that is dominant in the pre Hellenic Pelasgic civilization, undoubtedly there must be some truth in this. After all, the name Tuatha de Danan, which is found in the Irish cycle and characterizes a divine race from the West, means the people of the goddess. Dana. 
the legends, the memories, and the meta-historical transpositions according to which a western island was the residence of a goddess, a queen, or a priestess ruler, are numerous and very revealing. I previously mentioned some of these references. The custody of the golden apples, which may represent the traditional heritage of the first age and the symbol of the spiritual states proper to it, located in Zeus's western garden, according to the myth, became the responsibility not only of women, but of the daughters of Atlas, the Hesperides. According to some Gaelic sagas, the Atlantic Avalon was ruled by a regal virgin. Also, the woman who appeared to Conan in order to lure him to the land of the living implied through symbols that this land was inhabited only by women and children. Hesiod declared that the Silver Age was characterized by a very long period of infancy under maternal tutelage. This is the same idea conveyed through the same symbolism. Even the designation Silver Age is a reminder of the lunar light and of a lunar matriarchal era, the Silver City. In Celtic myths, we find the recurrent theme of the woman who bestows immortality on the hero in the Western Islands. In the Western Island. In the medieval legend of monks who found a golden city and the prophets who never died in the middle of the Atlantic, mention is made of a statue of a woman in the middle of the sea, made of copper, Venus's metal, pointing the way. This also corresponds to the theme of the virgin who sits on the throne of the seas, Arahman al astawa along the western path followed by Gilgamesh, and who is the goddess of wisdom and the guardian of life. A virgin who tends to be confused with the mother goddess Ishtar, the Nordic myth of Idun, land of the ever young and of its apples that grant and renew eternal life, the far eastern tradition concerning the western paradise, in the aspect in which it is also called land of the western woman. The royal mother of the west also appears in connection with the mountain, Quen Lun, or Ketela, she possesses the elixir of immortality, and according to the legend, she bestows immortal life to kings such as Wang Mu. In this Chinese view, we find a contrast between two components, the pure western land, the seat of the mother, and the kingdom of Amit Abba from which women are rig rigorously excluded. And finally, the, the great Mexican tradition relative to the divine woman, mother of the great Huitzilopochtli, who remained the ruler of the sacred oceanic land of Aslan. These are echoes that, directly or indirectly, refer to the same one idea. They are memories, symbols, and allegories that need to be dematerialized and regarded as universal references to a lunar spirituality, to a rejeri, and to the participation in a life that is not ephemeral, all of which have shifted from the solar to the virile ages to the lunar and feminine ages of divine woman. 
it would probably be possible to reach the same conclusions through the Hellenic myth of Aphrodite, a goddess who, in her Asiatic variations, characterizes the southern component of the Mediterranean civilizations. Since, according to Hesiod, Aphrodite was born from the foam that gathered about the several genitals of the primordial heavenly deity, Uranus, who some believe to represent both the Golden Age, like Kronos, and the Northern Center. According to the tradition of the Elder Edda, the appearance of the feminine element of the three strong daughters of the giants marks both the end of the Golden Age and the beginning of the first struggles div between divine races, Aesir and Wanan, or Oanan, those of the air and those of the sea. And later on between divine races and giants, these struggles, as we shall see later on, reflect the spirit of later epochs. Considered in her elementary chthonic aspect, the woman, together with the earthly demons, was really the main object of the southern aboriginal cults. This will be the source of the great Asiatic southern chthonic goddesses and of those goddesses who represent the monstrous Stea Topigic, S-T-A, again, S-T-E-A-T-O-P-Y-G-I-C. Stea topigic, female idols of the early megalithic period. This goddess of the southern hemisphere, who is transfigured and reduced to a pure and almost Demetrian form, as exemplified in the Brassum Bowie caves, inhabited by Aurig Nathian man, who was introduced and became dominant in the new civilization of Western Atlantic origin, along the path of Atlantic colonizers from the Neolithic to the Minoan period. And from the Pyrenees to Egypt, we consider female idols almost exclusively, while in the cult there were more priestesses than priests, and quite often effeminate priests. The same motif is present in Thracia, Illyria, Mesopotamia, and even in some northern and Celtic stocks all the way up to the time of the Germanic tribes, and especially in India, where it has preserved in some southern forms of the Tantric cult and in the prehistoric traces of the civilization of Mohenjo, Daro, not to mention the most recent forms, which I will discuss later on in greater detail. This is but a brief reference to the primordial chthonic roots of the southern light, which can be associated with the southern component found in those civilizations, traditions, and institutions that emerged in the wake of the great migratory tides that moved from west to east. This is a disaggregating component opposed to the original Olympian and Uranian type of spirituality, connected with the races of a more immediate northern descent, northern Atlantic, or with those races that were capable of retaining or of rekindling the fire of the primordial tradition, even in an environment far removed from the influences of the original one. By virtue of the occult relationship that exists between what takes place on the visible plane, which is apparently shaped according to external conditions, and that which conveys a deep and even spiritual meaning, 
we can refer to environmental and climatic factors in order to explain an analogically or in order to explain analogically the differentiation that occurred the experience of the sun of light and of fire itself naturally acted in the northern races as a liberating spirituality especially during the long glacial winter Uranian and solar, Olympian or fiery figures also played a major role in the sacred symbolism of these races. Moreover, the rigorous climate, barren soil, and need for hunting as well as the need to migrate across unknown seas and continents naturally shaped those who innerly retained the spiritual experience of the sun bright sky and fire into warriors, conquerors, and navigators, and thus further that synthesis of virility and spirituality, the characteristic traces of which were retained in the Indo-European races. In relation to this, it becomes easier to understand another aspect of the previously mentioned symbolism of sacred stones. The stone or the rock is an expression of the hardness, the sacred and iron-like spiritual firmness of those who are rescued from the waters. The stone represents the main characteristic of those who eventually dominated in times, in later times, and who established the traditional centers following the great flood in places where the sign of the center, the pole, in God's house, often re-emerged in the symbolic stone as a variation of the omphalus. The Hebrew term Beit El or Bethel, which corresponds to omphalus, means the house of God. Hmm. Hence, the Hellenic theme of the second race born from stone after the flood. The idea that Mithras was believed to have been born from stone, that stones were believed to point out true kings or that they are found at the beginning of the Via Sacra. See the Roman Lepis Niger or Black Stone. that sacred stones were the material from which fatal swords are made. And finally, that meteorites or stones from heaven or thunderbolts were often turned into axes, the weapon of the symbol of prehistoric conquerors. Conversely, it was only natural that in the South, the object of the most immediate experience was not the solar principle, but rather its effects displayed in luscious fertility of the earth, in that the center shifted toward Mother Earth, portrayed as magna mater, while the symbolism shifted to chthonic deities or beings, to gods and goddesses of vegetation and of vegetal and animal fertility, while fire, once perceived as a divine, heavenly, and beneficial reality, eventually came to be perceived as something infernal, ambiguous, and telluric. The favorable climate and the natural plentiness eventually induced most people to seek peace and rest and to cultivate the feeling of contemplation and getting lost in nature. Rather than an active pursuit of affirmation and self-transcendence, to teach with kindly benevolence, not to lose one's temper and avenge the unreasonableness of others, that is the virile energy of the South that is followed by the well-bred men to sleep on a heap of arms and untanned skins, to die unflinching 
and as if dying were not enough. That is the virile energy of the North that, it, that is followed by the brave man. Chong Yong 10.4 Therefore, even in the order of what can be affected to a certain degree by external factors, while the northern light goes hand in hand through solar and Uranian symbols with a virile ethos and a warrior spirituality consisting of a harsh will to establish order and to dominate conversely in the southern traditions the predominance of the chthonic theme and of the pathos of death and resurrection corresponds to a certain propensity to promiscuity, escapism, a sense of abandonment, and a naturalistic pantheism with sensual or mystical and contemplative overtones. Having suggested that the symbolism of the solstices has a polar character, while the symbolism of the equinoxes is referred to the western and eastern direction and to the Atlantic civilization, I think it is interesting to consider the meaning of some equinoctial feasts in relation to the themes typical of southern civilizations. In this regard, the exegesis of Emperor Julian, Hymn to the Mother of the Gods, 173 C-D, 175 A-B, is very significant. When an equinox occurs, the sun seems to escape from its orbit and law and to get lost in the unlimited. At that time, the sun is at its antipolar an anti-Olympian peak. This tendency toward evasion and escapism corresponds to the pathos of the promiscuous feasts that some people celebrated during the spring equinox in the name of the Great Mother. These feasts were sometimes connected with the myth of the castration of her solar sun lover. In every historical epoch that follows the descent of the northern races, it is possible to detect the action of two opposing tendencies that can be traced one way or another back to the fundamental polarity of north-south. In every civilization that emerged later on, it is possible to recognize the dynamic outcome of either the encounter are the clash of these two tendencies, which generated more or less lasting forms until the advent of forces and of processes that ushered in the later bronze and iron ages. Not only within every single civilization, but even in the struggle between various civilizations and in the advent of one tendency and in the demise of the other. Deeper meanings will often surface. It will also be possible to notice again the advent of the demise of forces that are inspired by either one of these spiritual poles with a greater or lesser reference to the ethnic lines that originally either knew the Northern Light or fell under the spell of the mothers and of the southern ecstasies. End of chapter 26. Ya Khalid.